Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome here to the Launchpad. You're looking at a live view of Launch Complex 39A at NASA Kennedy Space Center, where we are now to L minus 3 hours, 33 minutes, 30 seconds, and counting. until launch of NASA SpaceX Crew-6 up to the International Space Station. If it's your first time here, welcome. My name's Zach. I'm the founder and host here at the Launchpad, and we're thrilled to have you joining us for our live launch coverage of Crew-6. If you haven't yet, take a moment, engage that like button, let us know in the chat where you're watching from, and share out the stream as we begin our full commentary coverage of launch of Crew-6. Things are going to really start to pick up as we are now just about 10 to 20 minutes away from expecting Crew-6 to walk out those historic double doors and begin their journey to launch pad uh, ahead of their launch. Taking a look at the vehicle out on the pad, that is a bright white brand new booster, SpaceX Falcon 9 Booster 1078 going for its first flight. And on top of that booster is Crew Dragon Endeavor going for its fourth mission up to the International Space Station. If it's your first time here, though, welcome here at the Launchpad. Throughout our live streams, we're going to be answering your guys' comments and questions live. So you can send those in the chat by taking us at the Launchpad. We'll be answering those throughout the broadcast. We're also going to be patching in NASA's live coverage, so listening in to updates on the crew and the vehicle as we continue through tonight's count. Now, if you had questions and wanted to know more about today's mission, you can head on over to our mission briefing over on tlpnetwork.com. We'll get that on the screen here. Bear with me one moment. That's what we wanted to see there. There we go. Our crew mission briefing for Crew 6 is where you can learn more about today's vehicle, the mission, the crew on board, see their astronaut profiles. My favorite part here, one, a breakdown of the history of Falcon 9, but also the timeline. This is super critical. This is what we're going to be running through here today ahead of launch and then through the flight timeline. We're going to be bringing you live tracking coverage of Crew Dragon as it begins its journey to the International Space Station uninterrupted following launch. So make sure you watch out for that stream to get underway. And then we'll be back live for full docking coverage. And that docking is expected in just a couple of days. We'll begin our coverage right around 12.30, on 12.30 a.m. Eastern Time on Tuesday, February 28th. Docking expected to occur 2.38 a.m. Eastern with op hatch opening right around 4.20 a.m. Eastern time. But if you're just joining us, you're looking at a live view of Launch Complex 39A at NASA Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where we are now 3 hours, 30 minutes, 45 seconds and counting until launch. See lots of people watching from all over the world. It's great having you all here. We got Eagle Eye in uh, Idaho. Bob is in Gloucester, Minnesota. I hope that's right. We got uh, Athena in Washington. We got Shauna in Nashville. The Beavers in Evans, Georgia. We got Dallas in Sacramento. Amy's in Michigan. Ginger, good to see you as always. We got more Georgia. Lots of Georgia watching. Now, if you happen to be down on the Space Coast and you take photos or videos, of today's launch. Make sure you're sending those to us over on Twitter or on Reddit, taking us at the launch pad for a chance for your photos to be brought up live on the air throughout today's broadcast. So taking us TLPN underscore official on Twitter or join the TLP Reddit. Both of those links are in the description below and we'll drop those in the chat as well. Now NASA is going to be getting underway here in just a moment. So we're going to patch them in to hear an update on how today's timeline is progressing. The next major event, as we said earlier, we're watching for is crew walkout. That expected to occur uh, about eight minutes from now. We do have our TLP rocket chaser, Eric, uh, at the double doors, uh, ready to capture the walkout of the crew here uh, this evening. A very historic spot uh, waiting for that crew to begin. Now, NASA's getting underway here, so we're going to listen in to an update on the rocket and take a look, hopefully, into that crew suit donning room as the crew six prepare to begin their journey out to the launch pad. You can keep sending in your comments and questions in the chat by taking us at the launch pad. And we'll continue to answer those throughout tonight's broadcast. So we count down now three hours, 29 minutes and counting until launch of two NASA astronauts, one Russian cosmonaut and one UAE astronaut to begin their six month journey up at the International Space Station. The fourth time Crew Dragon Endeavor will uh, visit the International Space Station here today. 
Weather has been looking good throughout this evening. We've been keeping a close eye on that over the course of the day, as that's always one of the biggest things. But currently, it is good 20 degrees Celsius with very light winds to the southeast. Let's listen in to NASA as they begin to provide an update of today's launch. You're looking live at the Crew Dragon spacecraft on top of a Falcon 9 rocket set to launch three astronauts and one cosmonaut to the inner. And welcome to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida for live coverage of NASA and SpaceX's launch of Crew-6, now streaming in 4K resolution. I'm NASA's Daryl Nail, and with me is NASA astronaut Raja Chari. Great to have you here, Colonel. Uh, super happy to be here, Daryl, and what a beautiful night for a launch, uh, other than some mosquitoes. <laughs> you know, something interesting about uh, Raja being here, besides the mosquitoes, which are a little bit of a bother, is he has actually never witnessed a launch <laughs> firsthand. Yeah, so Kayla and I, our first launch was being on the rocket, and so uh, Kayla got to see one now. I get to see one live myself, so looking forward to seeing it from the outside. We enjoy, we are going to enjoy seeing, seeing and hearing it through your perspective as you watch it for the first time, but you were, you were in the rocket, <laughs> and that's why you're here I, to I give us all of that uh, Exactly. I, I don't get a whole lot of pity when I tell people I haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Well, let's talk about Crew 6. They are already getting suited up. And we've got a little bit of video that was recorded earlier, less than an hour ago, of Crew-6 in that historic astronaut crew quarters suit-up room. And there you see the commander, Stephen Bowen, in his seat. It is exactly as the seats are inside the Dragon. There's Woody Hoberg, the pilot for today. Yep, that's exactly at the foam the fittings and everything like that are exactly their Sultan, one of the mission specialists. And so what they do is two by two, they pressurize them up, check the comm system, uh, and basically are checking to make sure there's no malfunctions in the suit because you'd rather fix that there than, than out on the pad. Absolutely. And so they're also connected up there, right? Uh, with those umbilicals? They just are, like yep, they just are. like they are in the spacecraft. So they're checking out the, the suit side umbilical connection, make sure the cooling's working, make sure the comm's working. Um, the, they take them up to pressure just like they would in the suit pressure checks and make sure that they, there's two layers of the suit. There's a pressure garment and then a restraint garment. So they're making sure all the zippers for both those layers are holding correctly before they go out to the pad. Good to get them all zipped up before they go out there to the pad. Now, throughout the broadcast, you will hear pre-launch communication audio between the core and the astronauts. The core is the crew operations resource engineer with SpaceX. We will try to pause to hear what that person is saying, and so you can hear what the core is saying. You will also hear others from the launch team, too, including the launch director, the mission director, and others. And Raja, you remember the back and forth with those individuals, and it's really critical to be able to communicate with the ground team. Yeah, so you're, you, we've simmed with these people, so by the time the crew is in here, they've, there's the same voices they've heard the last few weeks of the sims, um, and so it's kind of reassuring to hear them again, but yeah, there's a whole bunch of ground loops uh, that you don't hear in the Dragon, and they're tying certain people and certain control loops onto the ones that the crew can hear, and so you're checking all those comp links, and you'll hear that uh, once they get strapped in. You'll hear them going through all those different systems. And that's right before fueling, right, to get everybody on the same comm channel? Exactly, just to make sure everyone has a direct comm link to the crew, and the crew has a direct comm link to everyone else. And there's various relays, whether it's through satellites or ground stations or ground connections, and you're checking all of those different links. All right, very good. Now, I'm not going to be the only one asking you questions, <laughs> Raja, though I am Love it. You know, I love that I get to be able to sit next to an astronaut and find out all this fascinating stuff. We want to invite our viewers out there who are watching to participate. So if you would like to ask Raja a question over the next three hours, jump on our Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch channels and send your question with the hashtag AskNASA. You can see it at the bottom of your screen. We look forward to hearing from you and answering your questions tonight. And now we're looking at the doors to the astronaut crew quarters here at the Kennedy Space Center, the doors where the astronauts will take their last steps before they go out on a ride to the launch pad. And the, the cool thing about that door, if you look around the frame of it, you'll see this, the mission patch stickers of all the other crews that have walked through that door. So it's got a long history uh, and proud tradition of doing that. So uh, most likely yesterday sometime, uh, Crew 6 slapped their patch up there somewhere. Um, and then every time you come back in through those doors, it's a good reminder of uh, the, the memories and the, the mission. And that's a long-standing tradition. I think that went back to shuttle 
It Though is, I yep. think they had to redo the door, so some of those you're exactly, came off. You're exactly right, Daryl. So they had to basically, when they redesigned that inside thing, the inside corridor, but they do still have, the, all, most of those patches actually are, are shuttle patches. Uh, and there's some traditions as well. So inside crew quarters, uh, as they come out of the suit room, more than likely there is a crew six patch, and they would have all signed that. And then around that, there's also the previous mission patches with a sticker, and they would have signed their name around the sticker. And now we expand our view at the Operations and Control Center here at Kennedy, and those are the Teslas that the astronauts will be traveling to the launch pad in. You might notice these are black, and the previous ones were white. Talk about that. And there we have Crew 6 beginning their way out of the suit donning room, heading to the elevator to come down to the double doors. L minus 3 hours, 23 minutes, 45 seconds, and counting till launch, two NASA astronauts, one Russian cosmonaut, and one UAE astronaut beginning their journey out to the launch pad. You can see the elevator there uh, with their crew poster and been signed by all the team's uh, members that have helped support Crew 6 to get to this point as they begin their about hour journey out to the pad. Next time we see them, those double doors will be opening uh, down outside and they will be making their way out to say their final goodbyes to their family. What seems to be a tradition with the SpaceX crews, the, uh, the doors don't uh, close the first time. Someone's knee gets a little too close and they open again. But uh, there we go. Got it this time and they're beginning that flight down from the third level down to the main level where they will have walk out uh, in just a minute. Uh, based on current timelines, we are right on time uh, for what we were expecting. Crew walkout, three hours, 22 minutes uh, from time. You can, they haven't swapped the camera over, so we're going to sit on the floor here for a moment. Uh, we should get a live view out at the pad uh, in just a moment as we await for the crew uh, out there. There we go, a live view of the brand new Teslas. These are the first mission, these brand new blacked out Teslas. Uh, will be supporting the brand new SpaceX trans crew transport vehicles. But if you're just joining us, welcome here to the launch pad. You're looking at a live view of the crew support groups waiting to say their final goodbyes. Uh, if it's your first time here, though, welcome. My name's Zach. I'm the founder and host here at the launch pad, and we're waiting for Crew 6 to uh, begin their journey uh, out to the launch pad. And we're going to be staying live with you all the way through launch until we see that crew in orbit and get to see what that zero G indicator is. Uh, take a moment, let us know in the chat what your guesses are for that. If it's your first time here, though, welcome uh, here at the launch pad. It's our mission to inform and inspire the explorers of tomorrow because we believe that space is better together. We're glad to have you here this evening. Maybe it's good morning or afternoon as well depending where you're watching from. We know we've got people tuning in uh, from Russia, but also the UAE. And we're going to keep a very close eye on those double doors as we await the crew to uh, begin their journey out to the pad. I think I can see one of them peeking through, so we're going to go full screen here as we await for our Crew 6 crew, and then we'll listen in to the live sights and sounds as the crew walks out. But if you have questions, you can send those in the chat by tagging us at the launch pad and we'll work on answering those live throughout this evening's coverage. Uh, make sure you're taking us at the launch pad for us to see those questions. You can see all the press gathered there. Our very own TLP rocket chaser Eric is all set up, ready to see Crew 6 as they go. We also have TJ and Ali out at the press site. Uh, Eric will join them shortly to make sure we bring you the best possible coverage of this very exciting mission as we begin to send four more people up to the International Space Station, the first crewed launch of any nation in 2023. And we're glad to have you joining us here this evening. A uh, really great question from Shauna that we'll answer here as we wait for the crew. Why are people in black wearing numbers on their back? Those are what, what we call the SpaceX ninjas. Those are the support crew that will go out to the pad with the crew, and they are uh, in black, so they're easily identifiable compared to the crew, uh, but they all have numbers, so they can all be tracked on exactly where they're going, making sure they're doing exactly what they need to be done. They can make sure they don't miss someone clearing the pad when they need to do pad clear uh, before propellant load, uh, and it's for the crew to be able to easily identify who they need to talk to as well. They've trained with this crew, uh, and they're able to spot who they need. They're wearing masks and everything, and here comes the crew. Let's listen in. Here they, Here they come, come. Crew, Crew 6, six. taking their first steps outside before their journey to space. From left to right, we have Andrei Fedyev, Woody Hoberg, Stephen Bowen, and Sultan Al-Nayani. 
And now they'll stand in front of their family and loved ones and have some exchange. You remember this moment? I do. So we've had some time with the, the families and friends prior um, where you actually, especially for the folks who are in quarantine, kind of give last hugs and stuff like that. But this is sort of uh, one last chance to say, uh, say bye, uh, you know, maybe some, some long distance hugs. Um, and then sometimes we'll also see some uh, NASA headquarters officials down there as well. Uh, so basically a chance just to everyone get eyes on the crew. up to this point, you've been in quarantine the whole time. And if you're just joining us, welcome here to the launch pad. You are looking at a live view as Crew-6 board the SpaceX Crew Transportation Vehicles begin their journey out to the pad. The family is getting ready to say their final goodbyes up against the window. Let's continue to listen in to hear some of these final moments. And core on countdown displays are configured for crew ingress.
countdown, advance team complete, ready for crew arrival. And Crew 6 officially beginning their way out to Launch Complex 39A at NASA Kennedy Space Center after some final farewells to their family. If you're just joining us, welcome here to the launch pad. You're joining us for our live launch coverage of NASA SpaceX Crew 6. I think I said Crew 3 a minute ago. Crew 6 uh, now beginning their journey out to the launch pad. We took a moment there to listen in uh, to the live sights and sounds, to listen in to some of the families. You heard one of the sons uh, say goodbye, Dad, some of the family uh, speaking, uh, obviously, in Russian and for the UAE astronaut as well, uh, getting to say their final farewells. We're going to be answering your comments and questions. I've been seeing lots of them come in the chat, so give us a moment. We'll work on catching those up on those. You can continue to send those in the chat by taking us at the launch pad but if it's your first time here welcome make sure you subscribe to never miss another live launch coverage docking undocking or return to earth right here on the launch pad we bring you full coverage of not only nasa and spacex but everyone around the world and we're glad to have you joining us here this evening while we were watching the crew we did hear call outs there from the mission control nets uh that the pad is ready for crew arrival and we are running right on time crew walkout was scheduled for three hours 22 minutes uh, left on the clock crew departure three hours 15 minutes left on the clock so we're running right on schedule the crew is expected to arrive at the pad in about 20 minutes so we're going to have these live helicopter and drone feeds uh, as the crew makes that journey out to lc 39a crew ingress uh, just under an hour from now so uh, it's going to be a, a bit of time the crew uh, has selected music for their playlist for this 20 minute drive out to the pad uh, and they'll be enjoying some of the sights and sounds uh, as they begin to uh, prepare themselves to go through their training to be prepared to ingress into crew dragon endeavor and begin that journey up to the international space station Lots of you tuning in all over the world. We're glad to have you here. Make sure you've subscribed and shared out the stream as we count down now L minus three hours, 11 minutes, 15 seconds, and counting until launch. Catching up on some of your questions. I know we were talking about uh, the SpaceX Ninjas the, and the black wearing numbers. Uh, those crew are now out at the pad and uh, going out to the pad with the crew. Uh, they have identifiers on them, so when they clear the pad, we know we've got everybody. It's also so the crew can easily identify who they need to talk to. They've been training with this crew, and they know them by their names, but also their numbers, because they are masked and everything due to the quarantine. Uh, I saw a question coming in in the chat, uh, a few people asking, uh, why are the families uh, being able to touch the gloves uh, and stuff? Aren't they in quarantine? Uh, that's something we've seen with the SpaceX missions. Um, that final goodbye, getting to see them. Uh, the, the first couple missions, they were very careful of not letting them, you know, the windows were closed and just a little open. And over the course of these missions, we've seen the windows now expand to being fully open and uh, at the touching of at least hands. Uh, that is a SpaceX uh, decision on how safe they can make sure that there is no foreign object debris being taken in. They will do obviously do an inspection of their gloves uh, if there was a risk of anything on them. Most of these families have also been in quarantine with the, their uh, loved one uh, at the NASA Kennedy Space Center for the last week uh, and back at Johnson Space Center in Houston as well. So uh, there, there are procedures in place to make sure these quarantines are maintained. Back in the shuttle days, they used to do it over uh, actually like a flood waterway creek thing. Uh, they were on opposite sides that they would say their final goodbye. So uh, definitely an advancement in letting those families be closer to their loved ones before they are gone for six months or, as we've now seen with this Soyuz situation on the station, uh, their mission being extended now to a year. So uh, once you're up there, you do not know when, uh, you, you have an idea when you'll come home, but there's always the risk of coming home early or an extension uh, as well. 
If you guys have questions, you can keep sending those in the chat by tagging us at the launch pad, and we'll work on answering those live. We're also going to patch in NASA Mission Control on and off throughout today's uh, stream for NASA's commentary. Mission Control Net, we have patched in, so anytime we hear an update from the control, you will hear that as well. Uh, Kevin Wise is asking, a couple police officers I can understand, but why a full tactical unit? Uh, the United States doesn't play around with their crew. This is a very um, big event. This is a, a national event, international event today with one Russian cosmonaut and a UAE astronaut. Uh, so they're not playing any games. This facility is on uh, a lockdown. And you are only on here if you are accredited uh, or an employee of NASA or a family. Um, you do not just get to come onto base uh, for all you want. This is a very secure area. We are talking about an active launch vehicle. We're talking about a crew going up to the International Space Station. Um, so they do not play around. They want to make sure that that crew is protected uh, to make sure that there's, you know, unfortunately there's bad people in the world that want to do bad things, but we make sure that this crew is protected. And this is what we saw during Shuttle. We saw this during Apollo, and we're going to continue to see this even with Artemis in the future uh, to ensure their safety. That road is closed. This is actually one of the main roads. If you ever visit NASA Kennedy Space Center's Visitor Center and take one of the bus tours out to uh, the Apollo Saturn V, you will drive down this road uh, that the crew is traveling right now. They are heading towards the NASA Vehicle Assembly Building, and we will see them make a right turn. That is where they will pass NASA's uh, operations building, the launch control center, as well as the press site where our TLP rocket chasers are on site capturing photos and videos that we will be sharing over on our social media. So make sure you follow us over on Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit. Uh, and our Instagram will be sending those out. We're super excited to have Ali, Eric, and TJ uh, on site for uh, today's mission. And thank you to NASA and SpaceX for allowing us to be on site for Crew 6 here this evening. And we're glad to have all of you joining us here live online as we are now three hours, seven minutes, ten seconds, and counting until launch. Christopher Nix is asking, how many days will it take them to get to the International Space Station? Really great question. Uh, due to requirements uh, for sleep, we can see the crew, well, I'll answer that in just a second. We can see the crew here making that right turn, and you're going to see the vehicle assembly building. We'll go full screen for this. There is the vehicle assembly building on the left. They are now beginning their way uh, around some of the operations facilities around the vehicle assembly building on the left uh, is where Artemis 1 was built and where Artemis 2 soon will be. It's also where the shuttle and Apollo missions uh, were stacked prior to rollout. And on the right, there's a couple more operations buildings, and then we will have the uh, press site uh, where all of the invited press from around the world are currently located ready for launch at this point they're uh, just about three miles away from the pad uh, as they begin their uh, journey to the pad here fantastic shot here from on top of one of the buildings from the vehicle assembly building showing the crew driving by i've driven down this road a number of times and it's uh, uh it's amazing to uh, get to know where they are and just the excitement of driving out to one of those pads. It is quite the experience, and I wasn't going to space today. They are, so they've trained for years for this. Three new astronauts, uh, one cosmonaut and two new astronauts going on their first mission. The other NASA astronaut, this will be his fourth mission, having flown uh, three missions previously as the crews continue their way out to launch Complex 39A, now passing uh, the press site, and the bend in that road brings them out along the crawler way where we watched Artemis 1, uh, roll out uh, just months ago ahead of its first maiden flight. But they are now basically on a straightaway all the way to Launch Complex 39A. Uh, answering Christopher's question, how many days will it take to get to the ISS? Crew is expected to arrive on Tuesday, February 28th. We're going to be going live right around 12.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time on Thursday, but we'll have a live tracker running from launch tonight through docking. Uh, docking expected to occur 2.30 8 a.m. Eastern Time on Tuesday, and about an hour and a half, two hours later is when we expect that hatch opening and welcome ceremony to occur, and we'll, of course, bring you full live coverage of that as well, uh, but we'll have our live tracker, as we said, up uh, shortly after launch as well as we watch Crew 6 head to the International Space Station. You can see some guests uh, spotted there, some vehicles and support vehicles uh, as well. That looks to be right around where the gantry is, uh, where the... Uh, 
the causeway actually splits for launch complex 39A and 39B. Lots of questions coming in, so we're working on catching up on those. You can, can keep sending those in the chat by tagging us at the launch pad. Uh, MBS asking, uh, would you go to space if you could? Uh, if it was on a Crew Dragon, absolutely. Would not, uh, wouldn't miss it for the world. It's a safe vehicle. It's a safe rocket. Absolutely would go. Uh, Athena's asking, is Crew 6 going for a year or six months? Their schedule is for a six-month mission for the International Space Station. Crew 7 will come up. They will do a handover, and then they will come home. Crew 5 is currently on the ISS, preparing for Crew 6's arrival in a couple of days. They'll do about a week handover, and then we'll have live coverage of their return to Earth as well. Kevin's asking why three Teslas for four crew members. There's multiple other crew that come out, uh, and they can only have two crew in each vehicle due to them being in those suits. They have to be hooked up. Uh, so they actually hook into a, a special system in the Tesla, just like they would actually in Dragon, to give them... Uh, air conditioning and everything in their suits uh, so that they're comfortable on this about 15 20 minute journey out to the pad if you're just joining us though welcome here to the launch pad you're looking at a live view as crew 6 begins their journey out to launch complex 39a at nasa kennedy space center we're just over three hours from launch and this is where the timeline gets starts to get very busy uh, we're soon going to see Crew-6 arrive at the pad. Uh, crew ingress expected to occur just about 35 minutes from now. That's when the crew will first board the Dragon. There you can see for a moment the rocket out in the distance. A uh, few milestones that they have to still do prior to that. Uh, once they arrive at the pad, they'll have a last-minute bio break or bathroom break opportunity. They'll go up those double elevators uh, to the flight level. They'll go up one more flight of stairs. That's where there's a phone, and they can make a final phone call to someone that they've chosen, uh, their final phone call from Earth before they board their Dragon and everything goes through radios. They'll normally take a look out at the distance at the VAB and the Space Coast, and then they will walk across that futuristic crew uh, access arm into the White Room. Once they're in the White Room, that's where uh, they'll be given a Sharpie, and they will be able to sign next to the NASA emblem on the wall, as all NASA and SpaceX astronauts do, a tradition that came from the shuttle era, signing the White Room wall. And that's when they'll have final checkouts, final checks of their suit for any foreign object debris, and they will board Crew Dragon Endeavor. Once we have that, they'll do a crew comm check once they're all on board, and that's when we'll start to hear communications through the net between the crew and mission control, uh, and then we'll continue through the count with more milestones there. After ingress, it's going to take about 30 minutes until we expect to see hatch closure, uh, and then we'll go there. But if you want to know more about today's timeline of events, head on over to our detailed mission briefing. We'll drop the link in the chat for that, and you can see uh, that detailed countdown operations timeline as well as flight timeline. You can see Crew-6 now just passing around the SpaceX hangar. That is where Falcon 9 is prepared, and they're coming up to the Launch Complex 39A security gate. Uh, they will be That gate will be open. There we go, and they are waving through. Crew-6 now arriving at Launch Complex 39A, beginning the little drive up the sloped uh, ramp to the base of the rocket. We're going to listen into NASA as we uh, hear the live commentary of the crew arrival uh, as they arrive at Launch Complex 39A at NASA Kennedy Space Center. Let's listen in. Mission controls here in Houston and at SpaceX in Hawthorne, working together to bring Crew Dragon to its new home in space. When we check back in later, we'll talk a little bit more about what the crew on the International Space Station has been doing to prepare for Crew 6. But for now, we'll send it back to the team at Kennedy. Daryl. Thank you, Courtney. And as we look back to the crew with that live camera on the Tesla, that was really neat to see that shot driving up and seen a rocket dead yeah, ahead. Yeah, that is a cool, yeah, it's, that's awesome to be able to see what they're seeing. And the crew got to go do this uh, usually a day prior to go do a pad tour, but now seeing it with the lights on, uh, with the, you know, getting ready to start loading prop here shortly, it's a much different feel. And uh, depending on how the, the you mentioned there's a, a flight surgeon and a uh, uh, closeout crew with them in the vehicle. The other thing they're doing is uh, monitoring their playlist. <laughs> so yes. if, ev if everything is nominal and everything's <laughs> fine with the suit and things uh -huh. like that, their other job is to to curate the the playlist for the crew um, to try to time it such that they're 
uh, the, their playlist is working out at so what the time they pull up it's it's finishing um, and some good effort and fun goes into picking the songs they listen to on the drive out yeah you mentioned that the playlist we uh, got them from Dan Hewitt over at uh, Johnson he mentioned that uh, Stephen Woody let's talk a little bit about their playlist right so theirs was uh, they had some really good songs in there traveling band by CCR Credence Clearwater Revival May We All by the Florida Georgia Line with Tim McGraw the Space Traveler's Lullaby by Kamasi Washington. He's an American jazz saxophonist. Sing Me to Sleep by Alan Walker. Spaceman by Harry Nilsson. That's an American singer, popular during the 70s. You might remember content, everybody's talking at me. Pad, I kind of think Bowen picked that one. I have a feeling. Pad, we remain on schedule. All right. There's your announcement that the Corps uh, just put out, that the crew has arrived at the pad. Yep, and you mentioned so when they drove out, they're in two vehicles. Uh, so what we'll eventually see is they'll be in two groups because they go two by two um, across in the crew access arm and through this whole process. So basically we'll see uh, Woody and Steve do something, and then a few minutes later we'll see Sultan and Andre do the exact same thing. So they'll be sort of broken up in pairs. And so they continue to rock out real quick with Sultan and Andre's playlist, A Sky Full of Stars by Coldplay, Don't Stop Believing by Journey, and Push It to the Limit by Paul Engeman, which <laughs> came from the Scarface, Scarface <laughs> soundtrack. <laughs> and boy, that was, that's some pure 80s right yeah. there. <laughs> that's my kind of my kind of. Your kind of stuff? Yeah. <laughs> crew 6 is NASA and SpaceX's six, uh, sixth crew rotation to the International Space Station since 2020. This successful NASA program is called Commercial Crew, and it's based right here at the Kennedy Space Center. So now we want to turn over to Jasmine Hopkins, who is joining us live now with one of the leaders of this program. Jasmine. Thanks so much, Daryl. We are here on the balcony of the Operations Support Building Number 2 at Kennedy. It feels great tonight, and right now I'm happy to be joined by Ken Bowersox. He is the Deputy Associate Administrator for NASA's Space Operations Mission Directorate. Good evening, Ken. Hi, Jasmine. It's great to be out here tonight. Yeah, we are so glad to have you here. As we just heard Daryl say, this is the sixth crew rotation flight from NASA and SpaceX to the space station since 2020. What do you think of that cadence that commercial crew has achieved? I think it's awesome. You know, we're launching every six months. Uh, that was the plan going in. Uh, it's been our plan for a long time. Um, I think folks may not appreciate how hard it is, uh, but the team has been very successful keeping up that cadence. Um, but I look back, you know, in the early days of Space Station, we thought three months would be a long mission. And now six months is just normal. One year is longer. Um, you know, when we go to Mars, two, three years is going to be normal. And, and this is all part of getting there. Right, exactly. And every six months, you know, commercial crew is really keeping us busy right now. Uh, what can you say about the continuous presence of the United States on the space station? Well, um, it, it's great to be up there doing science. Uh, every day the team is doing some sort of science, keeping the space station flying. Uh, but it's given us the experience we need, again, to go to Mars. Um, the longer we're in space, the more we learn. Um, and that prepares us for that eventual trip away from Earth and, and on out into the solar system. Right, and we're going deeper than we have before right now. I mean, NASA is no longer the only player. We have a lot of our partners working with us. So what are we doing to support the industry in low Earth orbit? Well, we've got international partners and we've got commercial partners. Um, and it's great to see how our commercial partners are stepping up and taking on more and more of the things that NASA used to do. Um, and that frees up um, capacity for NASA to do new things, right? Um, so we're not afraid of them coming in and doing work. Uh, we welcome it and we're trying to actually develop the capability for commercial partners to do more. Um, uh, we want them to be able to uh, launch their own crews to their own space station someday um, and uh, and and that's what we think will follow the International Space Station our private space stations um, but it's it's all about moving NASA further out into the solar system right we're all working together to get further than we have before Ken you know there's a lot going on with commercial crew right now so what other milestones are you guys looking to check off this year 2023 well we've got another crew rotation later in the year I mean that's every six months we got to keep the crews moving to the International Space Station but then we've got the Starliner flight coming up here soon so we'll have a second provider which is really exciting um, we'll have two commercial vehicles that will be able to take us into low earth orbit operating out of the United States so we're, we're all eager to see that uh, commercial uh, flight test mission or that uh, crewed flight test mission happen this spring right we're all looking forward to that it's a great time for commercial crew thank you so much Ken hey thanks for being here of course Daryl back to you thank you Jasmine and Ken 
And if you're just joining us, you're watching live coverage of NASA's SpaceX mission known as Crew-6. Good evening and welcome to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Daryl Nail, along with a recent flyer on a SpaceX, SpaceX Dragon, NASA astronaut Raja Chari. Thanks, Daryl. Good to have you here, Colonel. Thanks. Yeah, and it was a cool shot there. You got to just see of the crew arm at night. That's a really cool view with it all lit up on the inside. That's the, their path from, from the tower uh, elevator over into their vehicle into Endeavor. So. And it's a beautiful night out. Uh, we've got a nice cool breeze. Temperatures are in the upper 60s. And launch weather is cooperating wonderfully. We have only a 5% chance that there would be a violation of the weather criteria for launch. And the corridor, the ascent corridor, we're looking pretty good there too. So two areas that need to be good in order to get exactly. this rocket off. Yeah, and a lot of people don't uh, always think about that. The, it's really easy for, especially the folks that come out to watch the launch, it's really obvious what the local weather is like. But like you mentioned, the, the bigger concern often is the ascent corridor. So we need to protect uh, in the event of having to abort. So the Dragon has the ability to, to save itself off the rocket. If there's a problem with F9, it can basically uh, fire off the top and then land in the water. And so that entire area for the first stage and second stage, we look at the weather, look at the winds and the waves and figure out if that would be safe to do and have to just make a decision about that. So today, like you mentioned, it's looking great, but that is uh, trying to look at the weather for the entire Atlantic Ocean <laughs> is a big challenge. Yeah, and it can also, yeah, uh, so that is not always a given. And here come our first two astronauts, Stephen and Woody. Yeah, and you can see there, so they're coming around, the, there's, like we mentioned before, they're going to go in groups of two, and like you can see in the far background, you can see Sultan and Andre still back there. Uh, and then this is an always a, an awkward thing, was the suit kind of restrains your head. So I think ever since Bob and Doug, all of us have tried to foolishly look upwards and you strain your neck, but you, it looks kind of goofy. <laughs> but, yeah. but it's hard not to want to look, because of course you want to look up at the rocket, but the uh, the suit, for a good reason, is meant to restrain you. Uh, so it's, uh, <laughs> you'll see as they try to create yeah. the other guild. <laughs> we call it the rocket recline yeah. back here at the broadcast Maybe we should, we should build chairs out there or something. That you, can sit in, <laughs> so you can sit in and lean back. And so that's a rigid area from the helmet all the way down right. to the bottom. And the, and the reason is because if it was to pressurize, you wouldn't want the helmet to get so far up that you can't see out of it anymore. So you ha it has to be sewn very tightly um, to restrain it when it's under full pressure. But when it's not under when it's not under full pressure, then it can be hard to lean backwards. You can say Nick Hag, uh, number ninja number 12 there, will be going up with the astronauts. Mm, there he is. And I, I saw a picture online. I don't know if it was a meme or if it's actually if they've actually changed the elevator panel to change the top button to say space. I'm not sure if that. I don't remember it what, saying what space. What do you recall when you got? I in? don't think it said space. Well, when I what I recall was it's the num the numbers are the feet the of feet the launch pad. Right. Yeah. And but we know that the 255 is the top exactly. level. Exactly. But maybe someone changed it to say space. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> that would be. And I think the one on the bottom said Earth. I right. saw that. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So at this point, they're off the umbilicals, off the cooling. They, uh, you can see the, I think Ninja 10 there might have the cooling boxes. But uh, at this point, um, they've got the visors up, so it's not as, not as hot. And there is where the 255-foot level, you can see the sign on the door right next to the elevator. So... Yep, and you can see 25 the stories up, and you go up pretty quick. It does. It is a fast ride. You can see the grading in the floor there. The reason it's not solid, and we'll, we'll probably get more views of this later, is uh, if there was an emergency egress and there's water up there, you want the water to flow out. So that's why there's there's uh -huh. holes in the floor. And our two mission specialists <laughs> now <laughs> doing their I'm recline. You, we need a chair. <laughs> you just need one chair. You can just switch places in the chair. Yeah. All right. So there's uh, Stephen Woody coming off at the top of the elevator. So we'll split the screen now, and on the right-hand side, we have our mission specialists giving a fist bump, Sultan and Andre, as they head to the elevator. And uh, Woody and Steven, commander and pilot, now going against the chevrons, which are there for a purpose. Exactly. So those chevrons are the direction you would go if there was an emergency egress. So uh, if there's any kind of problem on the pad, uh, the crew's well-trained to basically be able to egress on their own if, um, if the closeout crew has already left. And those chevrons are a visual way to see exactly where you would go. And they take you eventually to, to slide wires, which are basically like some high up zip lines with a basket that you get into and then ride down to the ground. You can see now they're standing uh, in front of the NASA, the red NASA worm there, the crew arms off to the right, and then Sultan and uh, Andre are just getting in the elevator head on up. Those uh, slide wires are on the left-hand side of your screen in the box on the left, and just to oh, the yeah, far yeah, left of that, you can start to see a little bit of that structure. Yeah, and you can just uh, see it kind of angling down. Yeah. 
Unfortunately, Did you ever we ride one of those? no. I was, I was just gonna say, unfortunately, we don't get to test those. We get to test it at the top, getting in, and then we test it at the bottom, getting out. Um, but just because the first time we see it is about a week prior to launch, the last thing they want to do is have us <laughs> fall out of the slide wire box <laughs> and break a leg a week before we launch. The Sultan and uh, Andre getting off the elevator, and they'll come upstairs and join. So right now, uh, Woody and Steve are standing at. There's a phone up there. Um, at the launch pad. This is the. These are the two astronauts in the upper right hand Correct, part. Correct. Yep. So they're they're more than likely calling uh, family or loved one just to uh, kind of give the you know, the last I love you before uh, you have to do it over the radio. The radio. Who'd you call? I called my wife. Yeah. Uh, but a a key uh, life hack is that you need to make sure that the person you're going to call has the phone number up there, which is for obvious reason guarded. Um, but you, the last thing I want my wife to do is not answer the phone because she thought it was a spam call. Oh so right. So get that number in uh, Yeah, soon. exactly. Looks like we've got uh, a little backup in the queue here. So the mission specialists will stand by. And you see they're handing the phone over. The other uh, thing that's going on is because they've got their gloves on, it's hard to actually control the phone. So one of uh, Nick Haig's job is to dial the phone number for him. Uh, well, that's helpful. Yep. By the way, Crew-6 is the first of uh, three SpaceX launches on Monday. It's going to be a busy Monday, <laughs> Raja. Yeah. we got Starlink uh, off the pad 40 on Monday afternoon, followed by another Starlink launch out of Vandenberg. The pace here at the um, Space Center has really picked up, and that's just a testament to how much this place has transformed to become a commercial spaceport. Yeah, it is uh, very neat just driving around the uh, Kennedy, like just construction everywhere. You know, you see trucks with uh, parts of rockets moving around. Um, just the other day, there was a booster stage getting carted around. So it, there's always something. Uh, and like you said, just a, it is a exciting time in the industry, whether it's Artemis, you know, like you said, Starliner about to fly, a, a Crew-6 launch. There is just so much happening right now. Tonight, though, we count down to 1.45 a.m. and... Uh, I believe three seconds. If you want to know exactly the second <laughs> it's supposed to lift off, 1.45 and three seconds in the morning tomorrow. You start to see Steve and Woody going across the crew access arm there. And that's a neat shot, courtesy of our crew in the helicopter. And here comes Woody and Steve down the crew access arm, ready to get inside the Dragon spacecraft. And so you'll see there's a NASA meatball there. Um, with the, the signatures of all the previous Crew Dragons. Your signature's there. It is. Yep, and then the, uh, the SpaceX for the, the private mission. So they basically uh, kind of, and you'll see, I think they're about to hand them a Sharpie. Yeah, they are. This is on no. the Crew checklist. Now, now you got to decide if you want to take your, your hands out of the gloves or keep them in the gloves. So it's different people prefer different things. You can you can take your hands in and out without breaking the, the, leak, the validity of the leak check, but if you undo any of the other zippers, um, uh, then you do have to redo the leak check, which you're going to do anyways in the vehicle. But uh, taking your hands in and out can just be a little more comfortable, a little more cooling. That Let's looks see. like what Woody's doing. Exactly. He's got gloves on. You can see gloves. he's got comfort gloves on there, okay. though, which are basically uh, just to help with if you're, you're to absorb some of the sweat and perspiration. You want to make sure you sign this, you know, nice and legible. <laughs> <laughs> There's always uh, no shortage of dragonflies as well uh, out here in Florida, and so that's always one of the other good luck omens that the, the closeout crew will talk about is, is having uh, seen a dragonfly come around near the white room. And oh, really? That space is open there? There's a little bit of a... The, the, the black part is kind of like seals up against it, but there is open air inside the, the crew access arm. And you can see they're getting glasses positioned. So the other thing that the closeout crew is helping them with, they, they've got some crew personal items like glasses, uh, watches, if they've got the watches they're going to wear on the outside of the, the suit, this is the kind of time we'd start donning that kind of stuff. Uh, if they'd have like wrist mirrors or anything like that, they'll start getting that on now and as well as once they're inside the, the capsule. Well, white room is a term first used during the Gemini era, literally for the description of the color of the room, but it's... Not really much of a room, right? It's pretty tight. Yeah, it's more of yes, it's a, exactly. It's more of a clean room. You see, they're grabbing name tags there. Um, Aye, so yeah. they'll basically kind of a tradition that uh, started with the first Dragon launch of grabbing the, some of the closeout crew's name tags. Post persons, people who haven't either worked on the closeout crew before or haven't had their name tag float in space, and then uh, they'll fly it in the Endeavor with them and bring it on back, so they they have something to remember the flight by. That's really neat for the SpaceX team. Yep. Yeah, it is a, it is a cool tradition and. 
Uh, the, the hardest thing is remembering where you put them all <laughs> after six months in space. We had a moment of panic when we came back. Like, what do we do with the name tags? We tried to <laughs> well, take yeah. <laughs> Did we leave them in space? Our mission mm -hmm. specialists now uh, having a telephone conversation with their family or loved ones, standing by, getting ready to make their walk down the crew access arm. The other key thing Nick Haig has to know how to do is dial uh, internationally on that phone, especially with uh, oh Sultan yeah. and Andrea. Oh, right. It's, it's a government phone. It's not always easy. We Core on countdown. <laughs> we had to practice. Started. Core on countdown. And we there was a dry dress rehearsal. Exactly. We remain on schedule. To hear the call from the core that they're on schedule. So normally, uh, so the with the crew timeline, like what we train to is about 2:35 prior to launch is when the crew should be ingressing. So you can see we're we're right right on timeline, and they always build in extra time, of course, for you know the, the closer you get to launch, the less extra time you have. But mm. they try to build in uh, time to you know to repeat things if needed. So the commander and pilot take their place in the first two seats. On deck are the mission specialists. And you can see they're just starting to come across the crew access arm now. All right, good news. Thanks, Steve. And here comes Sultan and Andre. Dragon SpaceX for awareness. We're going to be triggering an onboard manual alert. Uh, you'll see this temporarily, no corrections required. So you can hear the core talking to Steve. Hey, thanks, Dragon Talk. So when they first get in, this is doing an initial check just to tell them they're in the seat. There'll be more formal comm checks later, and what you heard the core tell them that they're going to they're going to see an enunciation of an alert, but it, there's nothing required. So they're um, just giving a heads up so that the crew is not surprised when they see it. Sultan was pretty pumped as he came down <laughs> yeah, the yeah, crew was, access arm. He was moving, <laughs> pumping his fists, you know, waving and. Uh, Gave his flag on his uh, shoulder a tap. So, yeah, very cool, very exciting. This He's going to go with the gloves. Going to sign just it. Don't, just don't get any sharpie SpaceX, on the outside. We're actually able to complete that <laughs> test without triggering the Dragon SpaceX, we're actually alert, able to so, complete uh, that test without triggering the, on the onboard alert, so uh, you can ignore the previous call. SpaceX Dragon Chops, thanks for the heads up. So what the the ninjas are doing there is make, making sure that the the suit that's that uh, that white outer yeah, layer. Dragon seat three, contract. That's Woody checking in. Got you loud and clear, Woody. How me? I have you the same. Good morning, Arthur. Good morning, and uh, for your awareness, as promised, I am wearing the shirt. I love it. That makes us so happy. Arthur, one of the cores at SpaceX, and uh, usually the crews have pretty good relationships with all the cores and the MDs because we've worked with them so much. Um, so obviously, Arthur has either lost some kind of bet or made some kind of bet <laughs> to have to, to wear some kind of shirt. Um, maybe when we see MCCX later, he will, we'll get a peek at what he's got on. You can see Sultan's grabbing some name tags there as well. The practical side of that is uh, it would be great if one person grabbed all the name tags, but they don't fit. Those those packs you have on your leg are so tightly packed with checklist pages, uh, some emergency meds if you need those, uh, things like that, that you really you actually distribute those name tags amongst a few different people in the crew so you don't bust the zipper on the on the pack. I see. And that's what, uh, so you can see the crew's working exactly. Yeah. Yep, exactly. There's a little interior pocket there, um, so like a wa like a watch or glasses case or any like things like that are what would be going in there at this point. Well, there's some motivation by the SpaceX crew to make sure it gets in the right place. Right? <laughs> exactly. Up yeah. Nice and tight. You may have noticed something, folks, that's a little different than even when you flew, Raja, and that is that SpaceX is now doing some of the checks and operations in parallel. We heard the communication checks. Um, that's going to reduce the total time by about 27 minutes, but it will still be included in the nominal timeline for troubleshooting. So, um, for example, when they perform the seat rotation, the core comm check, the suit lead checks, they'll also perform the side hatch inspection. And then we started hearing those comm checks as even the mission specialists are starting to ingress. Exactly, yeah. So I think... Uh, at you know, every time we do a launch, we learn from it. So as as much as we like to think things are routine, we're always learning um, and trying to in improve from those. And in this case, trying to be a little more efficient, you know, look for places where we can uh, combine efforts at the same time. Do some operations in parallel. Exactly. 
and save some time because you never know. You might get some FOD on the seal and you might need some right. extra time. You it's always nice back. to nice to be ahead of the timeline versus rushing to catch up, especially uh, you know when you've got an instantaneous launch window. You want to preserve as much margin as you can. So you can see uh, Sultan and Andre getting in the, the vehicle now. Really got a duck. <laughs> Well, the, the real danger is bumping your helmet visor, because you, uh, it's, you can see it's easier for the, the ninjas to get in there. Um, but wearing that suit, and again, with the kind of like limited head mobility, it's, it's easy to forget that you've got a giant Duck bulb attack to the top of your head and then bump that visor into something. I like that shot that SpaceX showed us going into Dragon with the, the closeout team. Yep following right behind the astronauts and you can the cosmonauts. See a, yeah, pretty good view of Andre's uh, armrest there, and you can see the buttons on there. And so you can see that one at the, cl the bottom center of your screen with the, the little white dot. So that's actually a little Velcro button. And so the reason we do that is all those buttons would normally feel the same. So you put a little piece of Velcro on that one, and that way, even through the suit, you can have the tactile feel to know that's the push to talk button. Ah. In case you're like, just like if you were typing on the keyboard, once you find the space bar and you can orient your fingers, that's the same thing for that. Once you find that button, then you know where the other buttons are without having to look down to see them. But you've got a volume, a vox, which is the sensitivity of your mic, and then a push to talk. When the crew climbs aboard Dragon, it is referred to as crew ingress. The term ingress is used when crew members are getting into a spacecraft or airlock, while egress means just the opposite, they're exiting. Prior to getting on board, the crew completed a foreign object debris check or FOD check. That means they basically had to be inspected, and this is what you know, the closeout crew was doing, checking them for substance or debris that isn't supposed to be on them or their suits which could potentially cause damage to Dragon. And that's also why the crew wears covers on their boots. We didn't see it because the shot was kind of high, but they had them on. They also have uh, you know, their umbilical port on their suits. Those covers get removed. They have covers on top of them before they enter the spacecraft. And you can see them right there where they, you, in, you go in and just plug right, your, right into the, your armrest, right? Yep, exactly. So that umbilical on their right th thigh essentially is is that is that umbilical and you mentioned that the boot covers all that is a precaution you can see they're wearing gloves the the closeout crew is it is essentially a clean room the this, the, man, the capsule is built in a clean room refurbished in a clean room and even though it's out on the launch pad we still have to maintain the integrity of that um, it's the last thing you want to do is have uh, something floating around the, the capsule especially when it's in microgravity that can either get ingested inhale cause an eye injury or damage something and the foreign object debris Raja actually the prevention of it begins all the way back in Hawthorne. Before oh, yeah. the spacecraft yep. leaves SpaceX headquarters, it's carefully controlled all the way through launch day, and then until we will see in just a few, the hatch is closed. Exactly, yeah. It's uh, th The last thing you want is anything loose uh, in a spacecraft, and so it is from the, exactly from the time they build the components, everything is very, very tightly controlled and accounted for. Well, the uh, closeout crew is Car buckling them one, in. Uh, com check. You see the next comm check there? Loud and clear, seat one, how me? Got you the same. The Sutex are there inside the spacecraft with the astronauts just in case they need a hand, and that's exactly what we see happening right now. Exactly, yep. And uh, so, yeah, it's a mix of uh, crew strapping themselves in, but then generally the closeout crew is going to cinch down the shoulder straps um, and just make sure you're really. Uh, really secure. It's you know when you see them moving in the space, you'll see uh, during launch like it doesn't look like they're moving because they are so tightly strapped in. But there's a whole lot happening to the vehicle. Right. The vibration. Exactly. The umbilicals allow the crew to have comms through the suit, air to help keep them cool, as well as nitrox for suit pressurization, which is similar to what scuba divers use. Yep. And you can see uh, on Woody's, you can see now on his left knee is that satchel I was talking about. So that's like a little, it's a, got a kneeboard card on it, but inside that is uh, where the iPads, like so they have iPads that have backup procedures on them. You also have some cards you can write on, um, procedures on the inside, and kind of just a mix of different. Uh, this is uh, seat four, comm check. It's Andre's comm check, sounds like. Yep. Loud and clear, seat four, how me? Loud and clear, call. Thank you. There's so you a little delay between the audio f coming from the astronaut and the coming video on the broadcast. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can see Woody's zipping in. So the those two layers I was talking about the suit before, you can see there's an orange colored zipper and a white zipper. And that's the, the orange is the pressure garment zipper and the white is the restraint zipper. That's why there's two colors. Uh, and so what he's doing is looking to make sure, and he's showing the closeout crew that, that he's getting a visual mm. inspection. There's a white tooth on the last piece of the zipper, and that's what he's visually verifying as he can see that white tooth, and that makes you have a good seal. So that's what they're doing right now is uh, basically it's a two-person check. So everything's a checklist, and anything critical you always want to get two sets of eyes on. And the suit's primary function is to protect the crew in the event of a cabin depressurization, right? Takes exactly. Up yep. The pressure. And like you mentioned, the nitrox uh, flows to it to pressurize the suit in the event that happens. So there's there's a cool shot from the outside. Yeah, how about that? That's beautiful coming from our Kennedy helicopter. Yeah, so you can see the black part of the trunk, which is the section below the capsule. That's the solar panels, which you, which is kind of cool to see. Uh, most of the time in manufacturing, that's covered up with these protective panels, so it's not really until it gets out here to the pad that you get to see it like that. You can see the guy wires that uh, lead up to the top of the tower. Our uh, helicopters are up there performing a important role, and that is security, flying all around the area and making sure uh, that uh, nothing bad would happen from anybody who would want to harm or interfere in any way with this launch. And so we have also have assets out in the ocean as well. You can see over uh, in between Woody and Andre, you can see the stickers of previous crews. So important to note that one of the uh, the cool things about commercial crew and the, the both the Dragon and the Starliner that the capsules get reused. And so you can see the crews that have flown before have left their, their sticker behind. So ours is up on Endurance, up in space mm -hmm. right now. And mm -hmm. the three crews that have been in Endeavor have their stickers there. And there are four seats, as we see there, and they are numbered one to four from right to left when looking at the seats from the hatch. So all the way in the far right will be Andrei Fedyev. He's in seat one. Sorry, in the far left, correction. He's the one motioning with his hand right now. In seat two, moving across to the right, that's Woody Hoberg in the pilot seat. And just to the next uh, astronaut to the right, that's Stephen Bowen, the commander, in seat three. And then at the far right is Sultan al Nayadi. He's in seat four. All right, kind of giving some last minute handshakes here. Close out crew doing some fist bumps. At some point, they'll probably uh, get a photo, is my guess. You become close with the, cro the close. You do, yeah. Like I said, you know these people. Like it, it's actually really cool. By the time you're at the end of the sim, sim campaign, you you can tell just by the tone of someone's voice. Uh, you know, before you even hear hear what the problem is or what the thing is in a sim, you know, okay, this is good or bad <laughs> just mm, by the by yeah. the way they they sound. Well, we're ready for some social questions. We mentioned at the top of the show that we want to take your questions throughout this show. And while we've got a little moment here, while the astronauts and cosmonaut are uh, settled into their seats inside uh, the Dragon. And if you're just joining us, welcome here to the launch pad. You're looking at a live view inside Crew Dragon Endeavor out at Launch Complex 39A at NASA Kennedy Space Center. If it's your first time here, welcome. Take a moment make sure you engage that subscribe button and the like button. They're both free and they really help us out, but an exciting day here. Now counting down just over two and a half hours till launch. You can see the crew going through their uh, final checkouts there with the SpaceX Ninjas, Ninja 10 and 18 on board Endeavor, uh, helping them make sure their feet are uh, into their foot restraints uh, and that they are all suited up and belted in ahead of their launch up to the International Space Station. As you heard there on commentary, we put in the chat, we're going to be answering your guys' comments and questions live here. So if you have a question, you can send those in the chat by tagging us at the launch pad, and I'll work on answering those here in just a moment. But if it's your first time here, take a moment, head on over to tlpnetwork.com. That's where you can learn more about today's mission over on our mission briefing. And of course, it is a launch day, which means if you head on over to our shop, the launchpad.store, use promo code launchday, you can get 10% off of everything in the store as well. So I'll drop those in the chat there. Also, if you're interested in joining our crew, we are always looking for more people to join the TLP crew to help us with our mission of informing Inspire. Check out the link in the description. 
But if you're just joining us, welcome here to the Launchpad. This is our live launch coverage of NASA SpaceX Crew-6. There's a look inside Crew Dragon Endeavor from the hatch as the crew uh, begin to do their comm checks. We're continuing to listen in to SpaceX Mission Control uh, and NETCOMs as they continue through that. And we're working... Dragon. Crew is ready for comm checks. And they're going to begin those comm checks here today. SpaceX copy. Stand by for umbilical comm check. We'll keep listening in. Saw a question, what's the Crew 60G indicator? Well, we're going to have to wait to see. We don't get to find that out until they're actually in zero gravity, but that's always uh, the big question there, Amy. So thanks for sending that in. Our team's been wondering it as well. I saw uh, Shades mentioning uh, sitting in there for two and a half hours. It is a long time. Hatch closure uh, now expected in the next 30 minutes, uh, and then they will be all alone, just the four of them strapped into the Dragon. Propellant loading won't uh, actually begin just like a normal Falcon 9 mission. That will begin right around uh, the T minus 37 minute mark. The crew access arm will retract about five minutes before that. Commander, pilot, MS1, MS2, comm check. Let's listen in to comm checks. SpaceX, Commander, comm check. Commander, have you loud and clear? And Grand has you loud and clear as well. SpaceX pilot, we had you loud and clear. Pilot loud and clear. Now SpaceX uh, MS-1, uh, comm check. MS-1, loud and clear. Uh, SpaceX, this is MS-2, I'll be with me. MS-2, loud and clear. Umbilical comm check complete. Report when ready for seat rotation. Some of our members have requested that I wear the helmet, so uh, we'll have it on and off throughout tonight. I can't imagine them wearing this for two and a half hours. Dragon crew is ready for seat rotation. We're waiting to see seat rotation there inside the dragon. This is what will tilt them up. It'll make the commander and pilot a lot Space easier access, access to their controls. Well, we're just waiting for that. You can see them now having to really reach back and look up to access. Once they actually rotate, they will Initiating be... Initiating seat rotation. And here we go with seat rotation. It's just a couple of seconds. It's a very slow rotation. Interesting angle you can see here, the difference in the height of the seats. Uh, actually, you can see where their foot rests each begin as the rotation begins. So you can see each of these seats are custom made uh, for each astronaut. They are made specifically to match their suit. Uh, and there we go, seat rotation underway. A good look here, you can see underneath all the cargo uh, that is coming with them. There's also food and water uh, in there for the crew as they have their flight until they reach the International Space Station. They always have enough on board for, I believe it's about eight to 10 days, just in case they have to delay docking. Uh, or in case they actually have to uh, do an abort uh, and avoid docking and ultimately come home. Dragon SpaceX, seats are in the launch position. And there we go. They are now strapped in and on their backs, ready for launch. T minus two hours, 26 minutes, 20 seconds, and counting. But uh, if you guys have questions, you can keep sending those in the chat by taking us at the launch pad, and we'll work on answering those. I see a few people asking if we're going to have these in the shop. Um, it's something we're working on. We do want to try to get these into the shop, uh, but we don't want to do that until we know they're right. Uh, so bear with us uh, while we work on them. We want to make sure they're uh, good, make sure they stay up well, uh, and things like that. This is uh, one that I got that is not one of ours, uh, but we are working on some 3D models uh, that are uh, like what we have in behind us, some different versions of those. Uh, as well as the helmets. So we're hoping to have those out sometime this year, so stay tuned for those. But we do have our shirts, our mugs, water bottles, uh, and our lunar sample and Martian sample return bags over on the shop, so definitely take a moment and check that out as well. Uh, Arrow's asking, is that going to? I would love to. Can I go? Can I strap me in in the cargo bay? I'll go. Uh, but answering your guys' questions that you sent in in the chat, you can keep sending those in by tagging us at the launch pad and we'll work on answering those 
throughout today's stream as we can now count down two and a half hours till launch. Uh, it does seem like they're running ahead of schedule, which we heard there that they are now running some of the countdown process uh, in parallel. So while they were still boarding other crew, they already began some of the comm checks. Uh, you can see there the, I believe that's the Russian cosmonaut trying to get a little bit of uh, comfort there uh, with the arms. You'll see a lot of time them sitting with their arms crossed just because that is the most comfortable position uh, that they have on board. Uh, Shades points out, don't forget the amazing posters too. And we've got a bunch more. Uh, we will have some Crew 6 posters up in the next day or so. So make sure you can uh, watch out for those as well. <laughs> Until then, just get a helmet and a clear salvo. I mean, they're pretty... Yeah, sure. That works too. But great to have you here. Kurt, thank you so much for joining as a member. Appreciate you supporting us. Uh, thank you so much. Catching up on your guys' questions there. Uh, JR, gravity indicator is stowed away and then will float up from behind them. Yes, it is normally uh, out in the back and then kind of comes up uh, normally on the far side of this image by that window. That's where we'll see the zero G indicator uh, float up uh, once they are actually in zero gravity after second stage uh, separation. We normally look to see that there. It's about 10 minutes into flight. We're going to keep listening in to the mission control nets as they continue working with the team. But if you haven't yet, take a moment to gauge that subscribe button and share out the stream. It really does help us out. We're going to keep listening in to NASA Mission Control as we now count down T-minus 2 hours, 23 minutes, 30 seconds and counting until launch. Office is highly trained. I don't need to tell anyone how to do their job, um, but more it's a matter of like, okay, for this emergency, you know, Steve might say, okay, in the case of uh, a depress, then Woody, you're doing this, Sultan, you're doing this, Andre, you're doing that, and sort, and then, and the important thing is iterating on that. So you have a sim, you see how that goes, and even if it went great, maybe change it the next time to see, like, oh, that e either went better or it validates that we had the right approach. So it's kind of working with the training team to to figure out the best, we call it CRM, or Career Resource Management, what is the optimum way to use the crew skills in a, a, very, a variety of environments. And, and sometimes maybe uh, having the same approach, so having like a buddy system maybe works, but maybe um, you know, there's a balance of like, do you want to keep it simple? Or maybe there's a certain reason to do something like, uh, for example, depending on how good, like my Russian wasn't really great, right? So, <laughs> uh, so if we had had a Russian crew member, we had, we, you know, Tom probably would have sat next to that person. We would have figured that out or figured out certain emergencies. So, um, you know, Woody's a lot smarter than me, and Steve's been speaking Russian a lot longer. So, so I'm sure they didn't have that. I'm yeah. sure they didn't have that concern, but uh, things like that. Uh, so it's it, uh, just trying to figure out how to best optimize the skill set of the the crew. And you can and see it does their, look like their pressure. Inflated, yeah, you can yeah. see that's why Woody's hands look like uh, a, a mummy there, just sticking out. Yeah. And you can see the their knees have gotten much puffier. You can see Andre's head, like the helmet now is. You know, you can still see his nose and his eyes, but it's it's risen up. You can see how it's extended there in his neck. And that's why it's so important to be fully strapped in, uh, because if you weren't fully strapped in in the suit, you would turn and like you'd basically just puff up and wouldn't be able to like, move your arms and legs. Ah. So these are not like what we call the EMUs. These are not meant to go EVA or do spacewalks. These kind of suits. These are called IV suits, meant for in the vehicle, um, and as you mentioned, to protect you from a fire or a depress, but not to go outside and and actually move around. And we just heard from uh, Johnson Space Center that we have. Uh Four passing leak checks. Excellent. You can see they're deflating. You can see actually the suit uh, getting smaller on them. Yeah, see it depressing. SpaceX Dragon, we have nominal suit leak checks for all suits. Next, you'll see they pop their visors up shortly. SpaceX copies and concurs good suit leak checks. Closeout team will now perform final closeout steps and exit capsule. Proceed to section four for side hatch closure and report when ready to close side hatch. Also, stand by for ground station comm checks. All right, we'll move on to section four for side hatch closure and we'll report when we're ready for side hatch closure. We've been taking social questions and uh, we appreciate you bringing them in and Raj has been giving us some excellent insights. We want to take another question while the closeout crew inspects the seal around the hatch. Jump on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Twitch at hashtag AskNASA to get your question in. Our question comes from Professor Marbles. Dragon, the crew is ready for side hatch closure. 
So cool to hear about the dragonflies as a good sign. Raja mentioned that a little bit earlier, that a dragonfly, when seen inside the white room, was a good luck sign. What yeah. other things are regarded as good luck? Yeah, and I should caveat that's on on dry dress, because as you mentioned, it's a it's a oh, clean okay. room now. Yes, yeah, so, <laughs> so, so seeing it, seeing a dragonfly now ah. would be bad because <laughs> that means there's that bugs. could be fun. Yeah, that means there's bugs inside the. Yeah, so I should have <laughs> made that more clear before. Yes, during dress rehearsal. Yes, uh, let's see other things. Um, let me think about that. Uh, I think sla so slapping. If you so Steve probably had an STS or uh, shuttle patch on the outside of the thing, so mm -hmm. slapping your patch on the way into the AQF facility is like a, uh, that's a, a thing, luck. right? Okay. Yep. Um, I saw Sultan give his. Yep. Yeah. Shot. That's a. That's a. I'm trying to think of other ones. Um, oh, on the way out of crew quarters, the chin, uh, typically the chief of the astronaut office, there'll be some kind of uh, card game. Some some uh, it changes from crew to crew, but there's some uh, something they'll do with the chief of the astronaut office right before they leave the the suit room and. Honestly, I think you know, no one remembers if you're supposed to win or lose. I think it depends. No, I think I, you played it. I right? did. Well, yes. Well, there was this debate like, are you supposed to? W so one argument is you're supposed to lose because then you've gotten rid of all your bad luck. Leave it's, the it's, bad yes, luck on the exactly. ground. Exactly. The other one is you're supposed to win because then you feel good as the crew. So I don't know <laughs> what the right answer is. Uh, we actually played. Uh, uh, a little mini game of shuffleboard. Uh, we kind of yes, shuffleboard based on our yeah. We had a little tradition when we were in training uh, of playing little mini shuffleboard with the uh, uh, not the shuffleboard like the huge stick yeah, shuffleboard. Little, that little, was a little, little one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that was what actually we elected to do. And then we did pick a, a do a k game of war in terms of like picking who had the high card. But I honestly can't remember if I won or lost because we decided <laughs> we weren't sure we weren't sure which it was supposed to be. So I'm not sure what uh, Joe elected to do. Um, well, whatever it was, it worked out great. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we should have written that down, I guess. Yeah. Well, thank you, Professor Marbles, who, by the way, is one of our social participants here at the Kennedy Space Center with a number of NASA social participants being hosted by the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we reach out and uh, invite uh, folks who are leaders in the social space to come out and visit the Kennedy Space Center for a launch. They're all here, uh, ready to watch uh, their launch, many of them for the first time. Like you. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Dragon right. SpaceX closeout team is taking final steps in preparation to close the side hatch. Stand by for transition to pad hatch closed. Ensure all items remain secure from now through launch. SpaceX Dragon office. And now we're at hatch close. Yep. And so you heard that call from the core. Uh, so there's nothing the crew is actually doing in terms of the actual hatch closing. You can see they have those uh, more powerful lights out. They're monitoring. The key thing he told them was not ba so basically up to this point they could be moving things out of their satchels, maybe moving their iPads around, but from this point out you don't want to do that because if something falls off your leg, mm -hmm. you lose a pen, now you've got a piece of FOD in the, in the capsule. So basically they're no longer going to mess with anything other than the displays and their their armrests, nothing you know, t no taking pencils out or doing like that. Um, so they are probably doing the last bit of configuration. You saw those like kneeboard cards that they had on their legs, like making sure those are velcroed on, that they have access to the pen or pencil they want to be able to write down notes with, um, and getting all that done. So as we watch this, we're going to split the screen so we can maintain our visual of uh, the closeout crew inspecting the hatch before they close it. But we also want to look back to a little history and a recent honor uh, that happened for a couple of our astronauts. Today, we are launching American astronauts on American rockets from American soil, but it all began with two trailblazers of the commercial crew program who recently received the highest civilian honor an astronaut can achieve. <laughs> And if you're just joining us, welcome here to the launch pad. We're continuing a live look inside the white room. We'll uh, take a look at what they're uh, we're talking about here. But Bob and Doug receiving the highest honor an astronaut can uh, just a few a uh, couple weeks ago uh, from the vice president. We had that live broadcast. Uh, if you wanted to go back and watch that, but now T minus two hours, fifteen minutes, thirty five seconds, and counting away from launch. You can see there the uh, SpaceX Ninjas getting ready to close the door of Crew Dragon Endeavor. Uh, one of the last big uh, sequences that we will see uh, of activity at the pad uh, ahead of actual liftoff. Uh, one running well on time. Uh, we were expecting crew hatch closure at T 
T minus one hour, 55 minutes. So we're running about 20 minutes ahead of schedule, but that's part of the new countdown sequence uh, where they do multiple of the checklists uh, at the same time. They're running it in parallel. You can see them there taking a very close look and even some pictures of the seal looking for any fod or foreign object debris that could have come in on any of the people's suits. You can see on the ground there's those white sheets. Those are actually uh, sticky sheets that they'll walk over to make sure none of the astronauts or crew when they walked from the vehicle up uh, through the tower and into the Dragon bring anything on board Dragon that shouldn't be there making sure uh, that it is clean and that they can get a good seal. Almost every mission, we have seen them uh, close the hatch, do a seal check, and then actually determine that they want to reopen it. Uh, but uh, you can see them doing a close look. Uh, looks like maybe doing a, some wiping of the seal there. Yeah, you can see some plastic tape there. Uh, and now they are removing that white uh, hatch piece. That was to help cover the seal while they were uh, going in and out. The seal that's actually on the dragon side rather than the door side. Uh, as they prepare, you can see that guy's got the wrench there, which ultimately will lock it. Uh, they are uh, getting ready to do some of the final checks. Those handheld lights, making sure they can do a very detailed check uh, on that seal. Because this door will not open again for another six months. This door will uh, remain closed until Crew Dragon Endeavor is recovered from the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, by either Megan or Shannon, the Dragon Recovery Ships. Uh, that is when that door will open. All other ingress and egress uh, will happen through the nose cone hatch, which is currently protected uh, by the dragon nose cone. If you guys have questions, you can send those in the chat by tagging us at the launch pad, and we'll work on answering those while we continue our live countdown coverage here. If you haven't yet, though, take a moment, take a share, hit the share button, share out the launch stream. It really helps us out. Uh, and hit that like button as well. Want to see if we can get to a thousand likes before liftoff here in just over two hours and 13 minutes from now. Always amazing getting to spy in kind of over the shoulder of the crew as they continue working to prepare for that hatch closure, working on their iPads through their checklists. Uh, earlier, someone asked, why do they uh, all have numbers? Well, here, can you identify one from the other? They all look pretty much the same. So, with the numbers here, you're able to have an idea who they each are, uh, especially if you have trained uh, to be part of this process. You also see some of them earlier had umbrellas with them or what looked to be uh, swords behind them. Those were umbrellas just in case it was raining. Uh, but today's weather is looking nice and clear uh, down on the Space Coast as we wait for NASA SpaceX Crew-6 to begin their journey to the International Space Station. As we said earlier, the team here in Mission Control Houston is actively monitoring the International Space Station as they await Dragon's arrival. The crew aboard this station is currently in a sleep period and they are scheduled to wake up at midnight central time. They have completed a number of tasks to prepare the station for Crew 6, like setting up tools to monitor Dragon's arrival and prepping the sleep stations for new residents. Many of their clothes and other belongings launched on a previous cargo resupply mission. Back here in Houston, Flight Director Mike Lammers and his team are in contact constant communication with the SpaceX mission director for Crew-6's launch to the space station. Once we get to integrated operations, the NASA flight director will be conducting a series of go, no-go polls at the predetermined checkpoints for Dragon's approach. For now, we'll continue to follow along from here in Mission Control Houston, and I'll send it back to the team over at Kennedy. Over to you, Jasmine. Thanks so much, Courtney. Back at Kennedy here, joining us now is NASA Recovery Director Brian Berry. Thanks for being here. Of course, thank you. Of course. So, uh, Brian, we understand that you are the NASA Recovery Director for Crew-5, but you've actually done a lot of things for human spaceflight. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. Yeah, that's right. So I started my career as a flight controller for the ISS program. Uh, my team was responsible for maintenance on the space station, so I had the opportunity to uh, work directly with the astronauts, train them on tools and repair procedures. Um, so that was a lot of fun and something I never thought I would do when I was studying to be an engineer. Um, after that, I moved over to um, the safety team, and I was our safety rep for the 
uh, commercial crew program safety panel. So that was my first exposure to CCP and I would go review the hazard reports for uh, Dragon and Starliner. Um, that was a pretty neat experience also because I was able to work with Bob and Doug prior to Demo 2 and just kind of work with them on the hazard reports and get their perspective on, on the risk and the mission overall. Um, after that, in 2020, um, I came out to Commercial Crew and I work for them directly now and I've been doing launch and recovery operations since then. Um, on the launch team, uh, my role is to lead the rescue effort if we need to, if there's a, a pad uh, emergency egress or a pad abort. Uh, the launch rescue director calls in the rescue forces, so that's what I did for Crew-5 launch last year. Um, and then as the recovery director, uh, I lead the NASA portion of the team that goes out on the ship with SpaceX. Uh, we bring out our flight surgeons and we check out the crew and we load them up on the helicopter and get them back home. Right, so you've worn a lot of hats for the commercial crew program. How did your work as a flight controller in Houston prepare you to be a NASA recovery director? Well, in Houston, um, working the ISS operations, you know, you see day in and day out in the control center, you get the full feel of the six-month mission, um, so you understand what the crew is going through for that long of a mission. And uh, I think I just kind of bring that crew perspective of the ISS side to the CCP program. Um, and so when it's time to bring the crew home, you know, we, we know we owe them a uh, smooth and speedy recovery. So that's our, our priority and our objective. Right. Brian, it's great that you have that personal relationship with them. What challenges do you and the recovery team have to be prepared for? Well, uh, the biggest challenge for recovery uh, for, for Dragon is definitely the weather. Um, we have to find a landing site where the winds are low and the waves are low. Um, so SpaceX has um, several landing sites around the state of Florida that we can look at and choose the best weather. Um, beyond that, you know, we start looking at things like contingencies if the crew is injured and we've got helicopters on standby for a medevac if we need to. Um, and then, you know, there's also just built in redundancy on the ship and, and throughout the vehicle. So, uh, but yeah, weather is definitely the biggest challenge for landing. Right. Now, weather is a huge challenge in Florida for a lot of things. And after a uh, crew five returns, Brian, you're going to transition to a new role in the commercial crew program, mission manager for crew eight. Can you tell us how you're preparing for that? Sure. So as a mission manager, uh, it's more Track of a high SpaceX, level just an update. And, uh, we were doing uh, some final readiness inspections job for the entire mission, not just launch or landing. Um, and that role begins 18 months out. So for Crew-8, which launches, launches a year from now, we've already begun those meetings with SpaceX. And so uh, it's pretty exciting to be a part of that uh, that early in the mission. And uh, yeah, I'm just honored and, and proud to do that for the program. Of course. Well, congratulations, Brian. So glad to have you here tonight. Thanks, Jasmine. Daryl, back to you. All right, thank you very much, Jasmine. And if you're just joining us, we are currently two hours and seven minutes until liftoff of Crew-6 launching as part of NASA's commercial crew program, as we just heard so well. Commander Stephen Bowen, pilot Woody Hoberg, and mission specialist Sultan al Nayadi, and Andrei Fedyev are strapped into the seats behind uh, that capsule right there inside Dragon Endeavor. And here's an interesting note about Endeavor, the SpaceX fleet leader in number of flights to and from the station is Endeavor. That's true, yeah. So that's it. Go ahead. Well, so, yeah, I, was just I, I, yeah, I, I watch. Yeah, I got to watch Bob and Doug go in. And That's then, right. Yeah, and then yeah, and yeah, it's been it's cool that we have we are proving out that you get to reuse these vehicles. It's not just a, a dream. We're actually doing it. And they're certified now for five flights, which is a human certification that is done in partnership with the commercial crew program. The three previous flights for this Dragon was, uh, as you mentioned, the historic first flight called Demo Two, then Crew Two. And then Axiom Mission One, which you were on station, right? We were, when yeah. Axiom yeah. When came, Axiom came aboard. They docked the, what's called the Zenith port. Uh, so yeah, we were there, for, which is pretty historic to have the first private astronauts uh, from U.S. soil come up to the, the space station. It was awesome. And these astronauts today, Raja, that could happen for them as well if uh, if Axiom Two goes up within their increment, right? Exactly, yep, and so uh, that's exactly the plan. Um, and Axiom 2 is in training. Uh, I think they publicly released the names not too long ago. Um, so you can see that online. But yeah, so we do, they do some training at Johnson Space Center, and because exactly that, if they're on orbit on time, they'd be interacting with, with Crew-6. And, uh, we're also going to take some social media questions, and we've been taking them along the way. Raj has been doing a great job answering those. So let's uh, let's take a question now as the closeout crew 
gets that hatch closed. Seth, Seth Milborn 99 asks, how does the docking process work? All right, well, Seth, well, first off, I like the 99 because I'm a class of 99 grad from the academy, so I was going to th right. throw out a shout to the 99ers out there. But uh, <laughs> so how does the docking process work? Uh, so we have what's called an instantaneous launch window, and the reason is because the, you're trying to align the orbit uh, that we're going to put the Dragon into with the orbit of the space station. Uh, and there's different windows every day, but we choose that so that um, we're trying to, it's a, it's a combination of optimizing the prop you need to use, the propellant, uh, and the timing. So you could go faster to the space station, you could go slower, it just depends on the propellant, and, but we have to build in all these contingencies, so... Dragon. Dragon. SpaceX. SpaceX. Com check over, Com check ground, over station. ground station. And I'll pause for just a second for the comm checks, and I'll come back to your answers. SpaceX, hey, SpaceX, Dragon, Dragon, Dragon have, you line, have you line clear over the ground station? Core, loud and clear. Ground station comm check complete. Stand by for Tedris comm checks. And this is what we talked about earlier, Daryl, that there's going to be a series of comm checks checking the different connections. I'll... The ground station comm check is complete now. Next I will be Tedris is next. Next will be Tedris. Uh, in the meantime, Seth, to, to, I'll keep talking until they talk again. Uh, so w once you're in orbit, then you first you, you start in a lower orbit than the space station. And when you're in a lower orbit, uh, generally for s mostly circular orbits, you're moving faster relative to the station. So you actually start to catch up to the space station. And then you do a series of what's called phasing burns to slowly boost yourself very close to the uh, space station, and once you get inside what's called the keep out sphere, that's when uh, Houston. Dragon, SpaceX, com check. And SpaceX, Dragon, have you loud and clear? Core, loud and clear. Teacher's com check complete. Stand by for com checks with DC, MD, and LD in the launch configuration. Dragon, DC on countdown one, com check. DC Dragon, have you loud and clear on countdown one? DC loud and clear, stand by for comm checks with MD. Dragon, MD on countdown one, comm check. MD Dragon, have you loud and clear on countdown one? MD loud and clear, stand by for comm check over Dragon to ground. Dragon, MD on Dragon to ground, comm check. MD, Dragon, have you loud and clear over Dragon to ground? MD, loud and clear, stand by for comm checks with LD. Dragon, LD on countdown one, comm check. LD, Dragon, have you loud and clear on countdown one? LD, loud and clear, stand by for comm check over Dragon to ground. Dragon, LD on Dragon to Ground, comm check. LD, Dragon, have you loud and clear over Dragon to Ground? LD, loud and clear. Dragon, SpaceX with that, launch configuration, comm checks are now complete. Water. SpaceX, Dragon, copy. And so those comm checks, like we talked about, Daryl, were different people, different loops, and just making sure that all the, the key folks can get in contact with the crew if they need to, since there's a bunch of, if you can imagine, lots and lots of different comm loops on the ground with pe different people talking on different ones. So you want to make sure that, that uh, they're Dragon connected. SpaceX, we are going to commence and, uh, checks for the launch up. escape system. Expect momentary flight computer state change, followed by a transition back to pad hatch closed. All right, so that flight state change. Okay, thanks, Dragon. We'll be watching. Thanks. Yep, so the flight computer state he changed, he's talking about, so on the displays, in the bottom center of the displays, it tells you what state the flight computer is in. So right now it says hatch open. Uh, and the way that they know for sure that it's closed isn't just the, the door being closed, it's actually the flight computer state doing that, and that then initiates, uh, allows them to initiate further commands. Uh, and then cleaning up your, your answer on the docking, so we talked about it's catching up to the space station, and then you do what's called phasing burns to get closer to the space station. Uh, once you get in basically what we call the keep out sphere, uh, either along the velocity vector from below it, depending on what docking axis you're on, then you join up with the space station, and you'll see that tomorrow actually. When, uh, if you tune back in back on NASA TV, they'll show the docking.
Indeed we will, right around 3 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow. They've got about a 24, 24 to 25 hour transit from launch to dock. We want to take a pause now and we'll keep monitoring the progress inside Dragon with the three astronauts and one cosmonaut. But in the meantime, we also want to check in with a special guest, Jasmine Hopkins. Take it away. Thanks so much, Daryl. Joining us now on the balcony of OSB2 is Kurt Costello, the ISS Chief Scientist. Good evening, Kurt. Good evening, Jasmine. We are so glad to have you here tonight. After Crew-6 launches, they'll become part of the Expedition 69 crew, and their time will be packed with spacewalks, a lot of science. So can you unpack some of that for us? Yeah, they'll be there during a really dynamic portion of our year. We're going to have the cargo mission SpaceX-27 launch, the NG-19 mission launch, and then crewed missions with the Boeing CFT mission, and then Axe 2 later in their increment. So there is a ton of research going on. A lot of it's going to be dedicated to human research. And one of those investigations comes from ESA, and it's on our immunity assay investigation, where we're trying to find out how spaceflight impacts the immune system of the crew members. Right, Kurt, as you said, I mean, this time is going to be packed with a lot of science, a six-month science mission for them. One of the experiments that's been longstanding is called tissue chips. Can you tell us more about that uh, first initiative with the National Institutes of Health? Yeah, this is actually the second in a series of the NIH NCATS, which stands for National Center for uh, Advancing Translational Science. And what we're looking at are tissue chips, which are uh, sets of cells and uh, tissues that uh, go into um, uh, the ISS and are grown out. And this set of experiments from the ISS National Lab is really set to look at treatments for those tissues. So we'll be having two investigations go on board. The first is called uh, Cardinal Heart 2.0, and they'll be looking at treatments that could help deal with cardiac stressors on orbit. And the other one is called Engineered Heart Tissues 2.0. And this one is, is really interesting. They've got those same heart tissues growing, but this time they're attached to a magnet. And the magnet tells us how hard that heart tissue beats and contracts on orbit. So these living heart cells are going to be able to tell us, one, how hard they're working in the presence of the spaceflight environment, and then treatments are going to be applied to them so we can understand if that can help with those stressors. Wow, it's nice to hear that, you know, some of the research we're doing on station could benefit our health here on Earth as well. There's also a combustion experiment called Sophie Mist. Can you tell us about that as well? Sure. Sophie Mist is a combustion experiment for solids. Sophie stands for uh, solids in uh, in-flight extinction. So ignition and extinction. And what we're looking at are how solid materials burn under different atmospheric pressures and different concentrations of oxygen. Uh, the reason for this is our exploration vehicles have different atmospheres and we want to understand how solids burn in space and how they can be extinguished efficiently. So we want to be able to put out any fires that ever occur in a cabin. Right, that's very important. ISS Chief Scientist Kurt Costello, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Of course. Daryl, back to you. Thank you, Jasmine and Kurt. And I uh, thought it was interesting he was talking about that Sophie experiment and uh, burning materials in space. Uh, you worked on some experiments yourself in we which did. you burn things. Yeah, so we burn uh, things in uh, space, <laughs> Roger. What's yeah, well, you got to be really careful. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah uh, clearly. Yeah, so when you're up there as part of Expedition 66, we did several experiments uh, with the combustion chamber, uh, and it is a it is a piece of engineering. So uh, getting mm -hmm. to work on it, install new th install new materials. But the really cool thing, so Kirk mentioned part of it, like there's the one piece is making sure there's not fires. The other thing we're really interested in is uh, there's some work going on on like cold flames, and so flames on the Earth because of the gravity field, you know you have the hot part and then you see it actually go up and, and Jenny Seide in our class is a combustion engineer so there's yeah. there's some really fascinating things but in microgravity it's a ball of flame and so some really huh. interesting research is you know some cold combustion engine type technology where you could reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions because of the way the flame burns so that's that is the kind of fundamental science we're doing combustion research up is there. Is this because it's more of an efficient burn? It, well, it burns different, exactly. You can have a cooler flame as it burns out instead of having this sort of wasted uh, stuff in the, as it goes How literally. So, that? yeah, some just amazing things that Dragon fall SpaceX, out of- SpaceX, good side hatch leak check. That fall out of research we never expected. That's cool. SpaceX Dragon copies, that's good news. 
And you just heard the core talk about the, the leak check pass. We covered that, Steve. And uh, we also have a post ingress briefing when you're ready to copy. Yeah, that's great news. We are ready to copy the post ingress briefing. All right. Uh, we have no updates on weather from the previous briefing, and Dra Dragon and Falcon are tracking no issues for launch. We're looking good here. Uh, the NASA team, for your awareness, is tracking a possible conjunction for ISS in about 22 hours and uh, is considering performing a PDAM if required. We are still go for launch, regardless of if the PDAM will be required. Uh, if we do take that avoidance maneuver, or if ISS takes that avoidance maneuver, uh, they may attempt to perform it prior to the Dragon Boost burn, which helps to minimize impacts to our rendezvous timeline. We will come back after launch with more information as the joint teams evaluate if the PDAM is required, as well as if there are any updates to your mission timeline. I'll copy. And SpaceX Dragon, we copy all. Thank you for the heads up on the PDAM, and uh, we'll be bringing for those words after we get the order. So a possible conjunction. Right, conjunction is a fancy term for hitting something, running into it. Mm. Uh, so uh, For the space station. Right, not, 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 not the for the Dragon. dragon. Yeah. So as you heard, uh, there's still go for launch, and it uh, kind of ties into this question we had from social media before about docking. I mentioned there's a timeline, and you heard the That's core talk. That's a good read back, Dragon, and uh, at this time we'll step into context with Falcon 9 operators. Please report when you're ready. SpaceX Dragon, we're ready for comm checks with the Falcon 9 operators. So before they did the comm checks with the, the SpaceX, the Dragon team, now this is this the is rocket. This is the EN Countdown side. 1 initiating RE comm checks. GNC is first. So this is the launch. Dragon, GNC yeah, on yeah. Countdown 1, comm check. And GNC Dragon, have you loud and clear on Countdown 1? GNC loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by the propulsion engineer. Dragon, prop on countdown one, comm check. And prop, Dragon, have you loud and clear on countdown one? Prop, loud and clear, stand by for comm check with the avionics engineer. Dragon, avionics on countdown one, comm check. Avionics, Dragon, have you loud and clear on countdown one? Avionics, loud and clear, stand by for comm check by the ground segment engineer. Dragon, ground segment on countdown one, comm check. And ground, Dragon, have you loud and clear on countdown one? Ground segment, loud and clear, stand by for comm check by launch control. Dragon, launch control on countdown one, comm check. Launch control, Dragon, have you loud and clear on countdown one? Launch control, loud and clear, stand by for comm check by the key chief engineer. Dragon, CE on countdown one, comm check. CE, Dragon, have you loud and clear on countdown one? CE, loud and clear. This completes the F-9 responsible engineer comm checks. If there was any kind of problem with the rocket, a subsystem of the rocket, you'd want that person to be able to talk directly to the crew. So they're just making sure that comm channel is there. Going back to the PDAM you mentioned, uh, that stands for a de debris avoidance maneuver. And so Space Force is actually constantly watching all the things uh, in orbit. And then if there is any chance that we think someone will get close to the ISS, they notify uh, Houston. Uh, we have a thing called the TOPO, uh, which is the position that they analyze orbital directories. And there's uh, different levels of risk. Um, so they always will want to make sure that we are very conservative with crew safety and the vehicle safety. And so as you heard them talking about, it's not going to affect the launch decision. What it will affect effect is how they do the burns to get to the space station because if the mm. space station does a burn to maneuver then that will mean the target that the dragon is was going towards will shift and so they'll work that out over the next uh, over the next 20 hours you mentioned the topo that's the trajectory operations officer and i uh, hear from uh our uh, colleagues at uh, Johnson Space Center, that they're trending in the right direction. So things gotcha. are, are looking good in terms of uh, that possible conjunction in 22 hours for the International yeah, Space I'd, Station. I'd say it's pretty normal. Uh, at least once a week we hear about one when you're on the space station. Most of them resolve themselves. Very rarely do you actually have to maneuver the station. But like I said, you always we have this huge protective bubble around the space station, 
and anything that possibly could go in there, we always want to investigate. Uh, so this is probably just the beginning of that investigation, and then as we learn more about it, it's, it's probably not going to be a problem, but we always are wanting to make sure we're very conservative with the, the crew Make sure the you're ready in case exactly. it's not. All right, yep. very good. Well, now we want to throw it over to Jasmine, who is with NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. So much, Daryl. Yes, right now we're honored to be joined by NASA Administrator Bill Nelson as well as astronaut Reed Wiseman. Thank you both for being here tonight. Well, it's always a treat when we start launching and going into the heavens. Exactly. We're always happy to have you back here, Administrator Nelson. So first question for you, uh, international partnership is the lifeblood of the commercial pr crew program. Uh, we have the second time we have a Roscosmos cosmonaut on board, but this is the first time we have a UAE astronaut on board. Can you talk about those international partnerships? You know, as we go back to the moon after 50 years, it's not just the U.S. government. It's now an international mission, uh, and it's a public-private partnership as we go back to the moon and then on to Mars. In this particular case, uh, going to commercial crew to the International Space Station, it's very much both of those as well. Public-private partnership with SpaceX and then international crew, uh, so much so that uh, uh, you've got uh, our partners ever since we built the space station, the Russians. We're now sending an American astronaut on the Soyuz, and they are sending a Russian cosmonaut on uh, Dragon. And, um, and we will have many other nationalities going as well. Right, we go farther if we go together. Reed, question for you. Uh, we right now are in low Earth orbit on the International Space Station. That, that is paving the way for deep space. Can you tell us about that? Uh, I think the International Space Station, we've been, we've had crew on there since the year 2000. We don't even think about it anymore, right? There, so we have seven folks up there right now and they've been orbiting the Earth. They, they just flew over us here about a half an hour ago and they're gonna come back around. Uh, but the thing that really blows your mind up there is all of the environmental control, life support systems that we have, how much we're recycling water, all the science that we're conducting, and we, we really have learned how to operate off of our planet. So we can do that now 250 miles up, so it's time to start doing that 250,000 miles away at the moon and then heading on to Mars. Right, we're very exciting. Great time to be at NASA. Uh, we actually polled the NASA workforce and they want to know from both of you, what missions are you most looking forward to in 2023? A very exciting time for us. All of them. <laughs> good answer, good answer. Uh, and by the way, it's not just space. Uh, we're going to fly the X-57 all electric airplane, the X-59 supersonic low sonic boom uh, airplane, and then our uh, climate uh, we are putting up all kinds of instruments up there that are measuring very specifically what's happening to the Earth. Right, that's, a, that's really important for us to know what's going on here on the planet. Reed, would you like to add anything? Uh, I have to add that we're standing here at Cape Canaveral. Uh, we got four of our friends behind us, so I'm rooting for Crew 6 today. Absolutely, go Crew 6. Thank you both for being here tonight. Daryl, back to you. All right, thank you very much, Jasmine. And Although going into space is not child's play, every Dragon astronaut crew brings, uh, every Dragon astronaut, I should say, they bring a stuffed toy with them. And its purpose, when the toy starts floating, the strapped in crew has confirmation they've reached microgravity. And what is this called? This is called a zero G indicator. It's a long standing tradition. And there's been seven on Dragon so far. There's one in this Dragon as well, starting with this guy. It all began with Plush Earth. Who can forget him floating around by himself in the first uncrewed flight in 2017 called Demo 1. That was followed up by a sequin bedazzled dinosaur <laughs> named Tremor, picked out by Bob Benkin's son Theo and crewmate Doug Hurley's son Jack. Crew 1 took a toy Baby Yoda with them uh, to show the first four-person crew when they reached space. But since then, it's been all stuffed animals. A penguin for Crew 2, and then, of course, Raj's flight, a turtle for Crew 3. Good old There's Bob, Caleb Barron, yeah. yeah. And then a turtle and a chimp for Crew 4. For the last mission, though, on Crew 5, they unveiled the first humanoid, the <laughs> Albert Einstein Little Thinker plush doll. And so that begs the question, what is Crew 6's zero-G? We'll find out later. 
But you had the turtle, and there's a special reason for that. It is, yeah. So our class of 2017, we're called the turtles, which, uh, so the, the previous class always names the next class. And I think a lot of people thought turtles was supposed to be an insult because it's slow, but that's actually quite the opposite. Uh, the reason is when the vice president announced our class, he said that if you ever see a turtle on a fence post, you know the turtle didn't get there by itself. And so we <laughs> take it as quite a nod to the people that got us to where we're at, which uh. is very true that none of us would be where we're at without our families, the, the flight controllers, the trainers that got us there. And so we actually love the term turtle and don't take it as an insult at all. But yeah, we had to, every crew takes a while to develop theirs with ours. Actually, our turtle was named Fau, which is German for turtle, since Matthias was our German, uh. Uh, our German crewmate, and it was actually a rainbow turtle, uh, a peacock turtle, which is uh, because Tom was huh. um, class the peacock. So it was, it was a nod to everyone on the crew. You merged that in we there. Did, that yep. was nice. All right, as they seal up, uh, get the final, they've sealed the hatch, but now they're doing some final checks there with the crew. We want to check in back with Mission Control in Houston and our own Courtney Beasley. Courtney? Thanks, Daryl. When Crew-6 arrives at the space station tomorrow morning, they will officially become Expedition 68 flight engineers. Once on board, they'll do something known as a direct handover, basically saying that Crew-5 and Crew-6 will be aboard the space station all together until Crew-5 comes home. Crew-5 will be able to give Crew-6 an orientation and show them the ropes, which might be particularly helpful for the first time Base flyers on this flight, NASA's Woody Hoberg, UAE astronaut Sultan Alniadi, and Roscosmos cosmonaut Andrei Fedyaev. A direct handover also helps ensure a continuous presence on the space station, a record we've held for more than 22 years. As the station is first and foremost a laboratory, the crew will jump right into conducting experiments with new research still to be delivered on upcoming cargo flights. And now we'll go ahead and toss it back to the team out at Kennedy. Daryl. All right, thank you very much, Courtney. And as you can see on the screen there, the closeout crew, they are tethered because they're up so high. That's a 255-foot level. Yep, it's a safety measure. Yep, they're yeah. basically taking some closeout photographs to document the hatch closure. We heard them talk about earlier that the... Uh, the hatch closed state. Remember, uh, that's the cue to the cue, the crew that's happening. And after they get some closeout photos, they can start uh, backing away and, and closing out. Uh, hence the name of the crew. Yeah. <laughs> closing out the the white room. And while we do that, we've got a special guest here that we want to talk to out here at the host desk. Our next guest played a key supportive role in the development of the Falcon 9 rocket and that Dragon spacecraft that we've been watching and will eventually launch here in an hour and 42 minutes. His name is John Posey, and he is NASA's Crew Dragon lead engineer. Thank you so much for being here, John. Glad to be here. So tell me, we want to, first of all, make something clear about SpaceX's Dragon, right? They designed it, they built Dragon, they fly it for us, and our astronauts go in it. But since the beginning, there's been NASA expertise supporting, supporting them. So what would you say is some of the best expertise that NASA has provided in this regard? Oh yeah, excellent so question. So with the uh, you know commercial crew program, you know it's kind of different from past crew spaceflight programs, right? We have a, a smaller team. Like for the spacecraft, there's around only about 100 NASA engineers on our team that are uh, getting all the work done. And you know NASA brings a lot of you know very special expertise to the table uh, to try to help SpaceX and our other commercial partners, you know, prepare for uh, this day, right? Getting everything ready. Uh, we especially brought some great expertise in things like life support systems, of course, spacesuits, thermal protection systems, uh, and perform a lot of analysis, you know, in a lot of cases, double checking the great analysis performed by SpaceX, running the numbers, making sure everything matches up so that, uh, you know, we're, we're assured of crew safety on launch day. Absolutely, well, that is important. And you were telling me that you know, speaking of safety requirements, that there was a NASA safety requirement in the case of extreme fire emergency that combined with a Dragon design will make it so that astronauts will be able to do something that's never been done before. What is that? Oh yeah, so, um, you know, as, as you mentioned, right, uh, NASA set some, some really great safety requirements for our crew. Uh, the Crew Dragon has a lot of oxygen and nitrox systems uh, on board for those really deep emergency contingency cases, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, feed the leak. If we were to have a quarter inch sized hole in the cabin, we could provide breathable nitrox air to the crew all the way to landing. 
Uh, also, in like a fire scenario, if our if our air scrubber systems couldn't uh, scrub it out or dilution purge wasn't enough, uh, we had the ability to vent the cabin completely to vacuum while the crew is safely pressurized in their spacesuits and uh, press it back up with a clean atmosphere. And so, you know, that's where you know the commercial aspect of this is really exciting for us. You know, you saw SpaceX announce for Polaris Dawn, right? Yeah. They're going to perform uh, their first Dragon extra vehicular activity EVA, right? Actually do that similar type of a thing where they can vent down the cabin, uh, create a, like a impromptu airlock and then repressurize it. How so, about that? Yeah. And we've got Raja here, an astronaut, depress the cabin. You were ready for it as an emergency scenario, but for Polaris Dawn, going to depress the cabin and they float right out the door. Yeah, it's uh, super exciting to see the progress going on in, in low Earth orbit and commercialization. I mean, that's, that's exactly the NASA dream. I and mean, you heard the administrator talk about that's what we want to do is enable industry to do things in low Earth orbit and then let NASA work on exploration in, in the moon and Mars. So this is, yeah, it is amazing to see it happening. And NASA is right there by the side. Let's talk a, a little bit now about the Falcon 9. You know, coincidentally, you were also involved at the beginning of that vehicle with NASA. What contributions were made uh, to the Falcon 9 and getting it going? Yeah, so you know, I, I, I remember being back when I was a space shuttle propulsion engineer, you know, watching those early Falcon 1 live streams, uh, getting the first uh, privately funded rocket to orbit um, with, the, with the liquid propelled vehicle. Uh, really exciting. So when uh, Falcon 9 was coming along on the uh, you know commercial orbital transportation services COTS contract, um, they they were getting that uh, Dragon One ready, Falcon 9 ready, uh, and I remember uh, you know that program was edited by Kathy Leaders, who later became commercial crew program mm -hmm. manager and now associate administrator. Uh, but they tasked the launch services team uh, with uh, reviewing the safety of the Falcon 9 for CRS, commercial resupply mm -hmm. services. Uh, and at the time, shuttle program was winding down. I was on detail to launch services. Uh, so I asked if I could join that team to help assess it. And you know, before I knew it, we were working day to day with the SpaceX propulsion engineers. And you know, that was really an eye-opening experience, right? Mm -hmm. SpaceX was moving at a high pace, rapid pace of innovation, getting a lot of hardware built, getting out there, testing it. And so we were trying to share the lessons learned we had from shuttle and other NASA programs. But at the same time, we were learning from them and seeing new approaches and ways of doing things. Uh, so we, you know, tried to pull together a lot of that expertise, try to share the, you know, the pitfalls that they might come across along the way. Uh, but yeah, I was uh, able to sit in the uh, launch control uh, center. Actually, we were at a, a hangar E across for the first Falcon 9 flight, and that was just an amazing day. Yeah, and now you are working, I think you were telling me, like, as a kid, you drew a picture when you were 10 years old of a space shuttle, and now you got to hang it up on your desk. You have been working in space and thinking about it for a long time. Oh, yeah, yeah. When I was a kid, I was a big fan of, you know, NASA. Space shuttle was on TV, pop culture everywhere. Yeah. I was a big Star Trek buff. Um, so, but it really was solidified uh, when my family went to the Johnson Visitor Center when I was 10. Huh. You know, seeing real space flight hardware, just thinking, you know, these, these folks are bringing, you know, the best things of Star Trek to reality, right? Uh -huh. Solving hard problems, uh, learning more about Earth and space, fostering international cooperation. So it's uh, something I set my sights on and, and went into aerospace engineering to go work on the space program. And here you are, and you're actually headed right now to firing room four. Real quickly, what, you're, what are you going to be doing for this launch? Yeah, so I'm uh, going to be hopping on console for the uh, on-orbit shift as spacecraft chief engineer with the spacecraft engineering team. So I'll go over there. My deputy Brian remarks about to pull for the, for go to launch from the launch team, team and then the uh, we'll make sure everything's good to go for our exciting Crew Six mission today. All right, fantastic, John Posey, NASA's uh, Crew Dragon lead engineer. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, John. Glad to be here. And thanks. good luck tonight. Thank you. All right, now let's head out to our VIP location where our Jasmine Hopkins is with a pair of special guests. Jasmine. Thank you so much, Daryl. The energy here on the balcony of OSB2 is really picking up as we're getting closer to launch. And right now, I'm honored to be joined by Salam Almari, the Director General of the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center, as well as Haza Al Mansouri, UAE astronaut. Thank you both for being here tonight. Thank you, Jasmine, for having us. Of course, we're so honored to have you here. And Salam, first question for you. This is a really significant first, the first time that we have a commercial crew astronaut from the UAE. What does that mean to you? I mean, that means a lot. I mean, it's a big responsibility for us. And I think from day one, when we kicked, this, uh, kicked off this program in 2017, we wanted to have a long-term program, a sustainable program, and a program that has a positive impact on human spaceflight. So we selected our astronauts. We made sure they're training with NASA. They're training with Roscosmos. They get the full set of training so that they can be astronauts that can contribute to the advanced 
advancement of human spaceflight. So this mission really is a fulfillment of that vision. Today, when we get an astronaut from the UAE going on a six-month increment and doing the same things that NASA astronauts and the USOS astronauts will be doing, I think that really means a lot to the UAE. It really does. And as you just mentioned, training with NASA Hazal, you were the first Emirati in space. You and Sultan actually trained together. Can you talk about that? That was really great uh, privilege. I mean, like uh, since childhood, like in back in UAE, that to dream to go to space, that was a little bit critical. And even just to say that in schools back home, to say that I want to be an astronaut, that was something that not an option for us. But when they did the announcement back in 2017, and we saw that opportunity, we applied uh, Sultan and myself and 4,000 applicants from UAE just to apply to be UAE astronauts. So we had that privilege. We have been selected for the first patch in UAE. We went to Russia to train and I went to space. I flew to space in 2019. Uh, Sultan, he was my backup in that mission and I, I am now as his backup in this mission. That was an amazing journey for both, for both, both of us. I mean like we trained back in Russia and we came here. We did the whole like uh, ASCAN training. Uh, the amount of support we, 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 we saw in the whole community here in, in, at NASA that was really huge just to make this mission happen for UAE. Uh, it's big and huge and we are really excited. I am super excited to see my colleague Sultan and uh, Woody, Steve and Andre Fedaev launch the space. It's gonna be an amazing mission for them. Six months on board the station, uh, doing science, uh, exploring and uh, conducting different sessions with different schools and kids. That's for me is a big thing. It really is. It's a big thing. We're so glad to have both of you tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Daryl, back to you. Thank you, Jasmine. And now we are T-minus one hour and 33 minutes from launch as we uh, get ready for Crew 6 to take off from the Kennedy Space Center. Now, here's a closer look at some of the life-changing science astronauts are performing aboard the International Space Station. And if you're just joining us, welcome here to the launch pad and our live launch coverage of NASA SpaceX Crew 6. Well into today's launch countdown, the next major milestone uh, we're going to be seeing is confirmation of pad clear. Uh, but we did just have confirmation that the closeout team has departed the crew access arm and are beginning their way down the tower out to those vehicles and pad clear is expected in the next couple of minutes. Uh, the next major milestone that we're going to be listening for is SpaceX uh, go no go electronically uh, for propellant load. And that's expected to occur 45 minutes from now. And that's when we'll really kick off our dragon coming to life. We'll have the uh, activation of the launch escape system, the retraction of the crew access arm, and many of those milestones. If you want to know more about the timeline, head on over to tlpnetwork.com. Click the link in the chat there. We've got the timeline on our detailed mission briefing. But if it's your first time here, welcome here at the launch pad. It's our mission to inform and inspire the explorers of tomorrow because we believe that space is better together. And we're glad to have you joining us for our live launch coverage. If you haven't yet, take a moment, engage that subscribe button so you never miss another live launch coverage, launch, uh, docking, undocking, or return to Earth coverage as we're going to have a number of those coming up over the next couple of weeks. And we're glad to have you here with us while we've still got a little bit of time also make sure you subscribe to our new channel the launchpad news that's where we post all of our tlp news updates and exclusive interviews and later this week uh we'll be sharing an interview that i had with the com uh commercial cr uh excuse me the space commercial director uh with the uk space agency we talked everything about the uk space agency and uk space coming online uh and the future there and we're excited to share that interview with you in the near future. We also sat down with uh, Copenhagen Suborbital, so make sure you stay tuned for both of those interviews. If you haven't seen our interview with the Artemis Assistant Launch Director, definitely check that out as well. But we're here for Crew 6. You can see uh, the crew on board, Crew Dragon Endeavor. The hatch is closed. They've had suit seal checks, uh, inflating them and deflating them. And at this point, the crew is really, in a way, just waiting. Uh, they are running ahead of schedule, which is always the best uh, that we see. We didn't see them have to reopen the hatch this evening, uh, so they were uh, able to close that hatch on the first attempt, which is always a great sign uh, that they were able to make sure there was no foreign object debris. And there's a view of the rocket booster 1078, a brand new Falcon 9 booster ready to launch SpaceX on the side. Of course, a brand new second stage 
Uh, but a uh, historic launch complex, ready to send another four uh, people, three astronauts, one cosmonaut, up to the International Space Station. If you guys have questions, you can keep sending those in the chat by taking us at the launch pad. We'll work on answering those live. There's a live view at the NASA Kennedy Space Center's uh, vehicle assembly building. And to the right of that, that thin building with the kind of porthole looking lights on the bottom that is launch control and in there there's multiple firing rooms and inside firing room four that is where the spacex team is preparing for launch of falcon 9 here this evening and as we count down now coming down to just l minus one hour 30 minutes and counting until spacex crew six will launch from launch complex 39a at NASA Kennedy Space Center. See some questions coming in the chat, uh, asking about it. Some people were asking about the UAE astronaut. Is he the first? Uh, this is the second. So in that interview just a few moments ago, that was the first UAE astronaut. He went up on a space shuttle, but the space shuttle were not long duration missions. They were at most, you know, 12, 14 days, uh, normally in the seven to 10 day range. Uh, but tonight's UAE astronaut will be the first long duration astronaut spending six months aboard the International Space Station. Three brand new astronauts and one, uh, what's the word, expert astronaut? He's done three missions. He's he's not that he's flown even just once. He's, he's a pro at this. He's spent lots of time over a year in space uh, and is ready to go again. Taking a look at the launch day forecast, winds currently 7 to 12 miles per hour to the southwest, 72 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, but there is a only 5% chance of probability of violation, and that's concerned to the cumulus cloud rule. Uh, that is a regular thing that we have down in Florida that we almost always have uh, as a risk of violation is the cumulus cloud rule. But right now, everything is proceeding well as we are counting down L minus 28 minutes, 45 seconds, and counting until launch. Paul, veteran astronaut, there's the word. It's the middle of the night. We've got coffee flowing, and uh, we're excited for a crew launch, but a few words might slip here and there. Uh, so thanks for sending that in. Again, if you guys have questions, you can keep sending those in the chat by taking us at the launch pad, uh, and we'll be answering those. We're going to listen back into Mission Control as we continue through today's count as well. But if it's your first time here, welcome to the launch pad and our live coverage of NASA SpaceX Crew 6. Stay with us. It's because uh, rockets <laughs> rockets are hard, as it turns out. <laughs> These spaces are hard. And so your your mass margins, the, the weight is so critical. So you really want to wait until the latest you possibly can to put the gas on the vehicle because one, it's cryogenically cooled. I mean, it's just super cold. And so it starts to boil off. And so the l less amount of time it's on the rocket, the more gas you have. And mm. so you want to wait until as late as you can, but also have enough time, obviously, to do it and, and get to space. Um, so the longer you wait, and it's a balance of wait as long as you can, but still, <laughs> still have enough to get it all on board and that gives you the most gas to use to get into orbit and then have uh, gas to get to the space station. And SpaceX using super chilled, highly densified liquid oxygen that as you say, you get more performance out of it, uh, out of it the later they load. Currently we're at one hour and 27 minutes and counting looking at Launch Complex 39A and the Falcon 9 rocket, a new booster on this one, along with the Dragon Endeavor, the booster, booster 1078-1, no soot on this one, yeah, so it didn't return from a flight, they're going to fly it for the first time for Crew 6, it's in good shape and ready to go, Dragon will fly its next four person crew to the International Space Station, the astronauts that are inside, our commander Stephen Bowen, He's in seat number three, pilot Woody Hoberg, and mission specialist Sultan al Nayadi and Andre Fedyev. And you can see they've got their visors up. We talked before about they'll, they'll leave their visors up until they arm the LES, or the launch escape system, just to have, just be a little more comfortable. Um, and you did mention we had actually the opposite configuration for, for Crew 3. We had a new capsule, Endurance, and an, a reused booster. Uh, but today, uh, like you said, the fleet leading Endeavor capsule and a new booster, a new first stage. And uh, one of the cool things we get to see, uh, 
you know, while the launch coverage, uh, the folks here are actually KSC, the, the launch coverage is on the capsule, but the other thing that happens with the SpaceX launch is that first stage coming back, which is also a cool thing to see, which I haven't seen before, because I haven't seen a launch, but I'm looking, for, <laughs> looking, forward, to, looking forward to that today. Uh, so I got to enjoy the ride in the Falcon 9, but never actually saw what happened to the first stage on, on my launch. Well, just read the instructions. <laughs> is the, uh, that's the, the ship, the autonomous drone ship. It is a landing platform that is out in the Atlantic Ocean right now, several hundred miles offshore, and it will be receiving, as you mentioned, that first stage booster, and we'll see that in our coverage as it uh, comes back down to Earth, and of course, SpaceX has had great success lately with landing that first stage booster, and then uh, they'll put it right back in and get it uh, refurbished and put it into the cycle of boosters for flight. Yeah, it's, a, it's impressive. Uh, the the cadence that that we've seen them develop with how quickly we can recycle the boosters. Uh, and actually, it's funny that the capsules takes about long as, re as long to recycle as it does for us to rehab. So my post-flight rehab was about six-ish months to kind of feel back to normal. And that's about the same time Endurance launched again onto the space station with Crew-5. So it's up there now. So about the time I had my bone density and muscle all back was the same time that the <laughs> capsule I rode in was ready to go, new heat shield layers, and, and ready to blast off. So. Uh, it's kind of cool. The, the the person and the machine are both refurbished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were mentioning when you came back from space, you you know you had to get acclimated, and and there was an adjustment period. Yeah, absolutely. And it's kind of different phases. Um, when you'll see, like when Crew Five comes back here in a, a few weeks, you'll see them take them out of the capsule on gurneys. It's just, it's difficult uh, to walk. Uh, and maintain your balance. You can, but it uh, is easy to tip over. And so it takes a few days for kind of your vestibular system to reset, uh, of about a week for kind of your more, your balance and stability, and then a potentially a few months for some of your, your full strength to come back. When you're in space, you get to bring some personal items with you to kind of remind you of home, right? Each Crew-6 astronaut is allowed to bring a few personal items for the roughly six month stay in space. And so here are a few of the items that they are taking up uh, for Crew 6. Sultan Al Niyadi said he's bringing a kimono, the traditional training attire of the martial art jujitsu. He's on the all the way far right of the screen. He's also bringing some small toy rockets from the popular European comic Tintin. Andrei Fediev is taking his uh, family photos and some pins he plans on bringing back and sharing with his family. But for the astronaut right there, the second from the left, Woody Hoberg, he's bringing one simple item, and that's a photograph with deep personal meaning to him. In terms of personal items, mine's uh, simple. Unfortunately, over the summer, I, um, I lost my father, and uh, so I'm just bringing a, a photo of him that means a lot to me. And uh, I wish he could come along with me, but uh, at least I'll, I'll, well, I will be bringing him along yeah, with me. So. You will. Yeah. And here is the photo that he's bringing. Woody says it's a picture of his dad, Jim Hoberg, finishing the Boston Marathon and leaving it all on the course. Jim Hoberg, along with his wife Peggy, raised Woody and his brother in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He was an electrical engineering professor at Carnegie Mellon University, where he was known for his exceptional teaching. He was 75 years of age when he passed away last year. Woody says he will remember his father for always showing up and for his relentless pursuit of truth. And he says when he gets to space, he plans to keep the photo in his crew quarters. That's a touching thing to do. Yeah. And, and an honor a, for his father. And uh, I think just uh, all the more reason we're proud of the turtle's name is Woody's dad is, is why Woody is Woody, right? Mm. So that's, it's just like all of us. And uh, yeah, it was uh, sad for that to happen while he was in training. Um, and I'm glad he's able to take him with him to orbit. Now, you mentioned uh, that you actually brought some items aboard, and we actually have some of them, yeah. some of the things from your flight kit, so we want to take a look yeah, so at that. So basically, uh, in the Dragon, you have about a shoebox size of stuff that you can bring, so the crew can bring things, so I brought some show and tell. So, uh, so I also brought some pictures oh, along with my kids, so I've got some, <laughs> some cards that Aww, my, my children you, made Dad. for me. Uh, so all in all, just like Woody, all these things wound up in my crew quarters on the space station. This went to space. Uh, this all went to space. This is my... Uh, my PT gear from the Academy, the Air Force Academy. Okay. Um, so, uh, and people accused me of, of buying one, but it's, it's legit because it's still got the stamp with like the oh, laundry there stamp. Yeah. So that's the real deal. That's, uh, <laughs> it doesn't fit. I think maybe the shirt shrunk over the years. Okay. I think that's what happened. <laughs> uh, that's what I tell myself. Um, my wife's going to kill me, but uh, I'm, I'm not supposed to show this. Oh, this boy. is my, my space retainer um, <laughs> because uh, so I had braces when I was a kid, and now that I'm a dad having to get 
think about braces for my kids, I know how expensive it is, and I didn't want to have to get braces again, so I took this my. This is costly. Yeah, this yeah. Right, this is my space retainer. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to have to yeah. redo braces. <laughs> exactly. No. So, but so now, those those things floated around yeah, in space these, these and were, in your mouth. These were in my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a turtle patch, of course. Oh, um, of so course. So that's pretty typical for praying to bring uh, patches, uh, things like that. My wife made me. Uh, I had several cards for different days of the week, so care package style cards. Really, so for every not not every day. Okay. But this was this was like a any Thursday card. Oh, so, that's sweet. So like uh, like most things in my life, she's better than me, <laughs> so she thought of that. <laughs> uh, this is a pair of dice. So this is uh, oh, okay. in my first fighter squadron in the Air Force was the 90th fighter squadron, which is the pair of dice. And if you notice, any direction is always seven, the lucky seven. Oh, and so okay. you get your first one. You basically get these pair after your combat qualified in the 90th fighter squadron and then you you wear them on your pocket and then uh, an RMO which stands for round metal object we avoid saying the word C-O-I-N in the Air Force of the tradition because when you say the word that's a challenge to someone that they have to have it so we use the word we use the acronym RMO but so this is our, our crew uh, three yeah, one our crew, crew three, three patch the and then design. our expedition yeah. 66 patch on which, the back hold that for a second that was really neat you helped in the design of this with the fire coming out of the oh dragon yeah and with the dragon making yep, the three. exactly yeah so the, the the crew three patch has yeah the three and then the dragon like the head of a dragon in the in the flame and people do point out this is the you wouldn't want to actually see flame <laughs> <That's> <laughs> well yeah no. that would be a bad thing that would be the abort edge but uh, <laughs> but it's a cool it's a cool visual graphic yeah oh, very good very good and all that stuff went to space it did yep. So thank you for sharing that yeah. with us. That was really neat to walk through everything that you took up. And all of that fit into a shoebox. All of it fits in a shoebox, oh. yeah, exactly. All right. Well, thank and you so in much. In space, it floats out, so you've got to be really careful to keep track of it all. <laughs> right. You mentioned, you know, the crew patch. And so uh, on that note, every NASA space flight going to station has a mission patch designed by the crew. And this is Crew 6's mission patch. And what you'll notice right away is the wooden dragon ship with a dragon figurehead. That's because each Crew-6 member has an affinity for seafaring vessels. Huh? How about that? And check out the anchor. It's the International Space Station sitting right there on the ship. Uh, lastly, the sail, Crew-6 says, represents the three planetary bodies of the Earth, Moon, and Mars. And you can see the Earth in blue, the Moon in gray and white with the number six, and then the ultimate destination of NASA's Artemis program, the Red Planet. That's a pretty cool design. Very cool, yeah. That's the cool thing about patches, there's always so much hidden meaning in it. And it's uh, all the subtleties and the themes, um, even down to the colors and the number of stars, all that is, it goes into it. So it's always a fun thing to design a patch uh, and kind of pull in a little bit of each person and the crew into it. And you work very closely with the artist that designed your patch, and, and, and every astronaut does, right? We do, yep, yeah. So the JSC helps. We, we had a... a, a a known artist. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say his name, but, but basically did a pro bono for us that helped out, which was which was super, uh, yeah, super grateful for that. And but you're exactly right. We would kind of have some ideas of like some some themes, uh, and then you kind of iterate uh, on that with them. And the same thing. So there's the crew patch, and then uh, I think Courtney mentioned earlier when they get to the space station, they'll be part of Expedition 68, which also has uh, a patch, and then they will also be up there for Expedition 69. So they'll have uh, usually have a vehicle patch and then a expedition patch. Raja, full of so much exciting information here and insight into what it's like to be a NASA astronaut and to fly this Crew Dragon, go up to the International Space Station. So we want to ask uh, another social question. Send them all in, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube. And here's a question from at 11B. Does the two plus hours in the seats prior to launch go slowly or is the level of activity such that time passes quickly? It's a good question. So I would say uh, it actually goes pretty quick because what they're actually doing, and you can see actually all of them are tapping away at screens there. Mm -hmm. Even though the crew's not right now, they're waiting for the closeout crew to finish up, uh, and the F9 team is doing most of the work. What they are doing is kind of walking through all the displays and we call it chair flying, going through the sequences and actually kind of talking through some off nominal events as well. And so they're using all this as rehearsal time um, because now that's the actual day of, there's different things that will be specific to the weather in terms of what egress set you might go to. Um, and we mentioned before, like what's the commander's job is kind of like the coach and talking about like, okay, if this happens, remember, and I don't know what their sequence is, but like, okay, Sultan, you're doing this, Andre, you're doing this. And you're kind of just walking through those and mentally uh, talking through all of them. And then what Woody and Steve are probably doing on their iPads is going through the displays they're going to see for the different phases of the launch, the different stages. So they have a, a basically a, a preview mode on there, and they can talk through, okay, at, you know, 
stage 1A, this is, I'm going to make that call, this is what we're looking for, remember we're looking at the altitude tape. So they're basically mentally walking through all the phases, because once it happens, once the rocket lights, it happens fast. that's yeah, exactly, from the time it lights to orbit's like eight to nine minutes, so you can't, <laughs> it's not, it's too late to talk about it then. Uh -huh. So you're using all this time to go through all those sequences and talk about, okay, uh, what if we have to, you know, what if the cage of a stage 2D abort and what are we going to do? And, and all the different what ifs, because there's different decision paths in each of those procedures and you're sort of walking through like, okay, if we go down this path, uh, remember, you know, here's the things to remember. So it's just a one last training session, if you will. Seems like a lot doing these mental reps and <laughs> going through, but that, that really greases you. Exactly. And that's why then it becomes just, uh, you know, kind of muscle memory when you're actually in the moment mm -hmm. then. All right, we have another question. Joab MSM asks, what does an astronaut do for NASA while they are not in space? I'm glad you asked that because <laughs> that's one of, my, the, one of the things I try to harp on the most when I do public affairs events is most of our job is not flying in space. Of course, we all love to fly in space, mm -hmm. um, but for example, Tom Marshburn, who was my pilot on Crew 3, he was in the office for 28 years and spent you know about a year and a half in space, but that's not much time compared to the 28 years in the office. So most of our job is all the development and engineering and science work for all the programs that are going on. So right now, Artemis is what we're all working on. Um, so there's the SLS rocket, there's the Gateway uh, Lunar Habitat, there's the HLS, which is the human landing system. That's the lunar lander. That, that's that, what you're working on. That's what on. I'm working on. Yeah. Um, there's the Orion capsule. So all of us are working on these different programs, helping with the, the development of them. And then we also have uh, all kinds of other jobs just to keep the office going. So we have, uh, you met, uh, you saw Reed, who was the former chief of the office. Joe is now the chief. So that's that's a job. Right? Mm -hmm. You've got branch chiefs who are uh, running all the different personnel in the office. So these are all, you know, all those jobs are what we do when we're not flying in space, but we still maintain a currency. So you're doing a job, but you're still flying the T-38. You're still doing NBL runs, the neutral buoyancy, which is where we practice our spacewalks. You're still doing biology training, geology training. You're doing all these things, ISS training, at a currency level. And then once you're assigned, you stop doing your technical job and work solely on preparing for the launch vehicle on that particular expedition on the space station. And I know you've been busy, too, because even in your time helping us with the broadcast, we're greatly appreciative of you being here. You've been busy. like <laughs> you're, you're on your laptop, you know, finishing up some work and stuff. So we really appreciate you taking the time to <laughs> well, be here for the we, broadcast. I, I think that's why we all, we all love our jobs. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fun. All right. Let's check in now and go back to Houston, Texas with uh, Courtney Beasley. What's happening in Mission Control, Courtney? Thanks, Daryl. The flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston are laser focused on the onboard systems of the space station, ensuring it is ready to receive Crew Dragon. They're also making sure all communication links between the station, Dragon, and the ground are working properly. The consensus to this point is that everything is proceeding right on track. Teams here in Mission Control Houston, the team in Hawthorne, and the astronauts aboard the space station will monitor the autonomous docking of the spacecraft tomorrow. They'll perform a series of leak checks, then work to open the hatches on the Dragon side and inside the station's pressurized mating adapter. We expect hatch opening to take place about an hour and a half after docking. Once on board, the astronauts will be greeted by the space station crew and will then join in for welcoming remarks for the new crew members. From there on out, they will no longer be referred to as Crew 6, but rather as flight engineers of the International Space Station until their return back to Earth. Here in Mission Control Houston, Flight Director Chris Dodd Dobbins is now on console overseeing the team for launch. And that's it from Mission Control Houston for now, so I'll toss it back to the team in Florida. Daryl. These commercial crew program. It was created in 2011 and has been flying astronauts from American soil to the International Space Station for the last two years. Let's bring in NASA's Jasmine Hopkins again, who's with Kennedy Center Director Janet Petro and Deputy Director Kelvin Manning. Thank you so much, Daryl. Uh, Janet Petro, Kelvin Manning, always a pleasure to have you guys here. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you, Jasmine. Of course. So, Janet, I know that your, uh, one of your catchphrases is embrace the challenge. So talk to us about how the workforce has done that here at Kennedy to return to human spaceflight in just the past few years. Yeah, you're exactly right. I do like to say embrace the challenge. And I would tell you the uh, Kennedy workforce has really embraced the challenge. You know, if I start 
with last year. We are celebrating our 60th anniversary. We ended the year with that very historic uh, uh, Artemis I mission, um, and we were established 60 years ago all for all about the Apollo missions and going back to the moon. So Artemis, we're going back to the moon, more sustainable way. And here we are, and we are going to be um, with our sixth SpaceX operational mission, Crew 6, tonight. Um, so the whole transformation of the center from that just government only focused center to what we are today. We have a very vibrant um, space ecosystem out here, multitude of um, commercial companies as well as our government programs working. So we have embraced the challenge of transforming to be the um, 21st century uh, spaceport. Exactly, and Janet, I'm glad you used that word spaceport. Kelvin, question for you. It's no longer just NASA out here. We're working with a lot of our industry partners. So how is Kennedy supporting them? Well, we're supporting them in many ways, Jasmine. It's interesting because we have a new vision statement and our vision is that uh, igniting, igniting <laughs> exploration and discovery for all. And the mission is to provide continuous access to space from Earth's premier spaceport right here through creativity and innovation. So you see all that coming to fruition here uh, through our vision and it's the government, industry, as well as our international partners. That is great, Kelvin. Thank you so much for sharing that vision. And right now, Crew 6 is launching at the end of Black History Month. We know that Kennedy has been doing a lot to celebrate that as well as the agency. Can you both tell us about that? Yeah, so we've had a number of um, uh, uh, events around. We are, one of our employee resource groups is the um, Black Engineering Strategy Team, BEST, um, that's our African, but really all of our EJ, ERGs here um, really promote our core value of inclusion um, that we have here at NASA. We're so proud of all the ERGs, N numerous events throughout this, um, throughout the month of February celebrating that. Exactly. Kelvin, you'd like to add anything? Oh, sure. So, by the way, Kelvin's our champion for BEST. Oh, Executive fantastic. Champion for Executive best. champion. <laughs> uh, that's correct. And um, through diversity. Diversity gives us innovation. You know, people with different backgrounds, different thoughts. We want to be inclusive, like Janet said, and through diversity, we get that innovation that helps us solve the agency's challenges. And we've got a lot in front of us um, to return to the moon and onto Mars. Exactly. And one last question. Uh, last year, we had 57 launches from Cape Canaveral. Uh, this year, we're slated to have over 90. What do you think of that fury of launches coming for us, Janet? Um, it really is amazing. You know, the year before last, it was 31, 57, 94. We're going to be well over 100 in a couple years. And um, all of uh, across the center requires the support for every single launch, whether it's on our property or if it's on the Space Force property. Together, um, Kelvin talked a little bit about those partnerships. We work together to make all those launches successful, whether it's commercial, whether it's a government launch, a national security mission, we all work together for that. So we're busy, busy, busy. You know, I thought we were really busy for Artemis at the end and 57 launches this year. We're even going to be um, uh, more busy, uh, if you will, um, supporting all those uh, launches. But we are we are incredibly proud of what we have accomplished at the spaceport. Um, couldn't have imagined it 10 years ago that we would be at a, nearly 100 launches um, uh, in the decade from the last shuttle launch. So incredibly proud of the entire Kennedy workforce. Exactly. Busy is the right word. Kelvin, anything last to add? Sure. And the cool part is we have commercial partners out here that haven't launched yet. So we tell people we're just getting started. So exactly. it's very exciting. Right. No, that is perfect. We really are just getting started here at Kennedy. Always great to have both of you here tonight. Thank you, Jasmine. Of course. Thank you. Daryl, back to you. Thank you, Jasmine. And if you're just joining us now, welcome to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida and NASA's live coverage of the Crew-6 launch to the International Space Station. I'm Daryl Nail. I'm joined by Raja Chari, a recent, recent flyer on Dragon. Crew-3, the commander, glad to have you here. Thanks, Ed. Happy to be, glad to be here and that's uh, getting close. It looking, is. The rocket's looking good out there. It sure is. We've run down through a, a few milestones already. We've gotten to uh, a critical part where uh, we are awaiting now the launch escape system to be armed as well as the fueling of the rocket. Uh, leading up until that point, we've uh, had the crew go into the spacecraft that you see right there. They were helped by our closeout team. The umbilicals were attached, which uh, provide breathing air and communications to the astronauts. They did their suit, suit leak checks. We saw them pressurized and then depressed. And then the comms checks were completed with the core, the crew operations resource engineer with SpaceX and the launch director. 
And now we are standing by for those next big milestones. And in the meantime, we've been taking your questions from hashtag AskNASA. All of them from social media, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, and uh, Facebook. And we've got a question coming up for us right now on the screen for Raja. And from Twitch asks, how long will the crew stay on space station? Well, it, uh, it varies, but generally the expeditions are about four to six months. It can change a little bit uh, depending on the, the traffic flow. The, the space station is sort of like a giant bus terminal in the sky with the vehicles coming and going. Um, so yeah, crew six planned about at about a six month stay. Um, when I was up there, Mark Vandehyde did a year long mission. Then Frank Rubio, who's up there now, will also be about, be about a year long mission. Um, so, but and you know the reason we're trying to go longer and learn out more and learn more uh, is because as we go to the moon and Mars to stay, we really want to make sure that we understand the, the effects of the human body uh, on long duration space flights. Very good. Another question, Mr. Beast from YouTube asks, what will they be working on during their six month stay on the ISS? Also, why will NASA's coverage of the mission switch to an audio only feed after ascent? Well, I can help out with the, um, with the audio only feed, but you want to answer about the what they're going to be working on? Sure. So uh, the the big answer is science, and so the the ISS is a national laboratory in the sky, um, and it's specifically we do research that can only be done in microgravity. Um, you heard Kurt, uh, Dr. Kurt, talk a little bit earlier about some of the some things specific to their their increment have to do with uh, some tissue. Uh, chip research. They're going to do some swabs on the outside of the space station, which is the first time we're going to have done that, uh, to see if microbes from our human body, so we bring along as humans this whole, you know, all this stuff that comes off of us, uh, and we're, one curiosity is from a planetary pr protection standpoint is whether we would be contaminating the outside of the space station and what implications that has for the moon and Mars. Um, they're going to be doing some more plant research, so I would say, you know, we are we understand how to grow plants in space, but it takes a lot of crew time to do do it. So kind of the next step is how to do that um, with better what we call regolith simulants, which is like basically dirt because you just can't have normal dirt in space. It floats <laughs> away. So you need to figure out some way to have uh, a root system. Uh, and, and so that's where kind of the research for plant technology is at right now. So they're going to be involved in all that. But, but all told, in a normal you know, six-month increment, you, they're probably going to do upwards of 300 different science experiments, which is just an incredible number, um, over two a day. Uh, and then all the, re the work to to support those science experiments. That's an incredible amount of science that's going to be done. Now, with regards to the second part of that question, why will NASA's coverage of the mission switch to an audio-only feed after ascent? Now, traditionally, we've done video the entire time, but uh, it, that is correct. We are going to switch to audio-only after the ascent portion of the flight, and that's because the length of the crew's transit to the station which is 24.8 hours, we elected to maintain commentary on mission audio circuits during the lengthy period of non-activity and while the Dragon crew is asleep. So we are continuing coverage nonstop and will resume NASA TV coverage on Monday night prior to the start of critical rendezvous operations. But in the time in between, we're going to allow you to hear the mission audio, that critical communication between the ground and Dragon, if there is any. We'll keep that up live, but we won't have a commentator uh, speaking to it. And now we are getting close to one hour until liftoff. This day is the continuation of regular crew flights to the space station from U.S. soil. T minus one hour and two minutes and counting until SpaceX's Crew-6 mission, which will be the company's sixth crewed space flight for NASA, following the crewed test flight of Demo-2 and four previous operational crewed missions to the space station. It will also be SpaceX's eighth crewed space flight overall, and that includes the private missions, Inspiration-4 and Axiom-1, which visited Raja while he was on board station. Today, our crew is flying on board Dragon Endeavor, and it will be the fourth flight for this capsule, and it will be taking a ride on a brand new Falcon 9 rocket that you see below it. We've had a great countdown so far. We just got a report on the weather, and it's just spectacular out there, uh, both at the pad, and then the corridor weather also looks great, according to our friends at JSC.
So they're doing some final pad wind evaluations and it's all coming together, releasing some balloons, getting those final wind data in the upper parts of the atmosphere and uh, so far are things looking good. We're getting a little bit of a breeze now, which is uh, keeping the bugs off us, Isolation nice. valves to equalize low flow pressure. SpaceX Dragon Cups. And so the reason they tell them, so there's nothing the crew's actually doing for that particular call, but they let the crew know a lot of those valve openings and closings because you can actually hear it and feel it inside the vehicle. You can hear the funk or the clunk, and so it's good to know that's about to happen so you don't just hear something happening in your vehicle without, uh, otherwise it'd be a bit discomforting to hear a big metal sure. chank, clunk without knowing <laughs> if that's supposed to happen or not. It's a good heads up yeah. by SpaceX to let the astronauts know what's coming. So with about an hour to go until liftoff, things are really going to start picking up, as you've already noticed. We'll get close to the go, no-go pole to arm the launch escape system and then, of course, begin the propellant loading. The crew pole for readiness happens at T-minus 60 minutes in just a few seconds. And then the dragon pole for prop load is at T-minus 55 minutes. From there, at T-minus 45 minutes, there will be an internal mission control Hawthorne pole and then the launch director's pole for propellant loading. And then when we get to about T-minus 40 minutes, Dragon the crew SpaceX, access arm will retract. Go for section 5 of 4.100. When ready, report go for launch. And there's the T-minus 60. And we copy. We're picking up at 5.1 of 4.100. So that's that 4.100 procedure we were talking about earlier. So they're still in that, and then there's different sections like we described. So this particular section is preparation for LES arming, or the launch escape system arming. And so what they're doing inside the capsule now is one, one last check, making sure they're fully restrained. There's new, no loose items. Um, they may have had their feet out of the, feet the boot restraints uh, just to relax and stretch out their legs, but at this point they're going to be putting them all in. And the reason is, uh, once the launch escape system is, is hot, it's just like a, an ejection seat. The, the whole thing can fire. And so you want to be fully restrained, fully in a position where if it did uh, 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 basically pop the capsule off, that you're not going to get injured doing that. Um, and it's armed prior to launch because as soon as we start putting propellant in the Dragon, you want the ability to basically um, have that system active. And when we get to about T-minus 40 minutes, the crew access arm will retract and the crew will get the call to close their visors and to arm the launch escape system. This is the automated safety system in place that can fire the eight Super Draco thrusters on Dragon to quickly separate the crew from the rocket, either on the pad or during flight on the ride uphill. And then once we reach about T minus 35 minutes, propellant loading for the Falcon 9 will begin. Dragon, uh, we are go for launch. SpaceX copies, crews go. There you heard the go. And thanks for tuning in. You're watching live launch coverage of NASA and SpaceX's sixth rotational flight of astronauts and one cosmonaut to the International Space Station. We are. If you're just joining us, welcome here to the launch pad. We are T minus 57 minutes, 57 seconds, and counting until liftoff of two NASA astronauts, one Russian cosmonaut, and one UAE astronaut from Launch Complex 39A at NASA Kennedy Space Center in Florida. If it's your first time here, though, welcome here at the launch pad. It's our mission to inform and inspire the explorers of tomorrow because we believe that space is better together, and we're glad to have you joining us. An incredible helicopter shot here wrapping around to see the the rocket out on that historic pad but we are glad to have you here for our live launch coverage of crew six heading up to the international space station we're going to bring you uninterrupted coverage from launch and then we're going to have our live tracker come online just shortly after uh, the crew gets in orbit where you'll be able to follow along with crew six as they make their journey to the international space station and then we will be back with our commentated coverage for the do final rendezvous docking and welcome ceremony of Crew 6 on board the ISS. But we're glad to have you all joining us here tonight. If you enjoy what we do, take a moment, engage that subscribe button so you never miss another live launch coverage, docking, undocking, or return to Earth. We're going to answer your questions over the next hour as we count down to launch, so you can send those in the chat by tagging us at the launch pad, and we'll continue answering those uh, to the best of our ability. It's going to be a busy hour with many milestones coming up. We're going to try to keep those 
on the screen for you, like right below me. The next big milestone we just heard there, the crew is go for launch on board. Uh, so we're going to wait to see that crew axis arm retract in the next about 15 minutes. And that's when things really start to pick up. We're going to have the Dragon launch escape system uh, armed after that arm is retracted. And then we'll have a final go for propellant load. And then we get into a regular Falcon 9 count as that Falcon 9 will be loaded with liquid oxygen um, for flight and RP-1 or rocket grade kerosene. If you're just joining us, though, that's a live view of Launch Complex 39A at NASA Kennedy Space Center, where two NASA astronauts, one Russian cosmonaut, and one UAE astronaut are strapped in and ready to go to space. We've been running through the timeline, and everything is running nominally well for here today. Uh, that vehicle, uh, a typical Falcon 9, but with the Crew Dragon Endeavor on top, Crew Dragon Endeavor ready to go for its first fl fourth flight up to the International Space Station, the first crewed launch of SpaceX and of any agency in 2023. And we're glad to have you joining us here. We do have mission control nets patched in, so anytime we hear an update or communications between uh, the Dragon and mission control, we are hearing that, and we'll listen back in to NASA's uh, commentated coverage as well throughout today's stream. I know it's a, a late one for many, uh, some already into the new day. It is now uh, 12.50 a.m. local time at the launch site. Uh, a bright and early morning launch, but we're glad to have you here if you're joining us in North America. If you're over in Europe, uh, a good morning. It's a kind of a perfect time for launch. And if you're around the world, we're glad to have you here. Take a moment, let us know in the chat where you're watching from. So hit that like button. It really does help us out. It's free to do so. But let's continue to listen in to NASA Mission Controls. We count down T minus 54 minutes, 40 seconds in counting until launch. Stay with us right here on the launch pad. Including avionics, navigation and control, software, propulsion, life support, and communication with ground support teams. Now, apart from mission control, our Falcon 9 team is currently located in firing room four in the launch control center at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. With less than an hour until launch, they are settling in for final checkouts, propellant loading, and for launch. That's right, and NASA has its own team members in Mission Control in Houston, Texas, where they've been preparing the space station for Dragon's arrival, and recently gave their go for launch, saying that the station itself is ready to receive the new crew. Upon liftoff, today's ride to the space station will take about 25 hours, with Dragon flying autonomously the entire way. And just like an autopilot on a commercial aircraft, the crew always has the ability to take manual control of the spacecraft if necessary. Now at T minus 53 minutes and 38 seconds to go, we are looking good for an on-time liftoff. And our very own incredible Kate Tice has been monitoring the progress of the countdown. How's it going, Kate? Thanks, Jesse. I'm Kate Tice, SpaceX Quality Systems Engineering Manager. And for those that have just recently tuned in, we had a smooth countdown so far today. The crew of six astronauts completed ingress at T minus two hours and 23 minutes. And since then, the teams have completed the required comm checks, suit leak checks, and side hatch closure, closure as well as its associated leak check. As for Falcon 9, our two-stage reusable rocket, final propulsion checkouts of first and second stages of the engine began a few minutes ago in preparation for propellant loading. Now that involves testing and cycling the valves and engine pneumatics for pressurization. Uh, at T minus 45 minutes, the team will report their readiness for prop load with a final electronic go, no go poll. But before we can start loading propellant on the Falcon 9, we have a few tasks to perform. First, we need to retract the crew access arm away from the Dragon capsule to its launch position. That will happen between T minus 44 minutes and T minus 42 minutes. Then with that crew arm out of the way, the launch escape system will be armed. Once those two events are complete, Dragon will be ready for Falcon propellant loading. Now we'll also verify with the launch weather officer that all the weather meets all the constraints. That includes items such as wind speed, uh, as well as lightning and precipitation. Uh, however, for tonight, we expect acceptable weather conditions for launch, both at surface level, at surface level and upper altitudes. As we reported earlier, the possibility of violation for all of those criteria is only 5%. So uh, pretty good for Cape Canaveral, looking good there. 
As for the range, uh, currently clear for launch uh, from historic pad 39A. Worldwide network of ground stations and the tracking and data relay satellites, or TDRS, as you hear it called out on the nets, uh, those are ready to support Dragon as it heads into orbit. Today, we have an instantaneous launch window at 1.45 a.m. Eastern. Once we begin propellant loading, there is no opportunity to change that T0. The timing for Dragon to rendezvous with the ISS is incredibly precise down to the exact second. So therefore, we only get one chance to go to space today. But at good news, at T minus 51 minutes and five seconds, uh, we are good for launch. Good to go. Great to hear, Kate. Today's launch marks the sixth time a rotational crew will fly on a commercial spacecraft. And much like our previous crews, today's crew has been training with our teams at SpaceX for the last several months, running nominal and emergency simulations of what the full mission will look like while seated inside of Dragon. And as with every mission, each one of our crew members brings a diverse set of experiences to today's flight. That's right. And we'll start with the mission's commander. Steve Bowen was born in Cohasset, Massachusetts. He holds a bachelor's degree in uh, electrical engineering from the U.S. Naval Academy and a master's in ocean engineering from the Joint Program in Applied Ocean Science and Engineering at MIT and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. In July 2000, Bowen became the first submarine officer selected as an astronaut by NASA. This will be Bowen's fourth trip into space as a veteran of three space shuttle missions, STS-126 in 2008, STS-132 in 2010, and STS-133 in 2011. Bowen has logged more than 40 days in space, including 47 hours, 18 minutes during seven spacewalks. As the mission commander, he'll be responsible for all phases of flight aboard Dragon, from launch to reentry. Warren Woody Hoberg is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He earned a bachelor's degree in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT and a doctorate in electrical engineering and computer science from the University of California, Berkeley. He is also a commercial pilot with instrument, single engine, and multi-engine ratings. The mission will be Hoberg's first flight since his selection as an astronaut in 2017. As pilot, he will be responsible for spacecraft systems and performance on Dragon. Sultan Al-Niadi will be making his first trip into space, representing the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center of the United Arab Emirates. Aboard Dragon, he'll serve as a mission specialist, working to monitor the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and re-entry phases of flight. He spent time in the UAE military prior to becoming one of the first two individuals selected by his country when they started their space program just a few short years ago in 2017. Al Niadi will be the first UAE astronaut to fly on a commercial spacecraft. Andrei Fedyaev will be making his first trip to space and will also serve as a mission specialist monitoring the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and re entry phases of flight. He was selected as a cosmonaut in 2012 and will be the second cosmonaut to fly aboard a SpaceX Dragon. Each of these crew members will be a part of Expedition 68 upon their arrival to the International Space Station. Now let's head back over to Kate for another status update on the countdown. How's it going, Kate? Thanks, Jesse. It's now T minus 48 minutes and five seconds. The SpaceX launch teams are finishing final review of data from checkouts of Falcon 9 that have occurred over the last hour. The launch director has confirmed with the launch weather officer that weather meets propellant loading constraints. So next up will be to pull the team for readiness, both to load propellant and to launch. Uh, therefore, that will be the final pull that occurs prior to liftoff. The seven SpaceX responsible engineers, often called REs, indicate that they are go for launch and prop load electronically, voting on the online countdown procedure. The launch director, or LD, as it's called out on the nets, also checks with the Dragon mission director, or MD, as well as the NASA launch manager to make sure that they are ready. Now, earlier you saw the vehicle assembly building, lovingly referred to as the VAB. The Falcon and Dragon launch team, as well as key NASA launch members, are in the launch control center, which is adjacent to the VAB. Uh, you have a view of that room there on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, that is uh, firing room four, and they have a view looking straight toward pad 39A. Now, there also on your screen on the right-hand side, you can see the Dragon capsule. Uh, that crew access arm is still in the service position. Uh, inside the capsule there are four crew members looking pretty comfy and uh, pretty relaxed prior to liftoff.
As you can see, that crew on board Dragon, they're waiting for the next instructions, uh, which will be to stow the crew arm for launch and to arm the launch escape system. Now, once the launch director gives the final instructions to the launch team, the crew arm sequence will be armed and initiated. Now, we should get a good view of the Axis arm as it swings away from the capsule, which will take about two minutes to completely move out of the way. Checking in on the range continues to be go for launch there. Mon they are monitoring the clearance area around the launch pad as around uh, as the as well as the air and sea space uh, around the flight corridor. There at Kennedy Space Center, the weather conditions are predicted to be acceptable for launch. As I mentioned before, only a 5% chance of violating the conditions, which include uh, winds, both upper and launch altitudes, uh, thick clouds, um, as well as the downrange landing zones. Uh, in the unlikely event that an abort is, um, is called for in that escape sequence, um, we have to make sure that the weather for those downrange landing zones is also acceptable. But everything is looking there, looking good on the weather front. Uh, now we are expecting that uh, final pull from the LD to occur here in about 20 seconds. So uh, we will pause and listen in for that, uh, uh, for that announcement. Is complete and the team is ready for crew access arm retract, propellant load, and launch. Both control rooms will go into lockdown at T minus 45 minutes and remain in that state until the launch escape system is disarmed. All operators are to remain in their console and maintain a sterile cockpit until MD confirms successful disarming of the launch escape system following orbit insertion or propellant offload in the event of a scrub. For non urgent no go conditions, brief the CE or the LD and they'll approve aborting the launch countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will board the launch ice sequence immediately and proceed into the launch abort sequence. At T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off, relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup is imminent or occurring per Dragon manual escape flight rules. Launch control, you may proceed with arming the launch, the crew arm for movement. Proceeding with crew arm movement. All right, as you just heard there, that final go for launch as well as for propellant load coming from the launch director or LD. So all good news there. We are still go for space tonight. Uh, as of right now, the crew access arm is being prepared to be moved out of the way. Um, so to basically to clear room for the Falcon 9 to lift off. So uh, to follow along with that action live, let's go back crew over to- Crew access arm has started. And there's that call out for that retraction beginning. Let's go back over to Daryl to follow that live at KSC. All right, thank you, Kate. Appreciate it. The countdown continuing to tick down as you see the crew access arm moving away. I'm here with astronaut Raja Chari. That crew access arm, as it rotates out of the way, is that something that you can feel when it disconnects? So we talked about that. <laughs> we, we could definitely hear, uh, like, uh, thought we tend to sense the vibration of it. Um, I think we got a little bit of sense of motion uh, from the wind, but uh, I don't know if we were just imagining it <laughs> or not. Because <laughs> there's a whole lot of your senses are super per, like heightened, uh, heightened yeah. right now, yeah. Um, so you're definitely, uh, uh, we do. We actually did talk through, I do remember talking to them, as we talked earlier about how you're kind of going through different scenarios and timelines and uh, one thing is if there is a emergency egress button in the capsule but one of the things the big difference is now that the arm is swung back is you definitely want to make sure the arm has swung back towards you in the event of an egress that makes mm -hmm. sense because you don't want to step out into no. <laughs> nothing because at this point the the les is not hot 
but the arm so is the arm would away. have to come back. The arm back. has to swing back. Uh -huh. Yes, and it, and there's two rates. So the arm moves away at a slow rate, but in the event of an emergency egress, it swings back at a pretty quick rate. Right, uh -huh. so as you want to get out quickly. Yeah. Um, but that's one of the things they're probably talking through. Is like, hey, don't forget, first person out the door, make sure to look down first. <laughs> make sure there's a <laughs> that's, that's important. That's a, a big first step. <laughs> yeah. If, if you no. if it has to swung back into place. Great insight there, Raja, on the crew access arm. I didn't know that about it being able to return so quickly, but it makes great sense from a safety perspective. And so now, coming up, we expect to hear a call to arm the launch escape system. Yep, and so the crew at this point, uh, should in preparation for that, will be putting the visors down. We, they should have already d done all those steps. Um, they'll verify that, and uh, once they get the go, then they will arm the LES and get confirmation uh, that it is armed. We talked before about the, the hatch closed state, so that's uh, also in this phase. That's the way you actually know it's armed is you see the flight computer state change. So it's a, a command you send to put it into the armed state, and then you know it's happened when you'll hear sounds, but that's the, uh, that's the official way you know it's actually there. And the, the, really the purpose of the, the LES, of the launch escape system, is, is it's both an automated and a manual system. So there's the, the vehicle is monitoring a whole bunch of parameters. And so one of the reasons they have to do a poll for arming is all the operators on the ground are checking that there's no parameter out of limits that would trigger an escape inadvertently. So you don't want to turn on the system only to have it immediately uh, fire the capsule off. So the first thing they're doing is making sure every, all the parameters are stable, the telemetry is good, um, there's no noisy signals in the data that would inadvertently trigger it, uh, and then you'll then you arm the system. And then once it's armed, there's the automated abort, and then there's also a manual abort. So um, I don't know that you can see it in the camera views we have, but there's a handle that sits between Woody and uh, Steve that you can reach, you rotate and pull, that will manually initiate an abort. Um, and so retraction. just very similar to an injection seat where you pull Correct. the handle. Correct, retraction complete. I mean, that's a big responsibility for the commander and pilot if you had to pull that handle. I mean, that's a, you don't want to do that unless you're right. absolutely and certain exactly. you to get out of there. Exactly, there. and so there's a the few cases, or if uh, that's why earlier they did all those checks on the, uh, the loops to make sure that the people on the ground that have the insight to the status of the F-9 and the Dragon have the ability to talk to the crew. So if there's a failure of the automated system that someone could tell the crew to manual initiate, or there might be some scenarios where the crew may notice something first um, and, and manually initiate. In just a few seconds, we're going to hear Dragon to Ground and that announcement for Dragon, go for SpaceX, Section, you section go 7. For section 6. And Dragon, uh, SpaceX, close visors. you are go for Section 6. Close visors and arm launch escape system. Okay, Section 6. Right All right, Section 6 is in work. I think it used to be 7, though. It is, yeah. So uh, which it's a great sign that they're constantly, like we talked about before. SpaceX, Dragon, and visors are closed constantly learning and making changes to procedures. Right. Earlier tonight, we saw a lot of work happening in parallel for the first time. So we had a lot of margin left over. And there you can see the white room exposed to the elements outside. Uh, SpaceX, uh, Dragon, arming and launch escape system. Okay, so that's uh, Steve telling them that they're SpaceX copies. initiating the command, like we mentioned. They'll do it. Actually, you can hear this. You can definitely hear this uh, and feel it in the vehicle. There's some uh, valves that are opening that are to the Super Dracos, which are the engines that would fire to initiate an abort, and those valves are safe until this point. So this command is essentially unsafing those valves, and you can very, very definitely hear and feel that inside the capsule. Those Super Draco engines you mentioned, Raja, capable of moving Dragon half a mile in just 7.5 seconds, equivalent to a peak velocity of 436 miles per hour. Such a tremendous focus on safety Watch because the astronaut lives armed. are in the hands of SpaceX and they want to get them out of there as fast as possible yeah, if there were to be an it's abort. It's an impressive system. Um, so actually d we did a flight test of the, the abort system before Demo 2 and that was that was impressive to see that thing work. And yeah, just a strong testament. I think one of the key things of the commercial crew program of having launch abort systems on both the Starliner and the Dragon, just a testament to how much we've learned over the years of space flight and, and the try to make it as safe as we can going forward. You heard the call from uh, SpaceX confirming that the the launch escape system is armed, so the next big thing now that it's armed, now it is safe to start loading prop once they get the go for that. If there were a pad abort, 
It would take the Dragon capsule two and a half miles east of Pad A into the Atlantic Ocean. Dragon would come down under its parachutes, land in the ocean. It could take about four hours to remove the crew. We have uh, assets with the Air Force called Detachment 3. Yep, Death 3 is what they call it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so there's uh, what's called uh, PJs or pararescue jumpers. Um, so we use a myriad of assets, uh, the Air Force and Navy help support these launches uh, on both coasts. Um, and uh, basically the C-17, C-130s, helicopters, PJs, uh, it's quite a, quite a group. And all the more reason we have to look at that whole weather in a port corridor to have that ready uh, if, we need, if we need help. Yeah, because if they landed in the Atlantic Ocean, it would take, them, take some time to get there. We've got assets along the eastern seaboard could take about six to eight hours. So you want those seas to be calm exactly. and not bobbing around in the ocean for that long. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, we're getting ready to get that propellant load started. And once they start that load, you'll see they're making calls uh, for different phases of load, like the locks, the helium, different things. And the reason they're doing that is, again, you can hear that and feel it inside the vehicle as different valves open and close. Um, you can hear uh, hear the sounds of fluid flowing, hear, feel some different vibrations. Uh, and so that's why they're calling those, that so the crew is aware of uh, if something's nominal or off nominal. If you hear a sound without a call, that could make you worry. So that way you know, like, okay, that's the one that we expected to, you know, that valve was supposed to open or supposed to close. Mm. Propellant load has started. Okay, and there we have the call that propellant load has begun. A big milestone as we count down to liftoff. Now T minus 34 minutes and counting. Today we'll begin the next six month rotation mission to the International Space Station. The launch escape system is armed which happened just before we began the loading the propellant onto Falcon 9. Meanwhile, the Dragon capsule was loaded with its propellants about a week and a half ago, just a few miles down the road at a facility SpaceX calls Dragon Land. In order to fly, Dragon needs a fuel and an oxidizer. For the fuel, SpaceX uses monomethyl hydrogen, or MMH, and nitrogen tetroxide, or NTO, for oxidizer, and together, these propellants feed those Draco engines that maneuver Dragon, Dragon rather, on orbit, as well as the eight Super Draco engines that would power the launch escape system in an abort scenario. And again, now that the fueling for Falcon 9 has started, that means the eight Super Draco engines inside Crew Dragon are ready, if needed, to launch the capsule away from the Falcon 9 rocket in an instant should there be any kind of emergency associated with the rocket or the pad. Of course, NASA and SpaceX trains extensively for exactly that type of contingency. So now let's head over to SpaceX commentator Kate Tice at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne for an operations update. Kate. Thanks, Daryl. Yeah, exactly right. We're continuing to count down the final minutes. Everything's still looking good for Falcon 9 and Dragon, with the teams reporting no major issues at this time. Uh, now, with the launch escape system armed and Falcon 9 propellant loading underway, we are heading for an on-time launch just under 33 minutes from now. As we saw earlier, or rather heard, Falcon 9 propellant load began at T minus 35 minutes. Daryl did a great job of explaining uh, the propellants on Dragon. Let's talk a little bit about the propellants on Falcon 9. Slightly different. The first and second stages of Falcon 9 are each loaded with two liquid propellants. One is fuel, loaded, loaded into a tank at the bottom of the stage. The other, an oxidizer, loaded into a tank at the top of the stage. The fuel that we use to power the Merlin engines is a refined kerosene, referred to as RP-1 or Rocket Propellant 1. The oxidizer loaded on each stage is a densified liquid oxygen, or LOX. Densified meaning that it's kept much colder than typical for launch vehicles. Therefore, it takes up less volume, which allows for us to put more of that oxidizer into the first and second stages. 
To ignite the fuel and the oxidizer in the Merlin rocket engine, we use the ignition fluids of triethyl aluminum and triethyl boron, also called T-TEB. Now, when T-TEB comes into contact with oxygen, it burns, giving off a green-colored flame. Once we have the flame going, we add a little bit of that kerosene fuel into the Merlin chamber, and the engine ramps up to full power. Now, actually, you might see that green flash just as the second stage engine ignites following stage separation. Now, topping off helium into pressure vessels on both stages also underway. This is used to pressurize the tanks in flight as propellant is pulled out by the Merlin turbo pumps. You can think of this uh, similar to when you're drinking out of a plastic water bottle. You have to put some air back into the bottle in order to keep it from crumpling. So that's exactly what we're doing with that helium. On board the spacecraft, the astronauts are monitoring the systems while propellants are loaded into the Falcon 9 below them. The crew's training in the simulator here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, actually includes playback of sounds recorded in Dragon capsules during recent flights. So uh, even though today is the first day they're hearing it live, they are prepared for these new sounds. Now the range continues to report no problems. Stage one cryo helium loading has started. They are go to support launch. Weather also continues to look great. Currently winds from the west-southwest at nine miles per hour, great conditions. We only have a 5% probability of violation for those constraints, so all in all looking good. As I mentioned earlier today, we have an instantaneous launch time. So at this point, if we hear a hold for any reason, we'll have to stand down and target our backup launch opportunity, which is tomorrow, just under 24 hours from tonight's planned launch. Now at T minus 30 minutes and six seconds, let's turn it over to Jesse and Gary for an overview of events that we'll see after liftoff. Thanks, Kate. For crew six, the astronauts flight to station will take about 25 hours. Now, as we wait for that T zero mark in just under 30 minutes, the ground operations teams are doing a series of system checks to make sure that both the Dragon and the Falcon 9 are ready for launch. You're looking at a live view of our teams at the Cape as they prepare for liftoff. Now, as we wait for that launch clock to hit zero, we wanted to give you an overview of what the ascent portion of the mission is going to look like. Once we hit T0 and a successful launch occurs, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon lift off from historic launch pad 39A and make their ascent. At about 50 seconds into flight, Falcon 9's engines will throttle down to help pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket, or what we typically refer to as max Q. It's worth noting that once we hit max Q, the vehicle will be going supersonic. Now, once we are through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, we can throttle up our nine Merlin engines again. From there, at about two and a half minutes into flight, we have a series of three events that will happen in rapid succession. First is MECO, or main engine cutoff. This is where all nine Merlin 1D engines shut off in preparation for stage separation, which is our second event. This is where the first stage detaches from the second stage, with the first stage making its way back to Earth for landing, as the second stage continues its journey with the third event, SES-1, or second stage engine start number one, where the MVAC engine lights up and propel propels the second stage, along with our Crew-6 astronauts, into orbit. As stage two heads towards its targeted drop-off orbit, stage one will execute two burns in order to make its way back down to Earth. The first is the entry burn. That's where three of the M1D engines will reignite and then shut down again. This helps to slow the stage down in preparation for entry back into the Earth's atmosphere. And while that first stage is heading back to Earth, the second stage will cut off its one Merlin engine that was ignited right after stage separation. Once this happens, we'll wait for a confirmation of a good orbital insertion. About 90 seconds after Dragon gets into orbit, Falcon 9 will land back on Earth. The landing burn is just a single engine burn, but it's powerful enough to bring the vehicle speed down rapidly in order to land on the drone ship at about nine and a half minutes into the mission. While Falcon 9 first stage is landing, Dragon is preparing to separate from the second stage. At about three minutes after the second stage gets into orbit, we should have a great view of Dragon with its four-person crew drifting away from the second stage. 
Once Dragon is a short distance away, it'll begin checking out its Draco maneuvering thrusters to make sure Dragon continues to increase separation distance from that second stage. It's worth noting that these are not the Super Draco engines that would be used during an abort scenario. About 40 seconds after separation, Dragon's nose cone deploy sequence will begin. It will take roughly four minutes for the nose cone hooks to unlatch and open, exposing its guidance navigation controls that will help Dragon autonomously fly to the space station. And lastly, once the nose cone is deployed, the remaining Draco thrusters on the forward bulkhead will be checked. From there, over the next 25 hours, Dragon will be on its approach and rendezvous phases, undergoing a number of phasing burns as it makes its way to the station. And all of that will be coming up soon, but for now, let's check back in with Courtney in Mission Control Houston. Courtney. Thanks, Gary. The flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston are laser focused on the onboard systems of the space station, ensuring it is ready to receive Crew Dragon. They're also making sure all communication links between the station, Dragon, and the ground are working properly. The consensus to this point is that everything is proceeding right on track. The team here in Mission Control Houston, the team in Hawthorne, and the astronauts aboard the space station will monitor the autonomous docking of the Dragon spacecraft tomorrow. They'll perform a series of leak checks then work to open the hatches on both the Dragon side and inside the station's pressurized mating adapter. We expect hatch opening to take place about an hour and a half after docking. And once Did on board, the astronauts will be greeted by the space station crew and will then join in for welcoming remarks for the new crew members. From there on out, they will no longer be referred to as Crew 6, but rather as flight engineers of the International Space Station until their return back to Earth. Here in Mission Control Houston, Flight Director Chris Dobbins is on console overseeing the team for launch. And that'll do it from here in Mission Control Houston, so I'll toss it back over to our team in Florida. Daryl, how's it looking? Thank you very much, Courtney, and we're out here at the Kennedy Space Center. Folks are gathering on the lawn now, getting ready for this launch, and it's a beautiful sight behind yep. us, Raja. It's looking pretty good. Uh, it's a great view, and looking forward to seeing my first launch and watching another turtle go to space. Yeah, we're going to watch the launch, and we're going to watch you. <laughs> <laughs> see, see your reaction. Well, if you're just joining us, we are T-minus 24 minutes and counting now until the 6th astronaut rotation mission to the International Space Station under NASA's Commercial Crew Program. Commander Stephen Bowen, pilot Woody Hoberg, and mission specialist Sultan al Niyadi and Andrei Fedyev are strapped into their seats inside Dragon Endeavor. Uh, they're in that capsule right there as the Falcon 9 rocket fueling operation is well underway. The launch escape system is armed, and that means Dragon is prepared to launch itself away from the Falcon 9 in case of an emergency on the pad or after liftoff. So far, operations look and sound as expected, counting down to that liftoff at 1.45 and three seconds a.m. Eastern time. Yep, and we heard uh, the call from the core that the stage two cryohelium load had started and like they described out at Hawthorne, so far what we've loaded is the gas to pressurize the tanks uh, around uh, probably about three-ish minutes from now we'll actually start the gas itself so like they're describing we need what you need you need uh, pressure to move the gas and then you need the actual gas in the locks itself so um, right now we're we are load or they are loading that helium that pressurizes the tanks and then the next thing will be the the fuel and then the oxidizer those inert gases key to pressurizing those especially the locks this mission is the continuation of rotational crew flights to the International Space Station from U.S. soil on private rockets and spacecraft, and it would have been possible without the success of, of course, NASA SpaceX Demo 2, that test flight, now two, two and a half years ago. Of course, it was the safe delivery and return of crews one and two that got the operational flights rolling. There you can see inside the Dragon. You can see there... Uh, Visors are down and will stay down now since the uh, LES is armed. And you can see they're also not riding or doing anything more at this point <coughs> with, with the LES arm armed. Uh, you just have to wait uh, until they're done with that, the prop loading. Yep. And you can see now evidence that that liquid oxygen is flowing into that first stage as it super chills the outer skin of the rocket. And it, then it, um, you know, condenses the... Florida humid air <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> into a little bit of a cloud there.
talking about the crew inside. The commander of Crew 6 is Captain Stephen Bowen. He hails from Cohasset, Massachusetts. He's married with three children. He holds the title of first U.S. Navy submarine officer to be selected as a mission specialist by NASA. Captain Bowen is also a veteran of NASA space flights, including space shuttle flights on STS-126, 132, and 133. And Steve's a veteran spacewalker and just a great veteran to have the off around the office uh, and great uh, commander to have for, for three rookies. Um, he's just, uh, and I think what we've learned about submarines is they're a lot like a space station. Uh, Kayla, who is also a submarine, are, uh, likes to say that both things are you know, putting people where people aren't meant to be and a lot of the systems uh, and ways you have to work together are very similar. And you need good people working together in those tight quarters. Sitting next to Stephen is pilot Warren Woody Hoberg. The 37-year-old is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He studied aeronautics and astronautics from MIT before getting a doctorate in electrical engineering and computer science from the University of California, Berkeley. During grad school, Hoberg worked as an EMT with the Yosemite Search and Rescue. I've seen pictures of him on a rope uh, <laughs> scaling Half Dome. Crew 6 will be Hoberg's first flight since NASA selected him to be an astronaut in 2017. He is one sharp fellow, but also a great guy. Yeah, and also a turtle, so <laughs> proud to see him going up there uh, as yet another member of our, uh, and, and super excited. Woody, like you said, just amazingly brilliant, uh, but also just so operationally sound. Uh, you know, his time working as a, basically rescuing people from ridiculous places. Right. I mean, uh, we're not talking run of the mill, like, you know, no. off a ski slope. We're talking like off of rock faces and cliffs and just some, yeah, crazy stuff and doing that and carrying someone else with you who's injured right. is, not, is no joke. High risk rescues and it's uh, incredible what he's been able to accomplish before becoming an astronaut. In the role of mission specialist is astronaut Sultan Al Niyadi. Stage two, RP-1 load complete. Okay, we heard the RP-1 complete in the stage two. Stage one will continue going all the way down to around T minus six minutes. Back to Sultan. He was chosen by the Mohammed bin Rashid, Rashid Space Center of the United Arab Emirates to be part of Expeditions 68-69. The father of five spent most of his life in Al Ain and Abu Dhabi. But in 2020, he traded it all in for astronaut training in Houston at NASA's Johnson Space Center. And this will be his first trip to space. Yeah, and so important uh, to have our UAE partners with us, uh, the first long duration UAE flight. So what a historic moment for UAE and for NASA to be working in partnership with them. Uh, like you heard uh, Hazad mention earlier, Sultan and him had trained together at Roscosmos, now trained together here. And it's uh, cool to see Sultan now going up there uh, on a U.S. commercial rocket to go to, the, to go to the space station. And now we just heard the call. The strong back chill has begun. And you can see the condensing of the outside air, that super chilled liquid oxygen, both chilling the rocket and, of course, the venting of that LOX going out into the air. Our next mission specialist, Andrei Fedyev. It's also his first trip to space for the second mission specialist. He's a Roscosmos cosmonaut, and he will be working to monitor the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and re-entry phases of flight. He will be a flight engineer for Expedition 68. And yeah, considering the partnership uh, with cosmonauts riding on uh, Dragons and uh, U.S. astronauts riding on Soyuz, so uh, great to see that continuing, and Andre, the latest uh, cosmonaut heading up on a Dragon. And happy birthday to him, yeah. he turns 42. What a way to celebrate. Each of these four crew members will be part of the Expedition 68 once they arrive at the uh, International Space Station. At this moment, Raja, what's the crew feeling? I think it's uh, hoping that everything continues. Uh, you've trained so long for this. Um, you obviously don't want to get what's called go fever, you know, when meaning you're going to ignore a problem, but you're just uh, kind of just hoping that there's not any problems that pop up at this point. And most of it's honestly out of your control, So, you're, but uh, you have complete trust in the team. Um, this is uh, where, you know, the reason we've trained so long and trained with the, these actual operators, the same people who are in the loops, is uh, if there are any issues, you can hear it in their voices. You've, you've worked with them, you know them. Um, complete confidence in the, the JSC and, and MCCX, the Hawthorne teams, 
and just actually looking to looking forward to actually getting to execute what you've trained so long to do. It makes sense. So much work and so much effort over the years has gone in to get to this point. You want to keep going. Yep. Yeah, and it's uh, and I think right now just the final. My guess is what they're trying talking through is so again on those displays uh, they're probably looking forward a few events and talking through those and so specifically they are probably talking through the different launch abort phases. So you'll hear once they actually t lift off, you'll hear Stephen calling one A, one B, two A. Those are the different launch abort stages. And what they are probably talking through right now is the timing of that, what things they're looking for on the displays, and just again re you know, sort of rehearsing as much as you can, because once it happens, it, it happens really quick. Um, so you're just kind of running through things over and over again. Um, the other thing there. Start of stage two locks load. All right. So, so there's the start of the locks being loaded on stage two. You heard the call there, so things still progressing well. And so the crew has a, a timeline of these events. So they're also, that's another way they can kind of QC if things are, proceeding, maybe it's, if the fuel is taking longer or slower to slow, so they're kind of comparing what where they're sitting on the clock versus those calls and gives them a sense of how things are going. But there's no immediate direct telemetry in the Dragon capsule that tells you all the subsystems in the F-9 rocket. You're relying on the timing and some cues and listening to these calls to know what's going on with the rocket itself. Once it launches, you have telemetry on the F-9 engines, the status of the throttling command. So he talked about uh, out at Hawthorne, the max Q event and the throttle down. You can see that. You can feel it. Um, and actually, that was probably what I thought uh, as one of the coolest things about our launch was that uh, I f we could feel and hear the throttle down before we saw it in the telemetry. So for all the automation and all the coolness of electronics, I thought it was amazing and very <laughs> awesome that the person is still <laughs> could still beat the machine. How about um, that? But uh, so that's kind of what they're, since they don't have that insight to the F-9 rocket, they're relying on the calls and the timing uh, as they are sitting here now and uh, just making sure everything's on track. Critical communications to the astronauts so they know exactly what's going on, as Raja mentioned. If you're outside and getting ready to watch this launch, you can hear it on the radio. It'll be available on local amateur VHF radio frequency 146.940 megahertz and on the UHF radio frequency 444.925 megahertz FM mode heard within Brevard County on the Space Coast. So the next thing uh, you should be, as we get closer to 10 minutes, they're going to make sure the launch displays are set up. And the reason they're going to do that is because once the launch happens, uh, you have the ability to, that all the displays are touch screen, so you can change them and move them, but you don't want to be doing that during launch. And so there's a check in there to make sure you have all the views you want. Um, generally, what I'm guessing they'll do is they'll scroll on the procedure to where they expect to, uh, to so they don't have to scroll while they're you know, under G's. Um, they'll make sure that the mission specialists have the views that they need. You can see Andre is actually reaching up there right now. So they'll uh, kind of check to make sure that their line of sight is not obstructed. Um, and that uh, one more check of probably the volume control of their seats. That everyone can hear each other. Um, maybe give it a few clicks to account for the fact that it's going to get a little louder after launch. All right, let's get another update from uh, SpaceX and uh, check in with Kate Tice. Thanks, Daryl. We are T minus 13 minutes and 47 seconds from launch. Everything's still looking good for tonight's Falcon 9 launch for Dragon Crew 6. If you've been following along, you know that Falcon 9 began propellant load at T minus 35 minutes. Loading of the RP-1 fuel on the second stage is complete. That finished around T minus 20 minutes. Fuel loading on the first stage continues. It's approximately 75% full and will finish around T minus six minutes. Densified liquid oxygen loading is underway on both the first and second stages. Uh, they are looking about 80% full on the first stage and just under 10% on the second stage. That will wrap up at T minus three minutes and T minus two minutes respectively. Checkouts of the thrust vector controllers, what we call TVC wiggles, those are coming up. That's basically when we use those thrust vector controllers to slightly move each engine nozzle. That's what allows Falcon 9 to steer itself during ascent. Dragon mission director and team reporting no major issues at this time. Communication checkouts are complete. The crew access arm is retracted, as you can see there on your screen. It's nowhere in sight. The crew access arm, uh, excuse me, the launch escape system is armed and the crew is strapped into their seats and ready to go to space. 
Final instructions to the crew will come at T minus 10 minutes. The crew displays will be configured for launch. That setup gives the crew insight into how the launch is proceeding and provides constant updates on vehicle health. You can see the crew there on the right hand side of your screen now looking pretty comfortable. At T minus five minutes, we'll be in terminal count and Dragon will then transition to internal power. We'll hear continued call outs on the countdown net as we continue to get closer to liftoff. As for the range, they remain green for launch, ready to go. Weather also still looking really good. Winds down to four miles per hour coming from the west. Um, only a 5% chance of violation for the criteria. So uh, continues to look good. I'm sure if it was daylight, it would probably be a cloudless sky for the most part there at Kennedy Space Center. So with that in mind, let's go back to Daryl at Kennedy as we continue to approach liftoff just under 11 and a half minutes from now. All right, good call outs there, Kate, appreciate that. Some final thoughts from the commander of Crew 3 before we watch Crew 6 lift yeah, off. It's a, it's a great time to be here. You'll, you'll hear them in a few minutes uh, when they make the 10 minute call and confirm their displays are ready. Uh, the crew will probably give a message thanking folks and just uh, the thoughts on their mind. There's a lot of work and a lot of people that have worked a long time to get them here. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty special moment. And when uh, they lift off, they'll be 260 miles over southwest of New Zealand. And with that, we want to focus on the pad now as we proceed through the final stretch of the countdown. We'll turn it over to Gary and Kate at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California to take us through launch and ascent. Thanks, Daryl. The energy is certainly starting to grow as we get closer and closer to T0. As you can see the vehicle there at pad 39A, that's Falcon 9 with the Dragon capsule positioned on top. Now we're gonna go through a couple of things, including some physical changes to the pad, um, but you will likely hear a number of callouts um, after liftoff uh, that are basically indicative of the various abort modes um, that Dragon passed through during flight. Now T minus 10 minutes. Dragon, SpaceX, confirmed crew displays are configured for launch. Uh, SpaceX Dragon crew displays are configured for launch. SpaceX right. copies. On behalf of our entire team at SpaceX, we're honored to we are honored to have you aboard Dragon Capsule Endeavor today for its next trip to the International Space Station. We wish you a great mission, good luck, Godspeed, and enjoy the ride. And thank you very much for those kind words. We'd like to thank all the trainers, technicians, engineers, decision makers, and planners who have uh, defined our mission ahead and trained us and then given the faith in us to execute that mission, and Crew 6 is ready to launch. And those words coming from the crew, Crew 6 inside the Dragon right now, under nine minutes from launch, those final instructions meaning we are in terminal count. Falcon 9 launch commit criteria is getting checked by the computers. And we're in the final stretch here inside 10 minutes until liftoff. Kate was mentioning a series of uh, number and letter combinations that you'll hear upon ascent once we get to that point. That'll be those uh, Abort, different abort modes that we'll be tracking throughout the ascent. There's an Alpha and, and Bravo on the first stage, and there's 2A through 2E on the second stage uh, as we track it up the eastern seaboard. Right now coming up on T minus eight minutes, the next major milestone that we'll be hearing uh, will be about the uh, engine chill. That's right. That's a um, important step of the countdown. That's basically when at T minus seven minutes, uh, we will uh, open the pre-valves of the engines to allow a little bit of the super chilled liquid oxygen into the Merlin turbo pumps. 
uh, prior to the full flow of LOX that occurs during ignition. Now, that's important because at this point in time, um, all the hardware is at ambient temperature. So by f opening the pre-valves and flowing a little bit of that super chilled uh, densified liquid oxygen helps um, prepare the hardware for that colder temperature when the full flow of LOX occurs. We should hear that call out in about 10 seconds. Engine chill. And there's that call out indicating that those pre-valves have been opened and now there's a little bit of that super chilled liquid oxygen flowing through the hardware, uh, basically chilling it out uh, on prior to liftoff. That's right, in the meantime, we're tracking fuel on the vehicle. Stage two RP1, or the fuel on the second stage is complete. It's one of the earlier tanks to be completely filled in the countdown. But as we ch are, uh, continue to track the fuel loading, the next thing uh, will be the stage one, stage one RP1 RP load. load complete. That's coming up here in about 15 seconds. Later in the countdown, we'll be tracking the um, tanks of oxidizer being completely filled. That RP1 load is now complete on the first stage. So at this point in time, all RP1 is now on Falcon 9, both for the first and second stages. LOX load continues, wrapping up at about T minus three minutes for first stage and T minus two minutes for the second stage. Coming up, we'll hear the call for Dragon to... Dragon, SpaceX, for awareness, we are seeing a T-tab load issue and are troubleshooting. We are currently still go, but have further evaluation before making a final decision. We'll get you a final read before T-0. And SpaceX, Dragon, got and if you're just joining us, welcome here to the launch pad. You're looking at a live view of Launch Complex 39A at NASA Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We are T-minus five minutes, three seconds, and counting. And you just heard there that they are working a T-TEB issue. We're going to continue listening in to Mission Control Net as we continue through the count, uh, as they do still have four minutes until that final go, no-go for launch. Let's continue to listen in. Take a moment and share out the stream as we count down T minus four minutes, 43 seconds and counting until liftoff. Back, which is the white structure there to the right of the rocket, we will see the clamps open just under those clamps, just under the dragon trunk. Those will begin to open and the strong back will retract away from the vehicle. Yeah, that's right. We'll see those clamps on the top of the structure there, just under the dragon's trunk, which you can identify by the black uh, solar panels on the left of the base of the capsule itself and to the right. Uh, and then the structure itself will lean about two degrees, uh, and then it will retract the rest of the way once dragon actually hits that T-zero mark and lifts off. We're seeing those clamps being undone now. The two degree lean will be very subtle, and then you'll see it more when we hit that T-zero mark. That's right, at liftoff, Falcon 9 will, or excuse me, the TE will actually um, retract to 45 degrees to clear the way for Falcon 9. That TE is basically what uh, attaches, has the umbilicals that attach to the vehicle that provide power, telemetry, and fluids prior to liftoff. Now coming up in 10 seconds, we'll be listening for a call on stage one liquid oxygen load being complete. Dragon is in terminal count and on internal power. T 
Not as two minutes this thirty is the seconds. This LD on countdown one. Hold, hold, hold. We are standing down due to due to a T-tab ground issue. As you just heard, we Off have. Support has started. As you just heard, we have a hold tonight uh, due to the T-tab issue that I mentioned prior. And the Dragon SpaceX with that call from LD, you are go to step into five decimal one hundred launch scrub. Five decimal one hundred launch scrub. That's in work. As with everything else, we are prepared for all scenarios, including, unfortunately, as we've seen tonight, a scrub. So the teams are now stepping into those procedures. That's right. Again, it was uh, the teams were tracking a uh, ground issue with TTEB. That's the ignition fluid uh, that actually uh, sparks with the oxidizer and allows the engines to uh, fire. The teams were tracking this issue. And so we're in a nominal scrub configuration. We'll start to see sort of the, a sequence of uh, reversing some of the milestones we've been tracking as part of this countdown until the uh, crew axis arm swings back to the side hatch. And so the, hatch will, the crew can egress the vehicle as part. And if you're just joining us, welcome here to the launch pad. You're looking at a live view of Launch Complex 39A at NASA Kennedy Space Center, where less than two minutes on the clock, we have had a launch abort and scrub due to today's launch being an instantaneous launch window for Dragon to make it to the International Space Station. Those three astronauts and one cosmonaut will not be leaving Earth today. This is due to a T-TEB issue. SpaceX crews were working. We do have another opportunity for launch tomorrow, just under 24 hours away. We will, of course, be live. We're going to continue listening in to the nets to hear, but uh, at this time we're waiting for the crew access arm to uh, extend back to the Crew Dragon capsule. The pad support teams will make their way back out to the pad to support the crew exiting Crew Dragon Endeavor. But unfortunately, if you're just joining us, no launch today. Crew 6 staying on Earth for one more day due to a T-TEB issue. Uh, the teams will obviously work this issue, visit the pad if they need to, and hopefully go for another attempt today. Uh, we'll keep you updated over on our Twitter, TLPN underscore official. Make sure you're following us uh, online over there. We'll bring updates to you. Uh, also on our website, tlpnetwork.com, we'll do a live update blog uh, on updates as we get them. But uh, if you're just joining us, launch scrubbed with just two minutes left on the clock due to a T-TEB issue. You could hear it from uh, some of the crew, the commander there, uh, you know, a little bit of... In, LD on countdown one. At this time, our offloads are underway. Vehicle is safe and proceeding not only with offload. Expecting about a 50-minute offload. Perfect Dragon copies about a 5-0-minute offload. And we'll be sitting here waiting. Thanks. You can hear it in the commander's voice. They thought they were going. Uh, it's going to take about 50 minutes for them to offload the propellant that is on Falcon 9, and then the crew access arm will come back. They will be exit to exit the vehicle, uh, and then we get to do this all again, hopefully tomorrow, if they can fix that issue. If not, we will roll the date until we get this crew off the ground, but of course we want safety first. That is why uh, this mission has launch has been scrubbed for today. If it was your first time here, though, welcome here at the launch pad. It's our mission to inform and inspire the explorers of tomorrow because we believe that space is better together and we bring you full live launch coverage of all the missions not only nasa and spacex but all of them around the world so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss our next crew six launch coverage but also any other launch undocking docking docking undocking uh, and return to earth coverage right here on the launch pad if you're also a fan of space news check out the launch pad news youtube channel that's where all of our space updates and interviews go later this week you're gonna be able to see it. a great interview we had with one of the directors of the UK Space Agency. We also sat down with Copenhagen Suborbital for an update on their parachute recovery system and an update on what their path to launch 
uh, will be. So stay tuned for both of those interviews. We'll continue to listen in to NASA Control uh, as we uh, unfortunately have had a scrub at Launch Complex 39A at NASA Kennedy Space Center. You can continue to send in your questions by tagging us at the launch pad. We'll work on answering those through the rest of the evening, but I know for many of us here in North America, smack in the middle of the night. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, we get to do this all again, but uh, space is hard and safety is number one. So uh, ultimately, the scrub was the best option, uh, but let's continue to listen in to updates from NASA and SpaceX as they begin to offload all of the propellant from Falcon 9 uh, due to today's scrub. to T0. Now we're working our way through nominal um, scrub uh, procedures, which include offloading the fuel and oxidizer that are loaded on the Falcon 9 right now. Uh, you can see we made our way through the countdown to a strong back retract that has been put back into place and the clamps uh, just under the trunk of Dragon are now uh, in uh, their configuration that they were prior to uh, that part of the countdown. And Kate, we're making our way through offloading that uh, Falcon 9. That's right. In total, that prop offload is expected to take 50 minutes, 5-0. So unfortunately, at this point in time, there's not a whole lot that the crew there can do except patiently wait. I could imagine that they might be a little sad as of um, because the, otherwise they, they would be in space at this point, <laughs> effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, right now, they, as you can see, they are just sitting back and relaxing um, as the Falcon 9 teams on the ground continue to keep them updated. Um, as Gary said, this is a nominal scrub uh, procedure uh, or configuration. We have procedures listing out every step of this. So right now we are basically unfueling Falcon 9 from both the first and second stages uh, as Falcon 9 was nearly fully loaded at the time of the scrub. So as this continues, we will see some puffs of white clouds like you just saw there live um, as that detanking effectively is underway. Um, we will also see the crew access arm uh, go back into the service position uh, that will enable the uh, basically the pad team to re-enter the pad, go back up and help the four astronauts that are currently there in the capsule um, basically unbuckle and, 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 and um, get out of the capsule and make their way back down to the ground. And it is going to be a methodical process. Like you said, Kate, the uh through the fueling that began at T minus 35 minutes, we made our way uh, quite a bit through the timeline and those tanks were pretty full. So 
The ground teams estimated a 50 minute, five zero minute offload of that fuel. In the meantime, the Crew-6 astronauts are in a passive state. They'll be tracking the fuel offloading process and listening to the communications from the ground teams, giving them status updates along the way. Uh, but we are in a nominal configuration. In the meantime, they've taken the uh, Dragon Falcon 9 off of internal power and re-enabled auxiliary power back into the vehicle uh, as they continue to go through this process. And like you said, Kate, it'll be, uh, it'll be a little bit, and then we'll see that crew access arm swing back, uh, and they'll re-access the side hatch. If you were following along on our coverage, uh, they walk down the crew access arm and enter the Dragon through that side hatch. They'll be exiting the same way. Uh, in the meantime, through this whole process, the crew uh, and the Dragon itself will remain with the LES, the uh, Launch Escape System, armed. Uh, so the, if in any event something were to happen as part of the offloading process, they'll be able to escape using the Super Draco engines, the eight Super Dracos that are on the Dragon. Uh, it'll be a pad of bore over into the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but for now, all the ground teams are tracking uh, that everything is nominal, the fuel offload is going as planned as part of a normal scrub, uh, and we're just continuing to follow along. That's right. And one thing I want to mention, uh, although this is not what we had hoped to happen today, um, and while we said that this is a nominal uh, abort configuration, uh, technically the crew and the launch teams have already practiced this very similar scenario. On Thursday, February 23rd, um, the integrated launch operations teams, along with the astronauts, um, performed a full dry dress rehearsal, which basically means a, a, a total dress rehearsal, including suit up, uh, transporting to the pad, going up the elevators in the crew tower, down the crew access arm and ingressing into the capsule, um, and basically doing a full rehearsal of launch day um, as if it were real, but no no propellant involved. So that's why it's called a dry dress rehearsal because there, there was no propellant involved. Um, so technically, this is very similar to what they would have done on Thursday in terms of uh, simulating that, that scrub and basically having their teams go back up into the crew uh, tower and retrieve the astronauts from the capsule. So at this point in time, we are following along with the procedures for this unfortunate scrub, um, but everything continues to track nominally for this activity. Um, right now, for those that have recently joined, uh, we had a hold called on the countdown at about T minus two and a half minutes. Um, the crew had reported around T minus five minutes, or excuse me, the ground teams uh, had, uh, the SpaceX ground teams had reported around T minus five minutes an issue with the T-TEB, um, which is the, um, uh, basically the stuff that we use to ignite the engines on the first stage. Uh, so the, out of an abundance of caution, the teams called that hold at T minus two and a half minutes and uh, then proceeded into nominal off um, detanking or, or basically um, unloading the vehicle with all of its propellants. Um, given the fact that that occurred at T minus uh, two and a half minutes, uh, the Dragon, majority the of the propellants load. were already propellant on the vehicle. Load update. Propellant, load. propellant offload update. Go ahead. Offloads are proceeding nominally, anticipating another half hour until closeout. Understand, look at about a half hour until closeout. Three copy, thank you. of the propellant offloading. Uh, we heard Commander Steve Bowen um, sounding pretty unbothered by everything. Like I mentioned before, uh, everything is written down in the procedure. They practiced uh, this very similar egress procedure during Thursday night's dry dress rehearsal. So all in all, um, everything continuing nominally there for uh, this, these next steps. As I mentioned before, uh, we will see eventually the crew access arm swing back into the service position and we will have the the pad teams re-enter um, the the pad area and and basically enable the astronauts to egress i also mentioned earlier that our backup launch opportunity is um, about the same time tomorrow um, roughly 24 hours uh, after our initial t0 
due to the fact that we were launching uh, the crew that you see there on the right hand side of your screen. They were headed to the International Space Station um, as such that is down to the very second in terms of catching up to the International Space Station when launching from uh, from Kennedy Space Center. So um, when it comes to crew launches, there's only one shot. Um, and so therefore due to that scrub that was called at T minus two and a half minutes, uh, that was our only opportunity to launch today. That's right, Kay. And uh, as you mentioned, that scrub would be 24 hours. Uh, so we'll get to do this all over again. You mentioned the dry dress rehearsal uh, with a nominal offload of the fuel for this particular scrub. This is almost like a wet dress rehearsal, just taking it one step uh, further. As you mentioned, for the dry dress, they did everything that we saw today, driving out to the pad, going up the elevators, and uh, making their way into the vehicle, buckling up. The seats rotated, uh, and they made their way far into the countdown, but, but before they started fueling the vehicle. Now uh, they fueled the vehicle prior to launch, and again, we're following a scrub at the, that was occurred at about 2 minutes and 30 seconds prior to the T0 time. Uh, due to tracking a, uh, a ground issue with the T-TEB ignition fluid that's used on the engines to ignite them and uh, fire the crew into orbit and eventually catching up with the International Space Station. Uh, but as they were continuing to look at this issue, decided to declare a scrub for today. That scrub is again a nominal scrub, um, so we'll be going through uh, the scrub procedures, which include the detanking. They seem to be going a little faster than originally predicted. They called out to the crew about five zero minutes. Now we're inside 30 minutes uh, from detanking the Falcon 9. That means the RP-1 uh, refined kerosene and the liquid oxygen, that's the, the densified liquid oxygen that's on board is uh, being brought back into the lines that fuel them. Uh, so we'll be emptying those tanks. You can still see some of the oxygen, some of the gaseous oxygen billowing off the Falcon 9 rocket itself. So there is a little bit of fuel in there. You're seeing some of the puffs that are part of the detanking process. In the meantime, just a reminder that that launch escape system is armed through the whole thing just to keep the crew safe. But you see, for the crew themselves, it's a very passive experience, the launch scrub, all of these commands being issued by the teams on the ground. Um, They'll continue to wait uh, until uh, and, and get status updates from the ground teams. Uh, right now, they are uh, connected by umbilical. Uh, we did hear that as part of the normal countdown, the Falcon 9 transferred to internal power, uh, but they re-enabled auxiliary power back into the vehicle. So through the detanking process, we're getting power from the ground uh, and not relying on the uh, on the batteries inside the vehicles. So we can continue to work through this process. Again, Steve Bowen, uh, Woody Hoberg, Sultan Alniati, and Andrei Fedyaev on board. Crew Dragon Endeavor now passively waiting uh, for the scrub process, detaking fuel first. This is going to be one of the lengthier processes uh, before the crew axis arm swings back and allows the crew to egress or exit the Dragon vehicle and get back on the ground. We'll do the same thing again in about 24 hours. Uh, witnessing the same series of events, suiting up in the suit room uh, before going down uh, and making their way over to the pad via Tesla uh, until they make their way up the um, launch tower, the uh, elevators over there, and make their way back into the same vehicle. We'll continue to follow along and give you updates as we hear them right now. Uh, really, it's just the detanking process, which is uh, quite a lengthy process, so we'll continue to keep you updated there. That is still underway. That's one of the longer uh, events that occur as part of a normal scrub. From left to right, Andrei Fedyaev. Woody Hoberg, Steve Bowen, Sultan Alniati on board at Crew Dragon Endeavor now.
Now we'll continue to follow along through this process. But from here over in Hawthorne, we're now going to toss it back over to the Kennedy Space Center, uh, where again, we scrubbed at about two minutes, 30 seconds to take us through uh, and continue to give us updates along the scrub process. Daryl. All right, thanks so much, Gary. Back here at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Daryl Nail and I'm with Crew-3 Commander, NASA astronaut Raja Chari. And it goes without saying, Raja, looks like you're going to have to wait <laughs> on <laughs> seeing your first launch. As uh, Gary mentioned, we had a scrub at uh, right around 1.43 a.m. Eastern Time. Got down inside T-minus 10 minutes, and uh, they started to notice an issue with what's called T-tab, and the, these are the chemicals that help yep. ignite the Falcon 9 uh, engines, all nine of them. And uh, as it turned out, uh, it looks like there wasn't enough confidence in moving forward with the amount of TTEB that was there to light those engines, and so we, uh, we had a scrub called. And so now, from the astronaut's perspective, Raja, you're sitting in there. First of all, tell me about what kind of reacts yeah, so I think it's it's uh, good and bad, right? The the bad side is obviously you know you're ready to go, uh, been waiting for it. But I think what's really encouraging and what uh, you know especially we're appreciative as the astronauts is knowing that everyone's got our back and that safety is the paramount thing. So as much as everyone wants to go, the right thing to do is obviously in this case to scrub. Uh, and so I think that's really easy to remember when you're in the seat and when you're dealing with, you know, as you go through the process of dearming the launch escape system, all those steps just remind you like, oh yeah, this the safety has got to be first. Um, I think it's also kind of a good deal because it gets a, f a free run through of all the events and the timeline. So now they've seen it all once, um, they have the wet dress, but now you've taken it all the way down to, to near launch and you get a another run of that, another run through of the procedures. Um, we talked earlier in the night about sleep shifting, so they're already sleep shifted. Uh, they're, you know, that's why we <laughs> do it that way, so that they're, you know, you can continue uh, and uh, know earlier than tomorrow uh, another launch opportunity. Um, so I think that's kind of what's going through the mind right now. You heard earlier the call up from the core to get into 5.100, so that's the procedure they're running now. Earlier in the night, they're using 4.100 is the procedure name, and that's was the launch prep, and this is the scrub prep. And so as a rough rule of thumb, what they teach the crew is about as long as you were fueling, it'll take that long to defuel. So mm -hmm. since we were pretty deep into the count, you would expect to take about that amount of time to un basically take all the fuel out of the rocket. So the, the big picture is... Um, you know, the crew's going to stay there just like they were ready for launch with the visors down, completely restrained, uh, because the rocket still has prop on board. And so the launch escape system is still armed. So it is still a volatile <laughs> right. machine. Right, propellant yep, on board. Exactly. So, they still, yeah, yeah. so we still have to treat it uh, as if it's ready to go, as it, it is ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then once the prop is all off, then they can disarm the uh, launch escape system, bring the crew access arm back out and then egress the vehicle. So essentially what we saw early in the night just run back in, in reverse. Um, and then uh, I think it's also a good example. You mentioned like inside T minus 10 minutes is when we started to see some ground chatter and know there was an issue. You didn't hear that on the loops to the, the crew. And one of the reasons is, you know, we work a lot in training to figure out like, what do you tell the crew? What don't you tell the crew? Um, but generally speaking, if there's nothing the crew can do about something or, you know, in this case, there's an action being worked, um, then maybe it would maybe potentially only confuse the situation to, to give them extraneous information. In this case, uh, once they had actionable info, like, hey, we're going to scrub or we're looking at this, um, that's when they call it up uh, versus just peppering them with random <laughs> yeah. random pieces of information that may or may not be relevant. Um, in today's case, it turned out to be relevant, but they let them know that once that that was the case. But, but yeah, I think uh, from the crew standpoint, this is something we, you know, just about, uh, you know, honestly, our launch was the first time we ever had an event where nothing went wrong because in all the sims you do, something generally goes wrong that's the whole point right so <laughs> this is actually par for the course that you're like oh yeah of course <laughs> yeah. of course something happened because that's what always happens in the sims that's how you sim yeah that's yeah. how you sim um, so i th think it's unexpected um and with uh, i mean i think we relearn this every time we launch a vehicle whether it's artemis uh you know spacex dragon a starliner we always learn things and you can uh, never assume everything's going to go perfectly so i don't think it surprises anyone not to say that they're not disappointed i you know you're there's still that. That's uh, probably the first emotion. <laughs> the first thing reaction, is like, right? oh man, but yeah. then like, oh, that's good. Right. They, they made the safe decision. But yeah, yeah absolutely a little disappointed. But uh, yeah, you're still going to get to go to space. We'll just maybe do it a, a day or two later. 
And currently, according to uh, SpaceX, when they initially made the announcement, it takes about 50 minutes to detank the rocket. And currently, we're right around a half hour uh, left in right. that process. So we've gone about 20 minutes in detanking. As you mentioned, astronauts have to stay strapped in exactly where they are to wait it out as that propellant is detanked. And I found that you can kind of get a visual marker by what you see right here, right? The uh, you can see yeah, some venting the and yep. venting of the locks at the top, but then also just about as high as that con condensation is coming off Dragon the rocket. SpaceX with propellant offload update. Now we'll get an update. SpaceX Dragon, go ahead. Our stage two locks tank is offloaded. Uh, we're still tracking about another 25 to 30 minutes here. Last estimate may have been a little low. It's like starting coffee, thank you for the update. So about halfway done. About uh, halfway, and you can see yeah, it's almost about halfway I, I, down. I actually never noticed that <laughs> yeah. before, but that's actually a really good, really good insight. And so, and so now the astronauts are waiting in the capsule SpaceX is looking at and will look at after this procedure is is complete um, what's going on with the hardware there is a launch opportunity tomorrow and I want to emphasize this is an opportunity um, if the team decides that they can turn it around in 24 hours and that would be with a T0 of 122 and 29 seconds a.m. Eastern time. Again, tomorrow, well, this would be Tuesday, February 28th, with a T0 of 122 and 29 seconds a.m. There is a launch opportunity. If NASA and SpaceX decide to go forward with that, our coverage on NASA TV would start at 9.45 p.m., both on NASA TV and our streaming platforms. Also, from launch to dock, that transit would be about 33 and a half hours. So if they decide to launch on that day, docking would happen on March 1st at 10.04 Eastern Time. And there'd be a rendezvous, docking, and welcoming ceremony coverage on NASA TV that would start at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. And I say all that, again, with the asterisk, that that is a decision that has yet to be made, whether or Absolutely. not they take the that la launch opportunity, there's yep. going to be a time to look at this situation. Right, and so like we heard that it was a, a situation with the T-tab, which is again, sort of the, if you will, the igniter for the engines and making sure the fluid, there's enough fluid or sufficient fluid. So whatever that, yeah, whatever the technical uh, underlying of that problem that led to today, if that's something that can be resolved, and obviously that's something the teams will be diving into probably as soon as the prop is off the rocket, I'm sure they're going to be crawling all over it. And that's, that's one of the other logistical things that's happening here. So there's, you know, once they start fueling the rocket as part of the countdown sequence and the crew uh, armed the launch escape system, all the personnel around there also cleared out. And so right now there is no one really close to the rocket. So once the fuel is off the rocket um, and then the crew dearms the LES, then people can approach again. So it does take some some time for the vehicles and people and the closeout crew, just like it did to, you know, clear out the arm and, and prep it. They'll have to do the same thing to bring people back to the arm, um, re-prepare it to connect to the, the capsule. Um, but again, it's actually in the long run kind of a good thing is that when they do try this the second time, it means it'll go all the more smoother because they'll, they'll have got another rep of doing it. Um, you mentioned the, the one thing having a a longer time to rendezvous the 33 hours actually that's kind of another little uh, maybe a, a, a positive silver lining out of this because I know for us for crew three we really enjoyed our time in the capsule you spend so much time mm -hmm. training in Hawthorne training uh, in Houston um, and there's something special I think about being in a, a small vehicle yes it's cramped uh, so I wouldn't necessarily want to spend two weeks in there <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, uh, more than a few hours is just kind of fun because Stop, you're catch your breath exactly relax yes yeah. Because once you hit the space station, you are on a tight timeline. Everything, mm. you know, every five minutes is accounted for, and it should be because, you know, it's, it's expensive to get there, and we're doing a whole lot of science. Um, the nice thing in the, in the vehicle when you're just rendezvousing or waiting for those, we talked about phasing the orbits, you get time to just look out the window, hang out with your buds. It's uh, kind of like a 
you know, a glamping trip. Because <laughs> <It's like, laughs> uh, you're, you know, sort of uh, roughing it, but uh, obviously it's some pretty nice digs. But um, you can get out of your seat, right? Exactly, and that's, that's so it's, it's a great time. Uh, so once they get uh, in orbit uh, and everything's checked out, they do get out of their seats, they can change out of their suits, uh, and I thought that was some of the, the best time, both on the way up and the way down, just spending time in the Dragon and in the thing that you've trained in so long. Um, and you can really hear it. It talks to you. You can hear when you do burns. You'll hear the prop flowing. You can see the thrusters out the window. Um, so it's a, it's a nice time, uh, and it gives you some time to adapt to space. So for especially in, in our our crew, just like their crew, having three rookies on board, um, getting some time to adapt to zero gravity, getting used to moving around, how you restrain yourself. Uh, the more time you can get in the Dragon, the the quicker you can adapt and get to work on the on the space station. So I think it's all time well spent when you have a, a few extra hours uh, in the Dragon. Raj has talked a lot about uh, the crew and uh, what that means for them um, going potentially going forward. Um, want to go back to the T-Tab. We've, we've mentioned this and heard it a couple of times. I think uh, one of our commentators actually spelled it out. If you look at the picture on the left, the SpaceX rocket on the pad, uh, for those who are familiar with watching launches at night, that T-tab, it's the, it's the uh, ignition fluid. You can actually see it light because it flashes green all around the bottom of the rocket. You can see a green flash. And that's what it does. It lights those nine uh, Merlin engines and then you have a liftoff. And uh, they call it T-tab because that's the acronym for triethyl aluminum, triethyl boron. And when they come together, they create combust. that, yeah. yeah, that ignition that's necessary to uh, to light the rocket. And so that's something that SpaceX is uh, going to look at. We also heard an update uh, from uh, SpaceX on the loops about the, the timing of the detank, which we are currently uh, just about 25, 27 minutes into that process. As uh, astronaut Raja Chari was saying, this is... Uh, a period of time where the astronauts just have to hold still while the propellant is taken out of the rocket. Yep, and they're probably also going through. Uh, so we're, we're always trying to think, what, what, what if, what if, what if? That's mm -hmm. always what's going through our mind. So right now they're probably thinking through, uh, well, the, the LES is still hot, so that would, you know, but we're not planning on going. So if there was a problem, we'd probably hit the emergency ground address button, wait for the crew arm to swing out at that faster rate. Well, crew on, oh, sorry, sorry. attached, yep, right? So, yeah, but, uh, yeah, but you would still want to, if you had to get out quickly, do the emergency ground egress, make sure the LES is disarmed before you get out of your seats, uh, and then and then egress if you had to. Uh, and so there's there's a few different ways, a uh, few different types of egress in if something else went wrong. And uh, so whenever prop is moving, whether it's getting onloaded or offloaded, uh, you're always ready for that. Um, so that LES stays armed through this process? It actually stays armed. As long as there's propellant on the uh, the rocket, it stays armed. Because if there was uh, any kind of contingency, you'd want to use that to get off quickly. The other thing that they'll ha will have to happen eventually is they'll have to rotate the seats back. Uh, so just like we saw this, the seats rotate to the launch position, uh, once the LES is disarmed, then they'll rotate back to the, you know, the loading and unloading configuration. Um, there's also uh, we didn't talk about it uh, too much, but uh, it's not just people that the Dragon takes up there, it's cargo. And so uh, you can't really see it in this view. We saw it for earlier in the night when they were first loading up, you got and a shot underneath the their legs. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and so you can see the cargo that's under there and that the stuff on the left under Andre's seat is mostly uh, crew related in terms of like survival equipment. You see that red, you can kind of just see the yeah. uh, red bag. That's the like the life raft. and so. We talked, you saw that video earlier tonight, we talked about the Orion, the porch, and you know, the Orion water training. So a lot of the water recovery equipment is in those, those pallets underneath Andre's seat if, if the crew had to do something on their own uh, for some kind of uh, landing in an unplanned area. And then this stuff that's kind of under Woody and Steve's seats, you can see they look like more like metal lockers. And so those uh, positions actually have power. So under Andre and Sultan's seats, there's no power to those locations, those cargo locations, but the ones under Woody and Steve, they actually have power, which means you can cool or heat things, but generally when you're talking about science, going up and back from the station, oftentimes you need to keep stuff frozen mm -hmm. or temperature controlled, and so those 
usually the uh, probably the more valuable, I'm not sure it's valuable, but like the, the more time critical time stuff is in those. And so more than likely when they offload the crew, uh, we'll probably won't be on camera anymore, but they'll probably also go in and either, you know, take some of that stuff out if there's anything that has to be chilled or temperature controlled to make sure it's, it's still in a good state. Uh, and then when you dock with the station, those are some of the first things that come off um, to make sure that they get into Dragon the right. SpaceX with propellant offload update. Offloads are proceeding nominally, expecting another 15, 20 minutes here. Okay, so it's Captain Stephen Boeing communicating with the launch team. Exactly, yep, in about another 15 to 20 minutes, and sounds like things are going nominally. But yeah, so the uh, those pallets underneath there, like I said, they may, I'm not exactly sure what's in those particular ones, but it would not be uncommon to, to pull some of that stuff, they call it like late load cargo that, uh, you know, for is very sensitive to temperature or maybe some power considerations that you would pull off and, and store. And then, like I said, when you dock, those are the first things that, that come out. But again, the kind of takeaway is it's not just people, but a whole bunch of stuff that goes right. to the space station by way of the Dragon. And then you can also put things in the trunk as well. Um, on like the cargo dragons we used the we saw it earlier tonight the solar panels but you can load things into the trunk uh, and here's a great shot of it so that bottom section that looks uh, with the solar panels and the black and the white inside there on side yep, and, yeah. you can actually put things inside there as well uh, that obviously doesn't have to be in a nice atmosphere or, uh, so it's uh, things that can be exposed to vacuum all right good stuff NASA astronaut Raja Chari keeping us informed and updated on what the astronauts are going through and what it means for the cargo on board. I want to now take a moment to go back to SpaceX in Hawthorne, California and get caught up with our NASA commentator, Gary Jordan. Gary? Hey, thank you, Daryl. Yeah, we're following along here in uh, Mission Control Hawthorne. As you mentioned, that status update on the fuel offloading. We're looking at about 15, 20 minutes until that is completed. In the meantime, you see the Crew-6 astronauts on board inside Crew Dragon Endeavor uh, passively waiting. They'll be going through uh, a, a series of more steps once fuel offloading is complete. In the meantime, um, the uh, the Dragon is going to, or the Falcon 9 is going to continue to uh, f uh, get rid of the fuel and the oxidizer that's inside the Falcon 9. Um, the seats themselves will rotate from the launch position down uh, so that the uh, closeout team can come back and uh, get them out of their seats. They'll open up that side hatch and uh, get the crew back, walk down the crew access arm, down the elevators, and uh, go back to crew quarters to await for the next launch attempt. Right now, uh, the next launch attempt we're looking at is about 24 hours uh, from now. Um, but right now, if you're if you're just tuning in uh, and looking for updates on uh, the launch of the Crew Dragon to the International Space Station, we are in a launch scrub situation. So at about two minutes thirty seconds, uh, the teams ground teams declared a scrub due to tracking what's called a TTEB. Um, this is the ignition fluid that allows the uh, engines on the first and second stage to ignite and propel uh, the Falcon 9 and the crew into orbit over the nine-minute ascent. Uh, usually, if you follow our, our coverage, TTEB, uh, when the second stage ignites uh, at about three minutes uh, into the flight of the Falcon 9, there is this green flash that you see from the MVAC engine at the tip, and then the titanium uh, stabilization ring at the end of the expansion nozzle uh, uh, goes away after that TTEB ignition and the, and the second stage ignites that's that green flash is the TTEB uh, ignition fluid and you can actually see it in our launch coverage but it was that uh, that the ground teams were tracking uh, and so they identified a ground issue and are now uh, going through the stages of a nominal uh, a nominal um, scrub situation just regular uh, tank offloading we were originally looking at about 50 minutes of tank offloading now we're about 15 20 minutes uh, from the latest report of the ground teams. In the meantime, the crew six astronauts are aboard, uh, passively waiting and tracking the uh, um, tracking the fuel offload. And why don't we check in with Kate for for more on the scrub situation? 
Yeah, thanks, Gary. I am following along with the SpaceX ground team's procedures um, as we are continuing through this nominal scrub. Um, as we heard called out a couple minutes ago, um, we uh, have about 15 to 20 minutes left of th the offload. Um, so that should wrap up between 12, excuse me, around between 2.30 and 4.30 a.m. Eastern time. Um, so we're coming up to that soon, everything progressing nominally. Um, Looking at the current levels, um, I'm expecting a call out to occur any minute now, uh, indicating that all RP1 has been detanked from the second stage. So um, liquid oxygen uh, detanking has already completed from the second stage. So I'm expecting that call out to come any second now, indicating that RP1 has been completely detanked. Um, as for the first stage, also really low levels there. I would say less than 5% remaining locks on the first stage to go, um, and then probably about 10% fuel left to go uh, there on the first stage. So we're nearly there, um, but we will hear those progress call outs uh, on the loops informing the crew. As you can see there on the right hand side of your screen, Screen. Uh, they remain comfortable in their seats, visors down, seats rotated back. Um, the launch escape system is still armed at this point. Um, although from that view of the pad on the left-hand side of your screen, it might kind of look like the crew access arm is um, reaching toward the capsule. It's not, we have not moved that yet um, into the service position. It, and we won't do that um, for a little bit yet, uh, but we still have a number of things that we're going to go through um, in this nominal offload procedure. As I mentioned before, the crew had a dry dress rehearsal on Thursday night, meaning no propellant involved. Um, so that what, that's what makes it a dry dress. Uh, but they have gone through this very similar procedure in terms of the uh, closeout team going back up into the tower, back down the crew access arm and helping the crew get out of the capsule, including reopening that side hatch. So the astronauts will egress from the capsule the exact same way that they ingressed, just in reverse. Uh, so pretty simple from that standpoint, but there are also other things that uh, we'll have to do um, in, uh, in addition to that that fuel detanking or offloading uh, and the disarming of that launch escape system. Um, we will also check with the hypergol sensors that those hypergolic fluids, um, monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen te tetroxide, uh, that MMH and NTO, those are the fuels that are used to power Dragon when it's in orbit and uh, they are toxic to humans to breathe. So we will engage those sensors and make sure that there's a zero, um, you know, that there's no presence of those propellants uh, prior to allowing the closeout team return to the white room. Uh, we'll also make sure that the closeout crew themselves are prepared and ready to re-enter the BDA or blast danger area. Uh, so it's basically everything that they did earlier today, but in reverse. Um, and then another thing that we will also do is we will release the range assets. So of course, all of that Ground, excuse me, all of that sea and airspace that we had uh, closed off in preparation for launch. Uh, after that launch escape system is disabled, we'll be able to basically release or free up all of those range assets that are still currently locked down um, just in case a, a launch abort, uh, excuse me, a dragon abort, a pad abort in this case would be triggered. But as we mentioned before, everything continues to progress nominally with no issues. Dragon uh, SpaceX with the propellant offload up. Very exciting, go ahead. At this time, we have RP-1 and locks off of stage two, expecting just another five minutes or so here until we are fully offloaded. Very exciting, Tuffy, thank you. So that was SpaceX core Arthur Berrialt, uh, just informing the crew that there's about five minutes remaining, as I mentioned before, um, at this point in time. The second stage is now completely, or mostly empty, completely empty of, of its propellants. The locks 
tank on the first stage is nearly empty and the fuel tank on the first stage has maybe about 5% remaining uh, to be pulled out. So everything continuing normally with this offload. Um, we heard their commander, Steve Bowen, as I mentioned earlier, um, it sounds he sounds pretty relaxed and um, cool as an ice cube here. And for good reason, the astronauts train for every possible scenario, this included. Um, as we've mentioned several times before, we have procedures for everything. Um, I am following along with this uh, scrub procedure and um, everything continues to, to go um, as planned, which is kind of funny to say for um, an event that we obviously didn't want to happen tonight, but um, as uh, John Innsbrucker reminded me a little bit ago, uh, the uh, uh, the Mercury flight director said back in the early days of the space program, it's better to be on the ground wishing you were flying than to be flying wishing you were on the ground. So um, this is a good example of um, the system doing exactly what it was supposed to do um, in the case of off nominal uh, TTEB readings. Uh, there was a scrub called at about two minutes and 30 seconds um, prior to liftoff. And uh, that was an issue that the, the, the crew had in that, excuse me, that the ground teams had informed the crew of around T minus five minutes had indicated that they would need a couple more minutes to troubleshoot the problem and ultimately called that scrub at T minus two minutes and 30 seconds. So at this point in time, the crew remains in their chairs. Um, unfortunately, not a whole lot for them to do other than mo continue to monitor uh, using their crew displays, continue to monitor the progress of the propellant offloading and uh, the overall vehicle health. Um, but as I mentioned before, uh, the commander's tone of voice indicates that everyone is, um, I'm sure, disappointed that they didn't get to go to space today, um, but unbothered or not worried about what we're walking through as we have practice, um, practice a, a similar Similar scenario very recently with that dry dress rehearsal just this past Thursday evening. Um, so after we fully detank the vehicle, uh, we will be able to disarm the launch escape system and then bring that crew access arm, which a great shot there on the left hand side of your screen of it uh, stowed away. We will basically rotate it back into its uh, service posi position and um, the close out team will um, I guess it will be the opposite, more of like a close-in team. Um, they will return to the pad and uh, go back up to the side hatch, reopen it, and help the astronauts out of their seats. That's right, Kate. And again, uh, we're getting that live view from inside the Dragon. They are passively waiting. It's the ground teams monitoring uh, the detanking process, which we're really just minutes away from finishing. In the meantime, we continue to keep that launch escape system armed just to make sure the crew is safe through the process. Now, after that detanking is complete, one of the next steps will be to disarm uh, the uh, launch escape system. When the Falcon 9 is not fueled, um, the, it's in a safe configuration to go ahead and disarm that and go through the next series of steps, including that crew access arm swinging back and uh, retrieving the crew. Now, Crew 6 will have another opportunity to launch. Right now, we're tracking a 24-hour turnaround uh, for the next launch attempt. Of course, the teams on the ground will have to evaluate and continue to evaluate uh, the uh, issue that was identified as part of today's launch scrub. And again, that was a, a ground issue identified with the TTEB ignition fluid uh, that allows the uh, first and second stage engines to ignite and propel the Falcon 9 and the Dragon into orbit. So they'll continue to talk and discuss about the issues before going ahead and proceeding with that next attempt, but we have that identified. Uh, if we were to proceed with a launch attempt tomorrow, uh, again, today's launch attempt, we were counting down to 1.45 a.m. Eastern time for tomorrow for a 24-hour scrub. It's just about 24 hours, a little shy of that, so we'd be looking looking at about 1.22 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow uh, for uh, our next attempt. In the meantime, we're continuing to follow along just really minutes away 
uh, from uh, completely detanking the Falcon 9. Uh, so we'll continue to follow along and get this next status update uh, until that's completely uh, detanked and we hear that they're disarming the launch escape system. All right, so Kate, we're continuing to follow along, um, really just uh, sitting and waiting at this point for that detanking process, but we should be expecting to hear something from the ground teams very shortly. Yeah, that's right. We continue to see the crew remaining buckled in their seats, um, keeping their hands inside the ride at all times, <laughs> for a lack of a better analogy. Uh, yeah, their visors remain in the closed position. Um, this, of course, is, as you just mentioned, the launch escape system is still armed. Uh, so while it is armed, the crew will stay exactly as you see them now. Um, this is just in case a, for some reason, um, a Dragon pad abort is required. Um, as I mentioned before, not likely, but it's a good backup. Um, of course, crew safety is the top priority at all times, uh, even as we work through this nominal scrub um, uh, procedure. So we will see the crew remain like this uh, until uh, further notice, basically. Uh, checking in on vehicle status here, as I mentioned before, the second stage completely empty uh, of all of its propellants. The first stage uh, LOX tank also basically completely empty. I'm seeing a tiny little bit of fuel, that RP-1 rocket propellant one still coming off of the first stage tank there. Um, but for the most part, uh, Falcon 9 is basically entirely empty of its propellants at this point in time. So as I mentioned before, we were expecting uh, this to wrap up sometime between 2.30 a.m. and 2.40 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, so now at uh, 2.33, uh, we are in that range. So we should be hearing momentarily uh, from SpaceX core Arthur Berrialt, um, located here at SpaceX Hawthorne Mission Control just behind Gary and I. Um, we should hear from him soon, indicating that the propellant offloading is complete and that uh, we will then prepare to disarm the launch escape system. Um, so for those that have recently tuned in, uh, we had a nominal countdown. Um, the, t the SpaceX teams reported um, a t issue with the T-TEB, um, the, basically the fluids that we use to ignite the Merlin engines. You can kind of think of it like the spark plug to your car if you drive a combustion engine vehicle. Um, so that T-TEB is a critical component to getting the rocket to fly. It's, it's what creates the spark um, for that engine ignition. Um, so we heard around T minus five minutes that the uh, SpaceX teams were troubleshooting an issue. And then about two and a half minutes later at T minus two minutes, 30 seconds, there was a scrub called uh, in the launch down, excuse me, in the launch countdown. But as I said, Prior to that, uh, we had a, a nominal countdown and now just working through this, uh, this scrub procedure. Dragon, SpaceX with a propellant offload update. SpaceX Dragon, go ahead. At this time, we have all propellant off the vehicle and are proceeding with nominal closeouts. SpaceX Dragon copies. All right, so that's an important call. Propellant load, or the propellant offload, rather, being complete. So we'll be uh, we'll be tracking to see when the uh, launch escape system gets disarmed. Right now, it's still armed, just as a precautionary measure. Measure as the ground teams continue to track uh, the Dragon propellant. Dragon SpaceX with that call. You are go for section two of five decimal 100 and disarm launch escape system. Here we go. All right, and I'm and not sure what call that was that you're referring to other than that we are go for two decimal and hold, uh, break, one break. launch escape system safely. And copy that, good read back, Dragon. 
Okay, we so are in lunch safe system safing. We are two alpha one and we're at two alpha two, but this on the lunch safe system. So again, if you're just tuning in, the uh, ground teams we're, t we're tracking propellant offload. So it'll be the crew themselves inside Crew Dragon Endurance that issues the command to turn off. The launch escape system will wait for confirmation of that command being successfully issued to the Dragon system. All right, and it looks like we uh, got that confirmation that the launch escape system has been inhibited. So that uh, that confirms the uh, propellant offload disarmed. and the launch Go escape system being uh, disarmed. So the crew will work right, uh, through a series of disarmed. commands. We're going to go with advisors and proceed to step three. and we are ready for a steep rotation. SpaceX copies will report when initiating. Okay, so a uh, recap of what happened. We uh, declared a scrub inside 2 minutes 30 seconds. That scrub time was actually 2 minutes 14 seconds. Dragon SpaceX um, initiating and seat And we rotation. scrubbed for the day. Uh, since then, we've been in a nominal scrub uh, procedure. So it, it uh, was followed. So we're continuing to follow along. And uh, that uh, crew access arm, we did get confirmation. You can see it visually, actually. It is swinging back into place to access the side hatch on the side of Crew Dragon Endeavor. So again, the uh, Falcon 9 is completely offloaded with fuel and oxidizer, and the launch escape system has been disarmed. Those commands confirmed before going ahead and swinging the crew access arm back. You heard the uh, command for seat rotation, so we may be able to see that. And before launch, the seat rotates up to about a 14 degree angle. That's the seat, that's the launch position. The seat rotation goes down to about a 40 degree Dragon angle SpaceX to allow. Are in the upright position. SpaceX Dragon Cox. So there we can see the crew access arm closing the final inches as it moves back toward Dragon Endeavor. Um, we are now pulling the closeout team to re-enter the BDA or blast danger area. Um, so as we've mentioned before, they will go back up the tower, back down the crew access arm, uh, reopen that side hatch and help the astronauts egress from the capsule. Um, as we heard called out earlier, the Seats are back down in, uh, so they were in the launch position. They've rotated back down uh, into the egress, uh, ingress position. Uh, so we can see the crew access arm just closing the final inches um, up against Dragon Endeavor. At this point in time, we're going to head back over to Kennedy Space Center's Daryl uh, for additional updates. Um, I, I'm sure that they can see the, they were able to see that crew access arm move uh, from their seats at the press site. Daryl, how are things over there? 
Thank you, Kate. And yes, indeed, we uh, could see the crew access arm uh, coming back and making a connection with Dragon Endeavor. And as you see on the screen there, the white room connected back in. And so as we watch the astronauts can unbuckle and pull up their visors, take a moment to uh, relax. And uh, from here on, Commander Chari, Looks like they'll be heading out at some point. They should be, yeah. And at this point, the vehicle's uh, pretty much completely safe. So with the LES uh, disarmed or safed, um, there's basically no longer active prop in the F9. And also the Super Dracos are safe on the vehicle. So uh, there, that completes their procedure 5.100, which is the one they're running inside the vehicle. At this point, they're just waiting for the uh, recovery crew to, to show up. Um, like was mentioned earlier, they have to stay outside in the exclusion area uh, while there's any potential of propellants or the, the abort engines kicking off. And so now that that's safe, those teams will approach the vehicle. Um, you can see they loosen their straps. Uh, you know, one of the questions we were talking about while we were uh, listening to SpaceX was why don't they just get out on their own, which they could. Um, but uh, we mentioned before that whole white room is a clean room. And so if they were to get out on their own, they maybe like, like scuff a boot, uh, touch a hatch seal. And since all those things we want to keep really pristine, there's, there's no rush right now. There's no reason to risk anything like that, you know, bumping a visor, scratching something, tearing a rubber seal. So the safest thing to do, uh, since we're going to have to do this again on the next opportunity, is to let the closeout crew come and make sure they help them out and make sure nothing is, you know, nothing gets damaged or anything like that on the way out and, um, and preserve the opportunity, uh, this follow-on opportunities. The good news is the next opportunities will probably go faster because everyone's done it once now. So they've got some, <laughs> they've got some more practice. Uh, they don't have to sign the patch, like you said. We've, they've knocked that out. Uh, so we save ourselves a few seconds here and there. Um, and again, that's uh, for the crew. Uh, you know, although there's the, the some, you know, uh, disappointment of like, oh, you didn't get to go. But it feels a lot just like another sim and another chance to go through the procedures, another mm -hmm. chance because, like we talked about, once that rocket lights, things happen really, really fast. So the more times you have to, to walk through it and talk through it, um, and especially in a case like this, we're actually sitting in the seats with the displays up, hearing the vehicle sounds, um, that in and of itself is a, a worthwhile experience. Um, and it, it makes you more uh, perceptive if things aren't nominal. So the next time if you hear a sound, they're like, well, that was, that's not, that's different than what we heard before and, and have a, a baseline for comparison. Uh, looks like Woody's playing with his box settings. So now that their visor's up, they're probably changing their settings just so they're not getting a background noise. You can see they're starting to get their, their gloves out. Unzip. Uh, yep, getting their hands out and just uh, get a little more, uh, just cool off and um, yeah, just kind of hanging out and relaxing for the, waiting for the crew to come get them. So Crew 6 uh, did a dry dress just a few days ago. We could think of this <laughs> as a, a wet, wet dress. dress. Exactly, yeah. yep. This one had the prop. And so the more experience they get, uh, the better off they'll be for the next attempt. Just to recap, if you're just joining us, we scrubbed the launch attempt at T minus 2 minutes and 14 seconds before <laughs> liftoff. Um, there was a hold in the countdown. Happened at 1.43 a.m. Eastern time. The SpaceX team... Uh, encountered an issue in the ground system affecting the loading of triethyl aluminum and triethyl boron, which together, the acronym TTEB, they are the ignition fluids for F9. The ground team couldn't provide sufficient confidence of a full load of that TTEB, which is important to light all nine of the Merlin 1D engines underneath the Falcon 9. So the team scrubbed it and... Uh, now they're going through their procedures uh, for launch scrub. And so moving forward, we have some launch opportunities coming up for Crew 6. I mentioned the first one on February 28th. There's also another one on March 2nd at 1234 a.m. Eastern Time. Yeah. And if we were to go then, we would uh, begin our NASA TV coverage on March 1st at 9.30 p.m. And there would be a docking at 1.05 a.m. Eastern Time on March 3rd. Also want to make a note that there is no press conference tonight. Initially, that was scheduled. Um, had there been a nominal uh, launch, uh, but in this case... Uh, NASA is foregoing the opportunity for a press conference, and so stay tuned to your social media channels and NASA's 
and official to SpaceX commercial just an update. Crew vlog. Uh, we've pulled go for the closeout team uh, to start re-entering the BDA, and they'll be back alongside you at the capsule shortly uh, and helping you egress. Additionally, just want to do a quick comfort check. Uh, make sure you guys are still feeling okay sitting there, and if you need a PMC, I can set one up. And wait for Captain Bowen to respond. Yeah. That's SpaceX Dragon. Uh, we're all feeling good, just waiting on the opportunity to get out of the castle. That's all. <laughs> all right, SpaceX copies. Yeah, so the call there you heard was uh, that gives the crew some SA that uh, the recovery crew is going to be approaching because if they do hear bumps or see shadows or silhouettes moving outside the windows, you can't see, you don't have direct line of sight into the room, but you can see maybe some movement or light changes, and that lets you know that's people that's intended versus something uh, off nominal happening. And then a PMC stands for a private medical conference. Um, and as you heard, they're doing fine, just waiting uh, to get out. Yep. And so that's going to do it for our coverage of Crew 6. The first attempt of Crew 6, Crew 6 to launch to the International Space Station aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon Endeavor. Didn't get to do it today. Raja, you're going to have to wait to see your first <laughs> launch. Yeah. But uh, good, co good things come to those who wait. And so I want to thank you for being here. Oh, really appreciate I appreciate it. It was, it was a fun time. I'm, I'm sure I'll get to see a launch eventually. So uh, as you mentioned, those follow on launch opportunities uh, right now, I'm sure the teams are going to be working, continuing to work through breakfast and lunch to figure out uh, what the, if they can fix the problem and, and when we'll be ready to go, but uh, we'll go when what's safe and ready to go. So absolutely. And if you're just joining us, welcome here to the launch pad. You're looking at a live view inside the Crew Dragon Endeavor out at Launch Complex 39A at NASA Kennedy Space Center. Unfortunately, which is 2 minutes, 14 seconds left on the clock, hold, hold, hold was called from a launch controller due to a T-TEB issue, which sounds like it's on the second stage. T-TEB is part of the ignition sequence of the engines and they had to haul a hold due to an issue they had informed the crew about just a few minutes earlier about uh, but unfortunately due to it being an instantaneous launch window uh, we had to uh, have a full scrub of today's mission if you want to learn more about the scrub and what has occurred head on over to the link in the chat that's where we've got a full write-up on our news website about today's launch abort the issue everything we know about it uh, as well as the next launch opportunities. There is a launch opportunity uh, tomorrow at 1.22 uh, a.m. Eastern Time, but weather could be less favorable, and NASA and SpaceX are going to have to determine the TTEB issue, so it is possible that we will not see that attempt tomorrow. We'll keep the article and our Twitter up to date, so make sure you follow us over on Twitter, TLPN underscore official. If you haven't yet, take a moment, engage that subscribe button, and consider joining us over on our TLP Discord. Here at the launch pad, it's our mission to inform and inspire the explorers of tomorrow because we believe that space is better together. And this was our live launch coverage of NASA SpaceX Crew 6. Unfortunately, no launch tonight due to that issue, but space is hard and safety is priority number one. And the crew is safe, and now they will uh, have to slowly egress the vehicle. We expect uh, those support crews to be alongside uh, the Dragon in the next 15-20 minutes, and then the crew will be helped out. NASA and SpaceX have wrapped up their live coverage, so no more views from on the pad as they help the crews get out. They're going to probably want a bio break or bathroom break here pretty quick, uh, and then they will be, go down and remain in quarantine at NASA Kennedy Space Center. And then once we have a new launch date, we get to do this all again. Crew walkout and ingress and then hopefully we go for another launch attempt. But that's going to do it for us here this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Make sure you subscribe to never miss another live launch coverage, docking, undocking, or return to Earth. It's a busy time at the International Space Station. Crew 6 heading up, Crew 5 heading down. we got a cargo mission. We've got the Boeing Starliner, crew test flight coming up, and Axiom 2. So you're not going to want to miss all that right here on the launch pad. But for tonight, on behalf of the entire TLP team, thank you so much for watching. My name's Zach, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.